All right. Welcome, guys. This is going to be fun. This is Retire with Real Estate. Uh, my name is Toby Mathis. There's Aaron Adams, my friend. Oh, it's been been a few been a few weeks, but it's good seeing you, my friend. Yeah, so uh, I'm excited for today because uh, this is me. I think we're broadcasting on uh, YouTube. I think we are doing this with our inside of our Infinity Portal. And guys, we will be sharing the recording. What I'd like you to do is email us at pro at infinityinvesting.com or they'll just put it in the chat. You'll see we're just going to put a big old chat out there. Here, my little AI thing wants to talk to me. There we go. And uh, all you have to do is just email in and they'll send you uh, the link to the recording. Now, we are going to uh, break this into pieces so that you can come back in and you can look at certain areas. Maybe you get some clarity. Uh, but overall, this is going to be a process through the day. I think we're sitting here at, uh, uh, what is it, nine to four. Uh, so it's a nice, it's going to be a nice long day. Uh, here, I'm going to actually share my screen out so we can actually look at some of the same things. There we go. Um, hopefully, you guys can see my screen. Give me a thumbs up if you can actually see my screen. There we go. There's some thumbs up. Perfect. All right. So I mean, I will ask for some reactions. For If you're watching this as a recording, you're going to be like, why is my thumb not showing? Well, you can give yourself a thumbs up if you're watching the recording. Uh, but this should be a whole bunch of fun. Uh, and, uh, you know, these are uh, cool events for both Aaron and I, because uh, we both enjoy teaching and, uh, and this gets our little fix. So we can uh, jump into that. I'll do a proper introduction of you, Aaron, here in a second, but let's go over some of the, the ground rules. First off, uh, if you have comments, uh, put them in the chat, like a comment comment, like if I ask you, hey, where are you from? Like, give me your city and state. In fact, I'll just ask that put your city and state in the chat. But if you have a question, you're going to either put it in the Q&A or you're going to email it into pro at infinityinvesting.com, depending on whether you're watching this live or whether you are watching uh, a recording in that way. Hey, we already got Honolulu. I'm always looking for Hawaii. And it's always like, so we already have it at Honolulu. It's real early there. Vienna, Virginia, Vermont, New York City, H Hilo, Hawaii. We have two Hawaii in the house. Detroit, Austin, um, San Jose, Madeira, Reading, Pennsylvania. So we got people from all over the country, Lancaster, California, Prosper, Texas. That's a great name. Bakersfield, Woodbridge, um, Sam Beach, Owasso. We got people from all over. There's Maui. We got, oh, well, there we got more. Second home in Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha, Michael. St. Augustine. So we have folks all over the country. Aaron, where are you sitting today? Uh, today, I am at our offices in Idaho Falls, Idaho, just 75 miles from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And uh, what, yeah, I'm sure it's cold, won't ask <laughs> you, but, uh, as cold. of, <laughs> I'm cold, sure. Cold is, cold is relative, right? Yeah. And uh, look at this, Holy uh, Holyoke, Massachusetts, birthplace of volleyball. Yeah, a lot of you guys don't realize that Aaron's other superpower is he coaches one of the top girls teams in Idaho. What's what's your team ranked? So we're the number two ranked team. Uh, we finished, well, so I, I do a high school team and we finished uh, sixth in the state this year. My my stepdaughter was the setter for that team. She, she's been entertaining some community college scholarship offers. She's just a junior. And then I coach club the rest of the year. Uh, um, I, Anderson helped me set up a 501c3. Uh, so I have a nonprofit yeah. for youth sports, which is has been amazing. We have 15 volleyball teams and two swim teams that use our facilities that we built with a nonprofit. Uh, and I coach a 16 year old team that's ranked 48th in the country right now. So that's cool. See, uh, and you'll be hearing a lot about this when we talk about making money. A lot of it is not about them actually making the money, but allowing you to do the things that you wanna do and actually affect change in the world. We call it the second mountain. Aaron loves to talk about that. I won't steal your thunder on it. Yeah. Um, but uh, even though I gave you the idea, or I think I shared you it. Did you did give me, you you told me about the concept and you helped me with that. I, and I was, guys, I was a knucklehead. There, there are going to be things you hear today that you're like, oh, I, I never thought about that. And Toby said to me, so we set up a nonprofit for you. And I said, oh, no, no, I didn't even think I could do it in a nonprofit. He's like, dude, I've known you for 15 years. Like, and so Anderson, which by the way, Kareem, who runs a nonprofit, they, I, I believe you guys hired him from, directly from IRS. Insane. He's literally helping me on an issue this last week. 
and it's just so great having that access and that knowledge and it's it's cool yep we'll get into all this fun stuff and who all, who everybody is and, and how it all interrelates but the idea is uh we want you guys to be wealthy for a reason and that's to affect change and do good things help your families out hey if you just want to get extra money great we'll show you how to make it uh we're, aaron and i are both pretty good at making it and uh, we're pretty good at teaching people how to make it. And you'll see what the results have been over the years. You'll see some testimonials. You'll hear some from, from some folks. Uh, but uh, and then you'll also see some properties that you know, we could we don't have to like you don't have to listen to us. We could actually just let the numbers do the talking. Uh, very, very successful. Uh, and we'll we'll go through all that. Uh, but this is really about you guys, and we're going to be talking about how to retire with real estate. And it's about different concepts. So a lot of this morning. Uh, or the beginning of the event, I'm going to be going over some concepts, some checkup from the neck up stuff. Uh, Aaron is going to be teaching the real estate portion on how to identify good properties, what types of properties are uh, appropriate at this time and at all times, honestly. Uh, I think, uh, what what types of properties are you going to be going over today, Aaron? So uh, we love manufactured homes right now. We're putting them on fr uh, permanent foundation as development. So uh, different parts of the country, we're buying lots for thirty to forty thousand. Uh, just finished one this week that we we bought the home itself for only ninety. So our total cost in the deal was about one hundred and eighty. We're listing for two seventy. Uh, we're going to talk about mobile home parks. We love those. <clears throat> we're going to talk about storage units. Uh, I just got a big shipment of uh, manufactured in China, ten by twenty twenty foot. Um, 5,000 pound boxes. We're putting them uh, as infill. We're doing storage unit developments. Um, we're going to discuss pad split, which is renting by the room as well as short-term rentals. Um, we love, love uh, some of the opportunities we're seeing. Again, an idea that I had, I'm really good at taking good ideas that Toby has and making them into real estate deals. So he'll say, hey, I was talking to, six months later, I'm doing those deals. So that's a cool Toby meets so many different people with Infinity and, and comes across so many different ideas. And he'll hit me with, every time I get an email from Toby that says, hey, what do you think about, I'm like, ooh, I need to, I need to test it and figure it out. And so that's something that's happened literally seven times over the last decade that I make a lot of money from Toby's, Toby's brain. Hey, that's good. It's not me. <laughs> I just steal everybody else's ideas. In fact, that's what Infinity is all about is stealing good ideas from wealthy people that actually work that we can all repeat. So none of those things did we ever come up with. Every one of those we learned from somebody who was making money doing it. And we said, hey, we should consider that too. Nothing wrong with that. By the way, who's us? Uh, there's Aaron. Uh, shoot, Aaron. Uh, we've been working together. I don't even know how long it's going on. Uh, uh, shoot, it's got to be getting close to 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're at over, over, over 17 right now. Yeah, and uh, and I've been doing uh, uh, lawyering and uh, as a tax attorney and as a real estate investor for twenty five years, twenty seven years actually, but uh, you know over twenty five. Let's just say that. And uh, the, one of the reasons why we work so well together is Aaron and I are in different companies, but we come together to do the teaching because it makes such a big impact, not just in the world but also on both our companies. The fact of the matter is, if you're wealthy, we do better. Yeah, I'm a tax attorney. If you don't have ta if you don't have income, then I don't have to. We're not really worried about taxes, right? So I got I got to help everybody make some make some dough so that we can help you with the tax issues. Uh, and so that's kind of a, one of those big things that one of our big callings is teaching people, especially young folks who may not get the best guidance and they feel a little bit of a, a pessimism about the future. How easy it is actually to build wealth. Uh, and it's not what they say. Most of the sayings out there, they just don't work. I know when you hear Aaron's, uh, Aaron was a school teacher when he figured out how to do real estate investing. Um, I was so broke uh, when I started uh, as a uh, as an attorney. I hung my shingle out on day one. Like I used to joke that I would go to Kentucky Fried Chicken to lick other people's fingers. I was so <laughs> poor. And uh it was like I lived in a 400 square foot studio. I had a child on the way, and I'm like, "Yeah, I'm still going to open up my firm." And it was just just dumb when you're the brand new lawyer. But hey, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you're an entrepreneur, and you you charge ahead, and then you get the uh, you get the rewards in the long run. It it ends up paying off. <clears throat> but we try to teach to those to our to our former selves, and say, "Here's the guidance." I had great mentors, Aaron. I've heard from you so many times. I know you had great mentors. 
and uh, and not everybody has great mentors in their life. So if you're here, uh, you know, please allow us to help, and 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 perhaps we can fill that role, or or somebody can fill that role here at Infinity or at Alpine, where we're able to help you. Um, what are you going to learn today? You're going to learn the top cash flow, and well, actually, let me go back here just for a quick second, Aaron. Tell them about the breadth of your enterprise and your investments, just to be clear. Yeah, so we're currently, you know, we're not we're not a seminar company. We're not uh, an education company. We just like Toby, you know, Toby's got a bunch of attorneys and CPAs that work for him. I have property managers, construction managers. Um, I'm an active, I qualify with the IRS as an active real estate investor. I personally manage projects here in Idaho. Uh, but we have uh, uh, Alpine property managements all over the country. So we have Alpines in Kansas City and Charlotte and Winston-Salem and Dallas and Indianapolis. And we're now uh, closing in on over 3,500 unique parcels, unique properties that we manage over 4,000 doors, uh, single family homes, apartment complexes, RV parks, uh, storage unit facilities, mobile home parks. There isn't an asset class that, that we're not interested in. I always say that, and we're going to explain what cap rate is today, but I always say I'm a cap rate whore because I just chase cash flow. And, you know, appreciation is nice, but it doesn't pay your bills. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're, we're uh, managing these companies with our own management companies. We have construction companies. We have real estate brokerages. And we also have manufactured home dealerships. So we, we started doing so much in manufacturing and mobile that we, we have uh, dealerships in Idaho, Kansas City, Indianapolis, and Charlotte. And we're basically we're we're not selling homes to people. We're actually uh, using our our pricing as dealers to do our own projects. And whether we're doing development or whether we're doing them in parks. And so, um, yeah. So we, you know, I've seen I see a, a huge landscape of opportunity in real estate. And we're going to walk you through active and passive strategies today. Maybe you're at a, at a phase where you're more passive. We're going to show you how you can be passive. We sell properties to investors. We're going to show you how you can partner with me on deals, how you can buy deals. And then we're going to show you what I what we think the hottest active strategies are today in detail. I'm going to spend time breaking for you, breaking down for you how we make money with storage units, how we're making money with mobile homes and manufactured homes, and in what markets they work. Uh, ADUs are really hot. If you haven't heard of accessory dwelling units, we're going to spend some time on that because there's, Toby, there's now 30 states that have legislation pending on accessory dwelling units. So we're going to talk about that as well. And the reason is because we're about 7 million units shy in the United States as far as living uh, housing units for families. And uh, you don't have to believe us. Uh, the Harvard's Joint Center for Housing does a report every year, and it ranges from the low end of 1.5 million behind to uh, well over 7 million behind with 7.2 units behind for affordable housing. We are horribly underbuilt, and we're barely keeping up right now with current uh, uh, current population increase. And that's not counting the uh, the number of people that have crossed over that border without being counted. Right? There's millions more. So we're in a real bad crisis, and anybody with eyeballs that goes to a major city can see it. Uh, so we need to solve it, and government tries to solve it by usually throwing money at stupid projects that don't do anything. As, uh, as human beings, we can solve it by saying, hey, you know what? There's creative ways to provide housing. We have to get the cost down so it's affordable because there's a huge unaffordability crisis. It's about 20 some percent of housings are what they call housing burdened. It's, they're paying way too much of their, of their income, over 40%, over 50%, over 60% in some cases just for housing. And we'll show you how you could still do well as an investor and do good by your fellow man. And we'll show you how to do those. When you hear about manufactured housing, you're talking about something where you could buy a unit, you could put that's just as good as stick built, sometimes better for half the cost. Sometimes, you know, and you're in and and people oftentimes have this weird thing where they go, it's mobile homes. No, some of these things you cannot tell the difference between a stick built house. It's just looking at it. when you talk about auxiliary dwelling units, some of these are beautiful. Some of these are absolutely gorgeous, but what they are is an extra $3,000 a month coming in for you because you decided to use some of your extra space and allow somebody to use it for housing. And we need to start doing that. When you hear about pad split, um, this is a great product that uh, we've been following for years. I use myself. I think Aaron, you probably have some units now. 
yeah. more and more of our clients are doing it, where we take a house and we make it into a boarding house, for lack of a better word. You're renting out the rooms instead of the whole house. And that, you know, I, I, I've done some test houses that I said, this will fail. Let's see if we can screw it up. And you still can't. We still double our income on it. And we're providing housing to people that are otherwise not houseable because of the uh, security deposits, banking requirements, and other things that that are requirements on one-year leases or two-year leases. When you start going and you start doing a month-to-month or a, a week-to-week on some of these renting out a house, it's amazing how those numbers, uh, you're doing great by somebody. Somebody's so happy. It's easier to run than an Airbnb. And the numbers are great. And it works out for everybody. It's truly a win, win, win. And uh, I know you're going to go over some of those too. I get really excited about that because we backed us. We had a client with over a thousand units. So I got to watch for years to make sure there was nothing wrong. Met the CEO, Atticus LeBlanc over at, uh, at Pad Split. I started doing them myself. Our clients started doing them. We have a builder who builds them. Been watching these for years, guys, and it's not fake. It is absolutely solid and it will absolutely help solve this issue that we have of way too many people and not enough housing. And with interest rates going up, with the economy going sideways, you know, all these little fluctuations, builders get nervous and, and they don't build. And housing prices are just, they're going to keep going up because there's so much demand and so little supply. We've never had so little supply as we sit here today. It's absolutely ridiculous. I know Aaron's going to go over all that, so I won't uh, jump into that. I'll say here's some house rules. Uh, we're going to be talking about cash flowing uh, strategies. We are not that group that says buy a house and hope does it appreciate. If that's what you're looking for, you're in the wrong place. We are that group that will teach you how to cash flow. And if you want short-term money, We'll show you how to wholesale. We'll show you how to subject to. We'll show you how to take a property and get it to somebody who's going to make it into a cash flow property. We will help you do that. We will help you do certain types of flips. But no, we're not just going to teach you to buy and and on comp. We always call it, do you want to buy on cap or buy on comp? Serious investors buy on cap, which is the, the return on that investment over a long period of time. They don't buy on comp. Comp is what is, is really for, you know, that agent who's trying to sell you a house in that great neighborhood, and they're trying to get you to pay the most, something that you would never pay, right? With us, we look at it and say, what's its, what's its actual uh, utility? What's the value of that property? I may have three different choices of what I could do with it. Do any of them fit? Is the return enough? We look at six and above. You know, we really want six caps and above, which means you're making 6% on your money. Um, we do like buying cash. We're not huge debt folks, but we show you how to use leverage properly. Uh, and we'll go over that in a little bit when we go over our infinity investing principles. And uh, Aaron's going to show you how to analyze value and purchase cash flow real estate. He's been doing it forever. He's got over 300 properties of his own. I have over 300 properties of my own. We know about what we're talking about. We've done it. We've been there. We have that t-shirt. It doesn't mean we know everything. It means we're our students and we learn every day, but we do have some experience and we have a great network of people who have great, like I have tens of thousands of clients. Anderson, we have over 500 uh, attorneys, accountants, EAs. We do over 10,000 tax returns for real estate investors every year. We see it. We see the net result. I Nobody can lie. Like if a client could say, I made money, I'm going to look at your tax return and go, BS, you did not, <laughs> right? I don't, have, I don't have to listen to what they say. I could actually read the numbers. The numbers usually tell us that Quite a bit of a different story, like if your neighbor comes out and tells you how they're just kicking butt in the market, usually you're like, can I just see a statement? I just want to know yeah. if you're pulling it. Oh my gosh. And then uh, we'll show you how to access capital. You probably didn't realize uh, at Alpine, I, I imagine you guys are probably over 50% of your properties are sold to retirement plans. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, it is. Um, sorry, my I just noticed my camera was freezing up a little there. Um, we... Um, about 10 years ago, I, I didn't even realize, but if you have an IRA or a 401k that's not with your current job, maybe a previous job or an IRA that you've contributed to, that you can actually own property inside the IRA. The IRA goes on title of the property. And so the rents every month become tax deferred or tax free growth. And then when you sell the property, then there's no capital gains because it's either tax deferred or tax free. 
And, uh, you know, I learned about them in 2009 after the crash. A lot of investors had lost a lot of money. They were not diversified. And Toby's going to talk about what we think good diversification should be this morning. But they had too much money in the market and not enough money in other assets. And so uh, I had a lot of investors interested in owning rentals inside their IRA, inside their 401k. And I would say, you know, every month we, we host a live three-day event that investors come to my offices. It's like Willy Wonka. Uh, opening up the chocolate factory to meet the Oompa Loompas. You come to our office uh, and, and we, we we educate you on these things. And one of the things we spend a lot of time on is how to own property safely inside a retirement account. And, and that's something that many of our clients now do. And we're sending out literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in rent every month from our management companies to people's IRAs, to their 401k. So, you know, maybe you're in a situation where you only have two or $300,000 and you're thinking, man, if I start spending 5000 a month of that, it's only going to last me eight or nine years. And I, and I want to live to 70, 80, 90. And, and, and imagine taking two or 300000 and buying a couple of houses in the retirement account and only living off the two or $3,000 a month in rent. And that's the vision that we help people who, who don't have as much as they want to in those retirement accounts. They need to catch up. And so we're able to help them immediately turn that into income producing. And it really acts almost like a pension, you know, no, it's not guaranteed. Uh, you, you know, and it's not an annuity where it's the same amount every month, but, but it has a pension like aspect that you're not spending the principal plus the property's going up in value too. So uh, using the rents. go ahead. And those rents, those rents go up in value. Like you're inflation protected these last few years where people are saying, Oh my gosh, you know, inflation, I, my dollars don't go as far. If you had an interest rate that you were making on a on an annuity or something, your money just got devalued by a good 20%, right? It melted. And when you have assets that are appreciating assets like real estate that are cash flow assets like real estate, or if you're invested in the stock market as a whole, then that inflation actually pushes those things up. And we keep seeing it over and over again. And people... There's folks out there that'll say, no, it's going to crash. And it's like markets are at all time highs everywhere. Yeah. Real estate, stocks. I'm sorry. Like quit listening to those people. They're idiots. Yeah, no uh, kidding. And I always say that they predicted 10 of the last two recessions, right? <laughs> Every year they predict one. Yeah, they're they're all it's always going to crash. Everything's going to crash. Just listen to the last few years of real estate. They're still predicting it's going to crash because eventually there'll be a correction and then they'll say, see, it's right. like the broken clock right twice a day. So we don't buy into that. We look at cash flow. We've all lived through the great recessions. Uh, we've been there both on the investment side, on the stock market and on the real estate side. We're going to focus like a laser beam today on the real estate side. But I understand that these principles follow across, and that's what we're going to go over. We are going to be going uh, until, uh, like, the time today is 9 to 4. We are going to take about a half-hour break in the middle of the day. If you're watching this on a video, you will not have to <laughs> sit around. You can go right through it and just start another session. Uh, if you're watching this uh, live, absolutely go and do that chat and do that Q&A. If you're on YouTube, you can probably comment there, too, and they'll 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 – Get us the questions. We'll be answering them. I have a whole bunch of folks, right? Like right now, I can look. I got Jen, David, Matthew, Alexis, Catherine, uh, Nika, Caitlin, and uh, oh, Caitlin Estel. That's awesome. Uh, uh, a, a attorney buddy of mine who's a former IRS trial attorney. I believe that's uh, that's uh, that she may belong to that. And uh, Rob Dybolt, uh and uh, and Jane. We got a whole bunch of folks there to answer your questions. And Kenny in the house like we have a whole team out there to answer your questions so please use them if you are watching this as a recording feel free to send in a re your questions to pro at infinityinvesting.com you will not be charged for this guys this is our pleasure to teach uh we will ask uh, we will ask if you want to join us we do have two memberships that we have uh, depending on how aggressive you want to get involved and whether you want to buy cash flow properties. Uh, but otherwise, we just teach. And there's a free membership. There's a low, low, low cost membership. And there's low cost coaching. And all those things, they're tremendous values. And the beautiful part is we're going to make you an offer today where we're going to show you how to get everything for free. You could have a full membership and coaching. And I'll show you how to make it at no cost. 
and, and it's, it's, it's very simple. You only have to do one thing and I'll show you exactly how to do it uh, because we want you as part of our group. We do really well together when we go out and, and, and buy, uh, like when we buy an entire street on a, in an area, I think we just did that in Winston-Salem where we just bought yeah. every house on the street yeah. and we could fix them up and that whole street value is going to go up. Just telling you. And it takes people and it takes people like you, it takes people like us to be able to go do it together. And, uh, and we do well. But I do have a question for you guys before we get into the infinity investing principles. Uh, how many of you guys would buy real estate or are interested in finding out how to buy real estate in your retirement plan? In an IRA, a 401k, a 457, a 403b, a DB plan, whatever it might be. All right. So we're seeing. All right. Yeah. Give me a thumbs up if that's you. There's a whole bunch of folks. And so we will absolutely, I'll make sure that we focus some time on how that works. And we're going to give you a great solution. In fact, one of those things that, that we're going to do today is give you what's called a self-directed IRA as part of our offer. Um, and I think we might actually be giving you a couple so that uh, depending on who you are and where you are, the, there'll be no reason why you can't unlock those funds. Uh, somebody says, we have 10 already. We love Alpine in our 401k. And I, Tom, we love you, right? Or Aaron, you have time. to do that because he says he like he loves Alpine. He didn't say Anderson. <laughs> he didn't say Infinity. He said Alpine. But but now you're still... gonna hurt Chuck's feeling, Tom. Chuck's. I'm telling Chuck you said that. Mm. We work as a group, guys. So uh, Anderson, 500 employees, all over the country. We've been doing this for 25 years. I love Anderson too. We still love you. <laughs> He's been an Anderson client since 2018. Yeah, it, we we just like working together, help you build up your uh, your structure so that the way we look at it is uh, we have very simple mission in our world, preserve, protect, prosper. This fits into the prosper, but the rest of our time is on preserving and protecting how to keep your dollars in your pocket. In fact, this afternoon, I'm going to go over taxation of real estate, something that we don't always do at Infinity, but I'm going to be going over how depreciation works, how accelerated depreciation works how cost segregations work, how to use the short-term rental loophole so that you can unlock uh, some losses and even save a bunch on your taxes on your W-2 and things like that. We'll show you how real estate professional status works. We'll show you how material participation works. We'll show you how active participation works. We'll show you what passive and non-passive means. We'll get into all that this afternoon. There's a bunch of tax reasons why we invest in these types of assets as well. But we're getting out ahead of ourselves. Let's dive into the principles that guide us. And this is really important just to understand where we're coming from uh, because it makes a huge difference once you understand the philosophy behind something. The number one thing that we do is we only invest in assets. And the easiest way to understand what an asset is, is it feeds you. You can spend the whatever it generates on a monthly, quarterly, annual basis. If you have things that do not put money in your bank account, you don't have assets. If you have things that take money out of your bank account, I don't care what you call it, it's a liability. Assets feed you, liabilities bleed you. Please write that down. Assets feed you, liabilities bleed you. And what we really care about is that you're able to distinguish between them. So like if you, if you buy a car, bought a car for my family, don't try to do the mental gymnastics of trying to say that's an asset. Unless you're using it for Toro or Lyft or Uber, that thing is a liability, period. But it's a classic car. It's going to go up in value. I don't care. Assets feed you. It actually provides you cash that you could spend. I don't invest in things and hope that they go up. That's called you know wishful thinking. I, I buy something and hope that it goes up in value. I have to sell it to get that value out or I have to borrow to get that value out. Now I'm not saying that's I'm, I'm gonna I'm not gonna say don't buy things that go up in value, but I'm saying that's not the reason we buy them. We buy them because they're gonna pay us, and they're gonna pay us continuously, and we can spend it. If I need to pay rent, I need to have cash. I can't say, well, my Tesla stock went up. How about I pay the next, you know, in two months? I'll, I'll sell it when it peaks. No, nobody's going to do that. They're going to say, no, pay my rent right now or electric bill. For all those folks that have, that went through 2007, you know what I'm talking about. 
if you were dependent on the growth in your stock portfolio and you didn't have a dividend producing stock account, you didn't understand how to be a stock market landlord, you didn't understand the three ways you can make money on stock uh, without selling it. If, 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 if you were in that scenario and your stock drew back and you're like, the last thing I want to do is sell my stock right now at a loss, it's 37% down to pay my electric bill, you were between a rock and a hard place. If you had had continuous cash flow coming in, because guess what? The companies that we invest in, they didn't, they didn't blink. They continued to pay profits all through that period of time. In fact, there's a great company called Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, God rest his soul, um, running it. And they went up 25% during that period of time because they invest in cash flow assets. That what that's exactly what we do. In fact, we're so easy. We just look at whatever the rich people are doing and we do that. Guess who made money during the pandemic? Rich people. Guess who made money during the pandemic? These guys, right? We killed it during the pandemic. Guess who made money during the recession? Rich guys. Guess who made money during the pandemic? These guys, right? We just did what they did and we got the same result. And it was so important. Hola, Senor Mathis. Hola, como estas? Uh, me, muy bien. And I love it. My, my wife's Colombian. So anybody that, that starts to chirp at me, I got to respond. Uh, traditional net worth does not def indicate financial freedom. I've seen too many millionaires that were uh, real estate rich or, you know, they had three cars and an RV and a boat and a house. And they said they were a millionaire and they were absolutely choking. They were miserable. They were they were anxious. They felt like they were working just to pay the loans on those items. They thought they were rich and uh, that's not wealth. Wealth is the ability to do what you want to do when you want to do it. In fact, here's an easy one. Could you leave right now? Just stop what you're doing and go on a three week vacation. Give me a thumbs up if tomorrow I said, hey, let's all go to Rome and you could go to Rome. Give me a thumbs up if that's you, if you have that much freedom. I wish there was 10 times as many thumbs up there. That's what we want. We want you to have the ability to, when you want to do something, that you're just able to do it. And guess what will give you that freedom? Cash flow. Cash flow is king. Absolutely having money coming in month after month, whether you're working, whether you're traveling, whether you're seeing family, whether you're golfing, whether you're goofing off, whether you're working your tush off, it doesn't matter. If, if we have these income sources, I call them infinity income sources, and here's what they are. They're rents, they're dividends, they're capital gains from selling options. I'm going to keep it really, really simple. Royalties off of things like oil and gas, or if you buy uh, intellectual property and interest, that's it. There's five infinity income sources. We want to have multiple income sources. We want to have more than one of those. We really want to have two or three of those. Somebody says, I wish I could. Wyatt, spend some time with us. We'll get you there. It's mathematical certainty if you do the right things. I'm going to show you the steps. Aaron's going to show you the concrete things you can do in real estate to effectuate those steps. And then I'm going to go through and show you why the IRS will reward you if you take those steps. And you'll realize man, why haven't I been doing this before? We'll absolutely show you how you can do it. it. It's really, really, really important. But there's five income sources that we count. Notice what's not on there. I don't care about your wages. I don't care about things that you're working to make. So if you have profit in your business, I don't want to look at that. What I want to look at is things that make money, whether you're doing anything or not. I need to look at things where the assets actually generating the income. And if I can calculate that and it's and it covers my expenses, then I never have to work again and I've hit something called infinity. I can live an infinite number of days off of my infinity income sources. Here's an easy one. And we'll do this be, uh, repeatedly throughout the day. I'll probably stop you and ask you to kind of do this analysis. You can do this, by the way, on a calculator at infinity investing.com. There's a free calculator. You put in your income, 
here's how much I take home, what actually goes into your bank account, not what your boss says you make, what actually comes into your checking account or your savings account that you can actually spend. And you subtract off your expenses. Hopefully that's, you'll have a positive amount. That's your spread. Call that your spread. That's, that's what's available to invest, right? But what I ask you to do is, and, and then by the way, add up your assets, everything that you own that you think has value, minus any liabilities, anything you owe to a third party. And I, I want you to do those two calculations and then remove you from the equation, remove your job from the equation and just count these, just count these. How much is coming in off of these items? And does it cover your expenses? So for example, if I am bringing in $7,000 a month in cash and my expenses are $5,000 a month, great. I, I know that I have 2,000 bucks a month that I could be investing. And I could probably do a little better if I worked on some of those expenses and maybe quit going to the, you know, you know, maybe I don't need to go to the restaurants five days a week. Maybe I cut that back. Or maybe I cut out some Starbucks, whatever the case, I could try to pump that money up. But what I really care about is that $5,000 a month that you're spending, do these income sources right here, rents, dividends, capital gains from selling options, you'll learn about that if you don't know what that is, royalties and interest, do they equal $5,000 a month? If they do not, then you're gonna start eating away your net worth to live. So when you retire, you will eventually run out of money and the calculator will actually tell you how many days you'll last. So if you fill it out, it will actually run the numbers. I'll show you, we use a coaching sheet, does the same thing. We could sit here and we could say, here's my infinity number. It's 1,233 days. Some of you guys, it might be 20 days, right? In which case we got a lot of work to do. It might be that, hey, if I stopped working, I'm in deep doo-doo. Then we start building, we deliberately start building these income sources. And I'll show you how it works here in a second. Um, oops. Wrote a book called Infinity Invest. It's on Amazon. It went to number one for a while. It got uh, lots of fun reviews. This has been a while since I put that up there. But you can go take a look at it and see what people actually say about it. Uh, it won a gold medal. Uh, at the Global Book Awards, which was Forbes published this and they went and entered it and they got a gold medal, yay. Uh, at the end of the day, what I cared about this was it was a step-by-step -step process to help people get out of debt, create assets, get more freedom in their life so they can do good things. They can live the life they want. And what I've seen, just what I've seen, you can, you know, you, you don't, don't roast me, the people that seem to do well are givers. Give me a thumbs up if you believe that there's some truth to that. That the people that tend to be successful like to share and help other people. Okay, I'm running that because I look at tax returns all day and I can see my high performing clients. They are the number one givers. Stats from the IRS show the top 10%, the, almost all, like a ton of the giving, a huge inordinate percent of the living. You might say, well, it's because they're making a million dollars a year. The giving started before they got wealthy. The giving started before they got wealthy. I believe in my heart, money makes you more of what you already are. And if you are willing to go through the steps to build your wealth, I think you are going to do better things for other people. And that's why I am committed to this wholeheartedly to help you do it. Look at Aaron. He built a flipping volleyball facility and a Olympic pool in your what, your backyard? Yeah. And then I just, I was on three acres and then I just bought the adjacent uh, three acres. Um, and and uh, my wife's like, we're not putting soccer fields, are we? I'm like, I mean, it's, it's an option, right? <laughs> you know what? The neighbors hated the idea of it, but because every day there's, you know, there's like 20 kids there from four till 10 at night, either in the pool or in the gym. 
Um, and, and I said to him, guys, it's a nonprofit. I'm not monetizing. I'm, I pay the insurance for the building. I pay for utilities. I'm not charging rent. It's, and once they realize it wasn't a financial thing, I think people are really, you know, when they realize, wow, you're just trying to pay it forward, trying to give back, trying to, you know, then people have been really cool about it. Uh, we have, we do make all the kids sign a speeding contract because I'm at the mile, I'm, I'm, I'm on a mile down the road and we make them, they sign an anti-speeding contract, <laughs> which uh, has helped because teenagers in cars, uh, you, you know. Just put a limiter on it or make them drive like, a, <laughs> make them drive a golf cart or you get to this point. They'd still probably drive too fast. Um, Aaron, you'll appreciate this part. Uh, and by the way, do you agree? Because you're around wealthy people all the time. And you have yeah. people knocking down your door all the time. Do you believe that people want to have a, uh, that there is that, there's almost like a, a, a missing component. I, I've met so many people that are wealthy. I call them rich, miserable bastards. Yeah. Uh, I, I stole that term from a buddy of mine, Hans, who used to, you know, say that if you have a lack of spirituality, you have a lack of fulfillment, you're not doing things for other people, you have a hole in your heart and you get, and it makes you miserable. And a lot of people are wealthy and they, and, and, and they're just not happy. I find that the people that are the happiest, the givers are the ones that are the most fun to watch them have success. Is that your experience too? Yeah, it's funny. I, I think that each one of us has a moral obligation to make a difference. And each of us has a superpower. And it can be teaching teaching pottery. It can be teaching bo coaching volleyball. It doesn't have to be some giant, you know, uh, political movement in the world. But uh, it, it, we, we have a moral obligation to take how, you know, our, our financial blessings and pay them forward and leave a legacy and not just give money to something, but to give our time. And when we do that, you know, Toby said to me, uh, five years ago, my favorite clients at Anderson are the ones who are working on that second mountain initiative that are working to, to bless others' lives. And, and um, those are the people that I like working with. And that's it. That's become a community. You know, Toby, Toby and his wife uh, joined me at my 50th birthday uh, in the Dominican Republic. And all of the group there were, were in that mode. And what's funny is when you get those wealthy people together, we don't talk about you know, our deals. We don't talk about, you know, our cars. We talk about those things. We talk about how we're making a difference. And, and that's what's, that's what's, it's contagious. And, and balance comes from, uh, ha happiness comes from balance and balance comes from focusing on all of those areas of your life, both financial, spiritual, physical, mental. It's a big, it's a real thing. Yep. And so we're going to eat it. We're not going to beat that down your throat. What we're going to show you is how to is, is how to adopt these principles and actually become financially independent with the hope that you do embrace that. Uh, we call it the second mountain because the first mountain is your ego, being really good at your job, making good money, feeling like you're a worth, worthwhile provider. And then once you hit that, then sometimes you go into a valley and you're like, what's next? I'm, I'm not fulfilled. And that second mountain is where you start making a difference. And you see it over and over again, almost every really wealthy person and they start doing their initiatives whether it be bill gates and the the gates foundation or elon musk or zuckerberg and all these guys whether you like them or not they almost all do it and, and those are the big extreme cases just look around your community almost all the people that uh, again that i find that that are that have been my mentors they were firmly on that second mountain they reached out to me and they helped me because they were on that second mountain a lot of people on that first mountain, if you you start coming up beside them and saying, hey, could you help me? They'll put that boot right in your face and shove you right back down. And that's what we don't want. We see that all the time, especially in mainstream media. It's like they just want to stomp on the on the population and keep them down. We're going to show you how to, how to break free from that, get out of that golden cage, and actually have some financial independence. So we're going to do it dollars and cents wise. And what better place to start than the U.S. Census? They come up and I added some inflation. It's probably not not high enough. That was from last year. But when I look at it is the average household, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, they spend right around $5,500 a month. That's not a small amount. That's, that's it, right? What do they make on average before taxes? Right around $75,000, average household household, not just individual. And they're spending a big chunk of that. When we start looking at that spending is the line items where we, we really get worried. It's like, boy, we, 
where the housing's gone up, food has gone up, everything's going up, right? And and hopefully your income keeps pace. What we saw over the last three years is that income didn't keep pace, right? All these things shot up 20, 30% and your income was, was trailing. So you really felt the pain right now, as we sit here today doing this recording, credit card debt is at its highest amount ever. It's over a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars. What does that mean? It means we're going to see economic pain as a result. I don't care what you do with the Fed. That's going to be painful because interest rates, unless they start shrinking them, it's going to be painful. Even if they start shrinking them, it's going to be painful. It's going to take a while. Now, we can look at the projections of the IR, uh, of the uh, uh, Federal Reserve. You can look at their economic projections. They're saying, hey, we're at 5.6. We're going to be down to 4.6 The follow in, in 2024. The next year is supposed to be at 3.6. But they've They've never really followed those. We could look it up and say this is where they anticipate. And then we could just hope that they actually do it. But boy, they've, they've, they've not done what they've said on a number of occasions. And I'll show you one extreme example from two years ago. All right. Let's take a look at something simple. The average rents. Now, here's, here's a truth. The median house price has gone up and is disproportionately high compared to rents. Rents are being forced up as a result. And there's two things that could occur or a combination. Number one is house prices start to come down to meet rent prices. And there's people that believe that's going to happen. Hey, interest rates are high. You know, it's, it's really expensive to buy a house. Those house prices have to come down, maybe slightly. What we know for certain right now is demand is about 100, about 1 million units, where it should be about 4 million units in the United States, or excuse me, uh, inventory is about a million units where it should be about 4 million. But other words, we just don't have enough inventory of homes. There's not enough supply. Demand is continuing to be way up here. So the other thing that could happen with this metric is rents go up and start meeting that median. In 2007, we were overbuilt and we had no equity in our homes. Like when, if, if I looked at the foreclosure world, it was because there was no equity in homes and you couldn't rent them for those payments. And so people were losing their homes left and right. Right now, that's not the case. We have about $200,000 average equity in home according to Black Knight and the rents aren't that far off. Like, yes, there's, they're disproportionate, but you could still survive in most towns. Now, where we invest, you're, it's, it's easy street. We buy based off not the value of the home. We, ba we buy based off of what it generates. That's called cap rate. Investors buy on cap. Write that down. Investors buy on cap. Amateurs buy on comp. Investors buy on cap. Amateurs buy on comp. Do not buy on comp. Your realtor will trick you into buying on comp for your personal residence. Oh, this is what the houses are going in this area. You still should look and see what would be the cap rate on that. Because if, God forbid, you, you lost a job, you got sick or something, you still need to be able to rent that property out so that you don't lose it. You still need to be in a situation where you don't end up in a, in, in a 2007, 2008 scenario. So what we do is we look at this. So like, for example, average person uh, who is uh, spending $5,000 a month, I'm going to go to their house right around here, 18 or 1700. So let's say there's 1700. I'm going to go down and even, and, and I'll put it down. I'm going to go right into here. I'm going to go kind of an average. I'm going to say, let's just say that they spend about $1,300 a month. We're going to go a little bit below average. The reason is to be conservative, right? Because people are, the, the housing is including their houses, their house payments. And we know that house payments are higher right now than they, than, uh, as compared to rents. We know that the value of the house commensurate to the value of, 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 of the rental value of that house are, is a little bit off kilter. So I'm going to adjust it downward slightly just to make the point 
let's say that we go into this sweet spot of thirteen hundred dollars. If if I buy that as a rental, I know that about sixty five percent of that is going to come to me. I'm going to have management fees, property taxes, repairs, insurance. I'm going to have utilities. I'm going to have all these things that I have to pay for on that property. And it lowers and creates something called NOI. Aaron's going to go over this today. But our NOI is $845 a month. Let's just say that I can find houses at $1,300 conservatively. Worst case scenario, I'm probably making about $845 a month net. That's what's coming to my pocket. Our way of looking at this is saying, hey, if you need to make 5,500, divide that by 845, we need 6.5 of those properties. Do you follow me? We need to make 6.5 of those properties. We need to buy them. What if I could buy that property for $150,000 per property? What if I could do that? Or what if I could buy a fourplex or a fiveplex or a sixplex? Right? I need 6.5. So I need a, maybe I need an eightplex, right? What if I could buy an aplex that does that? You're going to be shocked at what you could buy these properties for. When Aaron goes over what they were paying for these properties before. So for example, I already know because he showed me a $99,000 property that is literally now making $1,300 a month. It was bought a few years ago. Rents go up. Property price doesn't go up. You paid whatever you paid for. It. And you're like, is this, is this accurate, Aaron? I saw your face pop back on. You had one, I believe, that that was right around that number. Yeah, it was a house in Charlotte. We sold it for $99,000. It was rented for uh, $850 at the time, which was like, you know, about 7% on the rents and uh, net. Uh, that house is now worth uh, two hundred sixty-three thousand, somewhere north of two fifty, and it's rented for the rent's gone up to uh, over sixteen hundred. Sixteen hundred. So, so I'm even estimating low. But the point is, is that if you buy these properties right, and let's just say you think you could, if one hundred fifty thousand dollars is that a fair price for an average rental property that's yep. going to it's going to net you about eight forty five. Mm -hmm. So. I could just get my little calculator out and say, I'm pretty close to being retired and never having to work again because I have these rents coming in to pay for my expenses. Understand this is infinity income source. If I just did that times 150, it's less than a million dollars. So for those of you guys who are sitting there and you have retirement accounts and you're like, wow, uh, somebody says, I bought a house in the Midwest in 2016 for $30,000 that rents for $1,100 a month. Lisa, you are our people. This is what we do. I bought houses in 2008 in Vegas. I think we paid $38,000, uh, put a little bit of money. And let's just say that I was all in at, at 50 grand per property. I bought three of them here, actually brought hundreds. We sold a bunch of them because we're, we're numb nuts, but we, 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 we kept, a, I kept several, actually I have a bunch more now, but, um, but at that, right, that, right around that $50,000 range, they're all at 1300. They're all at 1100, 1250 and 1300. And they just cash flow in. Well, they've already paid for themselves pretty much. Like I'd have to go do the math, but I'm like pretty sure that I'm at, I, that I'm not out of pocket on any of them. Like the, now they're, they're just free properties and they're all worth over 300 grand. I haven't even looked last year. I think one was 365 or something. I was like, it's stuck in my head. And I was like, yeah, I don't sell properties. The only yeah, time yeah. I'll sell a property is if I'm going to buy more property. You know, it's funny is, uh, you know, Warren Buffett in the stock world has always been a proponent of holding on to good companies long-term like Coca-Cola, McDonald's, uh, you know, Apple. And it's, it's people understand this in the market. And, but they think, well, just because I, I used, I bought Apple in the 1980s for $16 a share, that doesn't mean they don't keep buying Apple now because the economics of that company are good. And just because you didn't buy a rental property in the Midwest for 30,000 in 2016, doesn't mean it's a bad deal now at a hundred thousand, because, you know, if you go back to, uh, you know, uh, 1970 in the Midwest, you could have bought a house for $2,000. And so uh, the one good thing about it, it one, the one constant about inflation, about the market is that they keep going up the best time to plant a tree was 25 years ago, but the very next time is, is right now. And so 
uh, you didn't don't don't have this FOMO that you missed this window and now you shouldn't be investing. Uh, you you want to be buying. I buy every month in the market. I buy dividend stocks, and Toby taught me that years ago. I don't mess with speculation. I don't. I just buy buy stocks that pay me rent, and I buy houses that pay me rent. And that's why I say I'm always a cap rate whore. You know. There's a few more. There's Evan says I bought a double wide. I paid roughly forty five thousand dollars for. Rent is $1,150 a month. House I paid $150,000 for. Rent's for $1,550 a month. We've had split those, by the way, guys. And you're going to see it go to like two and 3000 It's going to trip you out when you actually see those numbers. And I can say yeah. it because I took probably the worst property I had. And I wanted to see whether it would still make money as a pad split. And it does. Yeah. It's like it doubled my NOI. Toby, I can get a, a two-bedroom, one-bath single wide right now for $39,000. Uh, I'll put it in a trailer park and if, you know, whether it's my own or someone else's and rent that out for six, 700 bucks a month. And so if you're really like you, I, sometimes we meet people who are like, they're just, they, they're cap rate obsessed. They don't even care about growth appreciation. They just need the, that rent income, that coupon, then, then we can help you with that. You know, um, we can help push you towards, you know, assets that make sense that way. Uh, if you kind of want both, if you want appreciation and rent, then, then single family homes have been and still continue to be fantastic. Yep, and it's the best time is always right now. It, the, you know, the best time would have been five years ago. And then you're gonna be kicking yourself five years from now going, I could have bought those at what? Because it's not going down guys. Government's not gonna keep, like what's causing inflation is printing money. I'll show you the M2 money supply by uh, with CPI. I believe I have a slide in here and they're identical. Right. It's not, oh, supply chain or this, that or the other. No, it's because you keep printing money. It devalues the money that's out there. That's called inflation. And uh, it's a tax and it's insidious. Uh, more fun stuff. This is how they do it. This is how a financial planner, you talk to them and they'd say, hey, how much do you have to make every year? Let's just say you have to make $80,000 a year. They'd multiply that by 25. The reason that they'd say 80,000 is because in order to have 5,000 or whatever is it, $5,500 a month after tax. So you have to figure out your tax. So you have to make a little bit more. So they use the gross amount that you make during the year, pay a little bit of tax. You'll have enough left over that 5,500. What is that 5,500 a month? Gosh, darn it. I should, uh, it's about 66,000. So in order, like you, you may even be below that. But they're going to say 25 times that gross amount, whatever it is, and that's what you need to have uh, saved up. And you're going to use that 4% rule, and we're going to live off 4%. Of course, now they're saying it really is a 3% rule because of inflation and because of the markets and all this stuff. And they start fluctuating all over the place. I don't want, uh, and my mom, by the way, goes through this thing where she starts seeing the end of her money because it gets spent down over time not the way to retire that's their way that's this financial services world where it's like well we should have enough before we pass well like i don't want to run out of money the day that i die i want to create multi-generational wealth i want to create something that doesn't get spent down i don't spend down my real estate my real estate will continue to appreciate because will continue to become more valuable those rents will continue to escalate so right now it's providing 5,500. Next year, it'll be providing 5,700. The next year, it'll be providing 5,900. The next year after that, it'll be providing 6,100. It's going to go up and keep up with inflation because rents get forced up with inflation. So it's got protections built in. I don't want to sit here and run out of money. Our way, you would have that money coming in for life and it's indexed for inflation. It automatically adjusts. You have to come up with about half as much money and you do not deplete them. This is something that will continue paying your future generations, your kids, your kids, kids, your kids, 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 right? We call them infinity income sources because they don't go away. They're infinite. You buy a property, the property, we always use something called CapEx. It's part of our calculation. Uh, it's part of the money when we say you're bringing in 65%, uh, probably 10% is being put aside to fix things like roofs and stuff like that. That property will continue to grow in value 
which we're never going to touch, but the rents will continue to grow as well. So that in 50 years, it's not going to be paying, you know, a net of, of, of 800 and some bucks. It's going to be paying a net of 2000 or whatever it is. It's going to keep going up. Just like I have people in chat telling me that this is what they did just not that long ago. We're talking 2016. I love that $30,000 and it rents for $1,100 a month. Well, guess what it's going to be in 2035, right? That same property, they still only paid 30 grand for it, but now it's going to be paying them $1,500 a month, whatever it is. Their way, I just say, is too risky, not interested in doing it. I like to use quotes every now and again. And uh, uh, Paulo Coelho, uh, what was it? The uh, the Alchemist, one of the great books of all time, and he wrote was was great. One day you'll wake up, and there won't be any more time to do the things you always wanted to wanted. Do it now. I believe that. Let's get ourselves freed up, get ourselves out of our own way, so that we're not hoping that we retire in some point in the future, but that we're allowed to give ourselves that freedom now. And I always look at it and I say, boy, I see clients all the time. They're in their 40s, they're in their 50s, they have student debt, they have car debt, they have a big mortgage, they have credit cards, they have kids that now they're going to be sending to school, and they tell me they feel like they're in here. They're in a golden cage. They still drive a Lexus, they still have a great house, but the adjectives they tell me tells me servitude, like they feel trapped, and that's because of this. They don't understand the relationship between their assets and their liabilities and their income and their expenses. We have to calculate these things, guys. We gotta get a handle on what our income is. We gotta get an idea of what our expenses are. And we have to do an add up to figure out what are our actual assets and what are our actual liabilities and then what our net worth is. I do two types of net worth. I do your traditional net worth, and I'll show you on a sheet how we track it. And I also do what's called your infinity net worth, which is how many days you'd survive if only your assets were producing income. In other words, I take your income out of it, and I look at your rents, royalties, dividends, interest, and short-term capital gains, just the five infinity in, uh, income sites, uh, types, I want to know how whether those will cover all your expenses or whether we have to start selling off our assets to pay for those. But your assets have to be able to take care of it. That way, if you wanted to retire, you can't. That way, if you got sick, it wouldn't destroy your family. That way, if you lost a job, it wouldn't impact you. You guys following me? We need to be very deliberate about the types of income sources that we're creating. And in order to do that, we look at the types of income and we're going to look and see what the wealthiest Americans do, what successful people over time have invested in. And we're going to get a pretty good idea of what we need to invest in. So there's eight types of income. There's those wages. This is active. And if you didn't know, that means it's taxed at your ordinary rate. Zero to 37%. Plus social security. If you work for yourself and you have profits, also active, also subject to those two types of, uh, of taxes. If you work for your, uh, if you have profit coming through, but you're passive, you're, a, you're not participating, so you're a silent owner or whatnot, then it's gonna be no social security. And Social Security, by the way, old age disability and survivors of Medicare adds up to 15.3%. There's a phase out on a portion of it and they get a small deduction. So it ends up really being the math is 14.1% of every dollar. But that takes a big bite out of your uh, out of your income. And so my job is to look at the different types of income that are out there and say some are better than others. Rents, for example, are also passive. Royalties, they are subject to ordinary tax, but no social security. 
dividends are taxed at 0, 15, or 20% if they're qualified dividends from the stock market. So if you invest in the U.S. stock market, U.S. companies, then they're treated as long-term capital gains. If you make less than $90,000 a year after your standard deduction and you're married filing jointly, your dividend rate's zero. So you could be making money. You could be making a you know, five, 6% a year uh, easily on a bunch of different companies right now. Altria is probably like 9% and not pay tax on it. Interest is taxed as ordinary. Ordinary income, no, no social security. Short-term capital gains, it's ordinary. Long-term capital gains, 0, 15, 20%. So we can already start seeing that there's different types of income sources that are treated better than others. And so we start looking at those going, hey, I'd really like to see those in my portfolio. I'll add this guy because we sell covered calls. No social security. So if I have the opportunity to make a dollar working versus making a dollar selling an option, I save 14% on that dollar doing the option. And so it's, it's this whole idea of working smarter, not harder. You guys follow? I know I just threw a lot at you in a short period of time, right? I know that, that not everybody's going to just immediately grasp, but give me a thumbs up if you're kind of following. Different types of taxes or different types of income are subject to different types of taxes. There are taxes that make and taxes that take. And we drive towards the taxes that make. And I'll show you. In real estate, not only do you pay less tax, but you actually get a tax break. There are tax laws that make you money in real estate with something called depreciation, which I'll go over this afternoon. Can, load, can loans be considered a type of income? Uh, they are non-taxable, Ethan. So when you borrow against your assets, so a lot of times we set up uh, trading accounts, for example, we start building dividend stocks. We can actually borrow against those through something called a security back line of credit, cheaper than a mortgage. And we could use that to go buy real estate. The real estate, we could use the depreciation if you're a real estate investor and actually offset the tax on any dividends and rents that you make. Now you're thinking like the rich. The rich do this, and how do I know? Because the IRS gives us stats. If you're making over a million bucks, you're making as little as 4% on that active income. 4%. There are, when you're over a million bucks, there are people making 90, uh, what is that? 96% uh, from non-working, from going back here and going, to, oops, here, let me see if I can do this, right? They're, you cross these guys out and they're making their income off of here. 96% of it. And it's because it's tax advantage and you don't have to do anything. That 4% is absolutely real. A big chunk of it comes from capital gains. Now they make capital gains in a variety of ways. The dividends are an easy one, but also they sell long-term holds. It's not uncommon because they get taxed at the, the max is 20% plus net investment income tax. So 23.8%, still better than 37%. And a good chunk of it, over 40%, 40 to 40, 42 to 47% from rents, royalties, dividends. And in these types of profits, it's profits off their businesses. But remember that this, this type of profit is passive and interest. So you can have two types of profits, profits you work for and profits that you're just sitting there being a silent partner. And Wealthy people tend to sit back and make money as a uh, silent partner. IRS continues to help us. We can just look at it and say, how many sources of income do you have? How many different income sources do you have? People making over a million bucks, the vast majority have at least three. How many income sources do you have right now? If I went and I pulled up that list, here, I'll go back to my little list. 
let's just say we looked at the eight types of income. How many of these are on your list? How many, if, if, if you have meaningful, like more than a hundred bucks a year, do you have income coming from these different sources? How many of you guys, like put it in chat if you can, or if you're listening to this as a recording, just kind of write it down. I want to know how many uh, income sources you have. Just kind of throw it up there. Somebody says four. Great. Four, five, six. We got some rock stars on. One. Okay, we got a little work to do. Five, two, three, six, two, five, one, three, but working on four, two, three, 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 two, six, but no rents. All right, we can remedy that. We can fix that. Five, but not a millionaire's. Talking about on average, average, somebody says 17, um, four, two, six. That's what we're doing is we're just going to add additional revenue. And then once we start doing that, it's actually kind of fun. One big, three small. Perfect, Ralph. We're just going to work on it. Joshua, one. It means that we have some room to grow. We're going to do it. Just remember, you know, all we're doing is looking at the people that are making over a million bucks. I can tell you that that's not the greatest indicator. That's just the only data that I can grab. When I look at my clients, there's a lot of them. We try to put ourselves in that two hundred dollars to $300,000 range because you never get audited. And also because we don't want to get into the higher tax brackets. If somebody is forced into that higher tax bracket, they're over a million bucks, then we're going to take a look and say, hey, they must have multiple sources of income. Now, the other thing we see is people get themselves in trouble. So I'm going to give you guys a very simple process in which to decide whether something is, 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 is uh, whether you're operating your affairs in the right way. I call it the losing loop. Number one, people that tend to be in financial disarray, they're using their liabilities to pay for their expenses. So they're using a HELOC so that they can pay for school or uh, medical expenses or living expenses. And their income is really going to those liabilities. So when you hear about somebody who has a mortgage and they're paying 40% of their income towards that liability, plus they have car payments, plus they have school payments, plus they have the boat payment, plus they have the RV payment, plus they have this payment, that payment, the other, almost always their money is going to go pay for a liability. And those liabilities, they're still using those credit cards to cover those expenses. And we know that's the case right now because we're over a trillion dollars of credit card liabilities in the United States. It's just crazy. So the number one thing to do is just get 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 out of that habit. Don't use your liabilities to pay for your uh, expenses. So don't pay those expenses by taking on additional liabilities. Just say no. Just do everything you can to make sure that you are not using liabilities. I'll show you what to do in a second. Um, try not to get into a situation where you're using your income to pay for liabilities. It's not a good feeling. Like, it, hey, I got this big house, comes with a big electric bill, comes with a big gas bill, comes with big maintenance costs, and I am working to maintain my house. I buy a nice car. It's $3,000 to change the oil. Every tire costs 1000 bucks. You know, and I end up paying up the nose to maintain the thing, my income, is going to maintain that liability. Not a good place to be, just say no. And all of us like have to be careful. Don't buy that car with a loan. Don't buy that house with a mortgage unless you do a calculation and say, I could rent a property for about the equivalent. Just remember that when you buy a house, it's about 5% a year to upkeep. The cost of maintaining a home, somewhere around 5%. So when you buy that house and you buy that really nice house, I buy a million dollar house, think $50,000 a year to maintain it. If I could rent that same house for less than that amount, I should be renting it because it's cheaper for me. And then people are going to say, but then you don't have the asset. No, take that extra money because you're saving money now and invest it in things that are assets. But don't go ahead and like, don't buy those liabilities with uh, with a liability. You end up in a situation where you're getting hit twice. I buy a car that's going to cost me money every month and it costs me every month just to pay for the car. That doubles it up. 
No money's being made anywhere. That's all on me. And I have to work my katush off to do it. And that's the losing loop is when that income is going in to pay for those liabilities and those liabilities are covering those expenses. We've all seen people that are in that situation and it seems like they're one paycheck away from failure. And that was 2008, 2009, 2010 to a T. And we're seeing it now too. Rule number one is you use that income and you buy assets. If we all played Monopoly in real life, this is what we'd be doing. Hey, I need, every time I land on something that I could buy, I should find a way to buy it. As long as it's going to produce me rents or some sort of income. So you use those income to buy those assets, use those assets. Those assets pay for those expenses. Those assets pay for those liabilities. I'm never going to tell you not to have a Lamborghini. I'm never going to tell you don't have a big house. What I am going to say is, make sure the assets are paying for those expenses, not you. I don't want your income because if something happens to you and that income goes away, we need to make sure that our assets can carry us. And that's all it is. And then don't forget the wealthiest people have about 90% of uh, 96% of their income is coming from that source. That's your top people. All of those assets get driven up. So when I use, uh, when I was talking earlier about the M2 money supply and how they keep printing out income or uh, additional cash, here's the pandemic where they start printing the $4 trillion. Look at that thing. Notice that this is the Case Shiller home price index. Notice how they follow each other. They can get on TV. They can use all the fancy words they want. If you produce a bunch more cash, it's going to cause inflation. Opposite, if you pull cash out of the system, it causes inflation to decrease. They pulled $1.2 trillion out of the market last year. They retired that cash. They took it out, went away. And what happened to inflation? It started to curve down. They also raise interest rates. They make it painful for anybody to buy things. So now all of a sudden your demand is going down, right? And allows supply to, to recover. But make no bones about it. It's this cash and that's not going to stop. So real estate, stock market, it's going to continue to get driven up just like that consumer price index. It's not going down. I don't see, hey, look, it's gone way down ever. And then this is a really good point. Charlie Bellello is an economist that I follow. And he said, hey, two years ago when CPI was already above, that's consumer price index inflation was already above 5%. The Fed was forecasting rate hikes only to 1% by the end of 2023. I kid you not. That's what the, like they actually put out their projections at the Fed. You can go pull them up anytime you want. I actually have a video that shows how to do it. And they're saying, hey, we're gonna lower interest rates, right? Why do we believe them? Everybody's banking on this stuff. Do not buy based off of what the Fed says. Because even when inflation was obviously high, they did not do the rate hikes. They continue to say 1%, 1%, 1%. So here's our steps. You want to be successful in infinity. And I'll show you how to work this when, we, when we're going to be talking about real estate here in a second. I'm going to give you guys a break in just a few minutes. And then we'll dive into the, uh, into the real estate side and all the, uh, how to calculate two cap rates, looking at the different types of properties. We'll get into that, I promise. But step number one is we have to get our expenses under control. I suggest using something called 70-30. You live off of 70% of your take home, if humanly possible. 30%, 10% is going to go to giving. 10% is going to go to paying down debt. And 10% is going to uh, investing. You do them all at the same time. And when I say paying down debt, 
I'm not talking about leverage. There is a difference between debt and leverage. Debt is on a liability. Leverage is on an asset. So it is possible to have debt in a way, right? But it's we're going to use it as we're going to term it leverage. If you're buying cash flow properties, if you're buying assets that are producing income, if you buy a, a business, for example, that's producing more income than what is, is costing, then it fits the definition of an asset. If that leverage causes you to lose money every month, then it is a liability. It's no longer an asset, right? So what we care about is buying, if, if we're gonna do anything, we're gonna lever up an asset. But uh, to the extent we can, let's stick to cash. Giving, if, if you cannot afford to do it, and I know there's some of you guys out there that are struggling, then give time. If you don't wanna give the money, give time. But you should be giving. I don't know what it is. It's one of those weird mystical things in the universe, or maybe it's because when you're around organizations that are charitable organizations, you tend to be around rich people. Maybe that's it. Or maybe you're around good people. Like if you go and you're working, I, when I was in college, I worked at Northwest Harvest, drove a little, um, a little uh, forklift and moved food around and stuff like that. That was my community service because I didn't have any money. Uh, but you get around people that, Sometimes you meet, like I remember Rotary Club, like I still have friends from that who had actually pretty profound impacts on my life. Um, number of boards I've sat on, EO of different charitable organizations, King's Ransom, and I meet really cool people and it's always helped me in other areas of my life. So make sure that you're at least giving your time if you can't afford to give the money. Paying down debt doesn't mean the minimum, that means paying it off and notice I didn't say pay off your debt and then invest. You got to start investing. You got to start investing now because there's a learning curve to it. If you're in real estate, here's something to, that you really need to understand. There are active ways to make money in, in, in real estate that does not require money. There's active ways to make money in real estate, like wholesaling, agent, construction, Finders, managing, there's ways to make money where it's just your time. There's also ways to make money with very little money, like uh, probably 15,000 bucks. If you can muster 15,000, Aaron's going to show you and we'll show you a way that you can learn to do an advanced dive on things like flipping manufactured homes. Yes, it is a thing. And yes, we have, we have folks in our community that are absolutely killing it doing that, that are making great money. Aaron, you're, you're giving a thumbs up on that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, you know, it, it, we had a, a live event a few weeks ago, and I swear 80% of the room were, number one, Anderson uh, clients from a structure standpoint, but number two, they were all in medical. And it was interesting. Uh, I'm talking to surgeons and, you know, doctors and, and dentists, and uh, I said to him, look, how much is an hour of your time worth? Um, and, and one, one the surgeon raised his hand. He said, Oh, well, I know when I'm in surgery, the hospital bills me out, you know, for, for like 2000 bucks an hour. And I said, I have a wholesaler that makes that going to tax sales and foreclosure auctions. Um, I said, you know, I just did a mobile home flip recently where I averaged $1,500 an hour for the time that I spent managing my construction crews, finding the deal and then selling it. One of the interesting things is you know, uh, if if we could show you today how to make five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars an hour in real estate, give me a heart emoji if you would find fifteen hours a month to be more active as a real estate investor. Right, and so that's what's it's interesting because I feel like medical people, you know, they spend a lot of time, they spend a lot of money to get that, and then I had all these doctors going, "Hey, well, one one physician said to me at our cocktail party, I'm going to have my assistant." do a manufactured home on a permanent foundation because you can do that for three or four hours a month. So once you start realizing how you can tap in, it changes what you're going to carve into your life. And there's a reason that I still, you know, Toby, Toby taught me about being a real estate professional 
And it's funny, Toby, because I still manage construction crews to get my hours to maintain that status because it's incredibly valuable to me on the tax side. And so, yeah, I make money doing those deals, but where I really save money is if you don't, if, you know, if you don't have to give the IRS four hundred thousand dollars in a year, okay. and you make a hundred grand from deals, what's what's a bigger impact? And so, once you start to educate yourself on these topics, it really changes your spending habits, the way that you think about things. Like I love putting money in my nonprofit. I leased a car. Toby's like, dude, you you leased a race car three years ago, and and I said to myself, well, my business is paying for it. Um, but it's still a $3,000 a month lease. I'm never doing that again. It's been cool having an M8 BMW. I have two speeding tickets over 150 miles an hour. I'm never leasing a car like that again. I'm never getting a midlife crisis car. I'm going back to my 96 Bronco, which I love more anyway. But it's funny. Sometimes we have to learn those lessons the hard ways. And I know some of you are listening to this going, man, my parents didn't teach me these things. Uh, we didn't learn these in the high school. I didn't learn this in college. I'm glad I'm here today. We're glad you're here today. And and I'll, I'm always the first one to tell you the stupid mistakes. I, I can't wait to get it. It's funny, Toby. That car was so great for the first six months. But that three grand a month is still a payment. And I have it until May Does of next year. I, I can't wait to get rid of that stupid liability. Does it bug you? Oh, I hate it because yeah. uh, the, the the now it's two years old. I still have another year on the lease. And all the new car smell is worn off. And all I think about is what a stupid ego waste of money you know and the de the dealer was happy when i when i do and i look cool driving into the golf course but man i'm 50 i don't care about that anymore so it's it's funny i got the tesla x plaid because i thought I, I i wanted to see what it felt like to go zero to 60 in two seconds now i love not going to the to the gas station but i don't <laughs> drive that much i'm like yeah. i feel bad about it but it is fun to go really fast, but I don't speed. Like I never get speeding tickets because I'm one of those guys that actually probably drives below. It would be a waste on me in M8. Yeah, it, it's been cool. But yeah, I'm, I, I re also realize I'm a big car guy. I like big Broncos yeah. and pickups. And I just restored a 1973 uh, square body pickup that Meg's great grandpa bought brand new in 1973, the year I was born. I mean, I like that. I like driving around in that truck. And you know, I spent 15 grand restoring that. I'll drive that forever. I get more looks from that in Idaho than I do in an M8. They just think I'm a douchebag. You know, it's a it's an it's a BMW blue. <laughs> so I don't know. We're we're always learning about financial lessons and applying them. And I and you know, 24 years ago when I was teaching high school, uh, I learned lessons, and and it, it never ends. We're always a student, and that's one of the things why I love catching up with Toby because. He and I are like, hey, have you heard? And what about? And you know, you just sent me an email this week about that about the deposit company. And so, you know, I, 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 this this should be a an ongoing thing. I love to see how many people are joined us, um, you know, and carved this out of their day. I, we appreciate that, and hopefully, you get the sense of how sincere we are and how excited we are to be here to be teaching you. Yeah, I like that. Somebody's got they got the four two eight I. All right, can yeah, uh, let's let, let, let's do this. Somebody says you could put it on swap lease and get rid of it. <laughs> I'm just they, paying uh, my tuition. Every time I right. lose money and do stupid things, I pay tuition. It's just tuition on never lease a midlife crisis. You didn't yet. pay for it. That's the beautiful part. Like I can think of that's one true. of your investments that I know about, the Bitcoin thing, that's paying for it, right? So all you're just doing is something else is paying for it. It's true. It's true. All right, I got and one I more step. And I got one more step. And then I got it. Like, I'm so far behind, aren't I? We'll take a, we'll take a break. Yeah, you're good. Okay, we'll, do, we'll do one more step. And then we'll take a break. And then I want Aaron to be uh, diving in and spending most of the day teaching the uh, the numbers. But I do have to show this. You'll like this, Aaron. Um, you, you'll probably recognize who this is. In six short years, we implemented three of the strategies this and this month, starting our fourth. I was able to quit my job and focus 100% of my time with my husband building our business while we're both semi-retired. This is actually somebody that was at your birthday and goes and, and visits. I, I uh, do beaches. remember. I do remember. Yep. Yeah. Everywhere. It took six years, but I remember the first time I sat down with them too. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it's mathematical certainty, guys. That's the thing. It's, it's just formulas. It's just yeah. buying things deliberately to achieve a result. Speaking of that, step number two, this is where it gets fun. These are the types of assets we buy, 30, 30, 30, 10. We're going to buy income 
producing stocks. We don't buy things and hope they go up. We buy things that pay dividends. Aaron, you've you've heard me preach about that a million times. And yep. you, you avoid the, the volatility in the market and all you do is keep getting paid. Shoot, it's it's boring. It's boring. Uh, there's, we'll show you, we, we teach you how to do it, by the way. Soup to nuts. This is real estate. And these are percentages. And real estate can be, uh, if you're just getting started, it could be a REIT. It doesn't have to be you go out and buy yeah. a house with all your money. Correct. Frankly, if you don't have the cash, you shouldn't be buying the house anyway. Like a, a roof would mess up your a couple of months for you, right? You know, having to fix something up. So you got to make sure that you're buying it. We really want you to be able to buy with cash. Uh, and we really want you to, like, if, if you have a, a 401k or an IRA or something, uh, that makes it really, really simple because you can kind of keep it separate from yourself. Um, the other 30%, I call this managed. Managed money, and it falls into syndications. It falls into a money manager. It falls into mirroring somebody else's portfolio. But you are taking a backseat to the decision-making process other than oversight. And uh, that way you don't end up being your own worst enemy because we've all done really dumb stuff where we put everything into one thing and we don't want to do that. So we want to make sure that we're spreading it out. And then this last 10% is cash and cash equivalents like gold. I'm not going to tell you not to have gold and silver or Bitcoin. I'm just going to say 10% of your uh, of your wealth max in these things and in, in, in US dollars, in gold, silver, Bitcoin. Have your money in things that are going to be producing you income. And if you do this, this is actually bail, ba uh, based off the Yale model of diversification, what the Mail and, uh, Yale Endowment did. It was a gentleman by the name of David McShane I worked with uh, when we were building Infinity. Worked with him all the time. He passed away during COVID, unfortunately. Uh, but was a great certified financial planner, had managed billions of dollars and had set rules that he really liked to follow. And we got together and we said, what could we, what could we do? Because this was, this actually could be a really complicated formula if you were a money manager. And he says, I think we can make it into something that's understandable that anybody could do that'll keep him out of trouble. And this is what we worked on and came up with and it worked great. And by the way, Here's another result that I could say this stuff works. We started with baby steps. And as Toby says, just start. I do say, just do it. You learn by doing. Uh, we learned about passive income and how to accumulate it. We learned about purchasing properties outside our state of California, being a stock market landlord and trading in the stock market. We've reached our infinity number, allowing us to live our life by design. These are real people. It's probably took three or four years on this individual because they were already doing all right. Sometimes it takes a year. I've had folks that did it in months. They just redesigned their portfolio so that it was income producing. And voila, they had enough coming in where they were like, wow, I never have to work again. I'm like, yes. And that's just you. Imagine what your family is going to be able to do with that. I point to the Hershey Foundation all the time because in 1905, when it started, it was a few million bucks. Now it's worth 13 billion. You could look at Harvard. That's also a nonprofit. Uh, they're exempt and things like that. But they have over a billion dollars a year coming in off of endowment. If you allow these things to accumulate, then down the road, it might be, tw you know, 50 years, 100 years. These things continue to grow and they continue to compound and they get huge. It's like uh, Warren Buffett. People forget he wasn't a billionaire until what, he was 60. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it just shoots up. Now he's worth like $88 billion. In step three, this is the last one, and, and then I'll do one result and hand it to Aaron. Uh, this is lever. Lever up. Don't sell things. If you start accumulating a portfolio, for example, let's say that you build a stock portfolio and you start, and when I say 30, 30, 30, 10, let's say at a million bucks, that means 300,000 in there, and it grows to 450, and you want to buy more real estate. You can borrow against the stock to buy more real estate and you start to lever up. Or let's say that you had that 300,000 in real estate and it grows to be worth 450, 500. 
you could borrow against those, or even your house, you could borrow against those to continue to lever up. Or let's say that uh, you're, you have a uh, retirement account. There are lenders that will actually loan inside that and allow you to refi some of your properties as they grow. Now for cash flow properties, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you my philosophy, Aaron, you could tell me whether you agree. I think anybody, if they own seven properties outright, you, it's, it, you, you now decide whether you ever want to work again. If you can get, yeah. If you can get seven properties that you own outright. So that's kind of a starting point. And then as you grow up beyond that, it's like Aaron, you're at what, over 300 properties. Yeah. We might lever. We might lever. We did on uh, one of the storage units, right? And then and then you attack that debt and you get rid of it. Yeah, I always say if I can if I don't mind debt, I don't mind a loan, but I never plan on any spendable cash flow if it has a debt. I take 100% of the positive cash flow and use it to pay that principal down. The benefit is leverage, not cash flow when you put a loan on a property. That's my mindset about it. And so sometimes I'll say, well, it's kind of like 60 months. Am I going to keep it for five years? Or if I know I'm going to keep it longer and it has a loan, then 100% I'll pay it off. I know I'm going to sell it. I'm okay spending the cash flow, reinvesting it in other things. But you have to, you, you set some rules. And when guys like Toby and I have lived by those rules and they've worked for us for so long, I never, I never sell properties now. The properties I regret the most are the ones I've sold. Those are the ones I missed. They're like my my kids that I gave them away. You know, <laughs> I do the same thing. We, we we sold all the properties here. We were flipping houses in, in Vegas in 2008, 9, 10, 11, probably 12. We did some too. Some of the ones that we end up with, like I know one, the roof caved in on uh, on Thanksgiving. So like we were about ready to sell it. And we had a huge rainstorm here. And uh, it, it messed up the floors. So we said, oh, shoot, now we're going to have to keep it for a while to let it get, build up cash because I don't want to rehab it and then sell yeah. it and not make anything. And uh, my gosh, I've had that property now for, I don't even know, 15 years, some stupid amount. And it's continued just, it's just a cash machine. Yeah. Why would you sell it now at this point? I wouldn't. I shouldn't have sold the ones that we flipped. I was just a dummy. I mean, my kid, my son, my, my my son was diagnosed with type one diabetes, and think how cool it was to be able to redo my trust and earmark three properties forever. I put a deed restriction on the properties for medical for my son. I mean, type one diabetes with the devices and insulin, and everything cut usually is fifteen hundred dollars a month. Knowing that he'll, I said to my son, you'll never have to worry about your diabetes care. It's always going to be taken care of for the rest of your life. That's the power of, of this. And think about a former high school teacher to be able to do something like that financially. I don't, I don't forget what it was to be poor. I don't like having, I didn't like having poor people problems. And, uh, you know, 90% 90 of the millionaires came from nothing. Yeah. Didn't inherit it. Is a real thing. Okay. Last, last result. We now have four infinity income streams of income along with the wages and profits I earn from my businesses. This has enabled us to hit our infinity freedom number for our future. You can do exactly what we did and build multiple streams of income. All it takes is desire and willingness to learn to invest in yourself. That's really it, guys. If you just follow these simple rules, Aaron's going to show you what like, we should probably take a break. We'll take a 10 minute break and we'll come back and we'll show you how to invest in the real estate deals, how to find the good deals now. Because the, the markets change, you just want to be able to change along with it. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll go through that. So let's see, I have three properties I own outright and two houses on one lot that I lived in, but converted both to short-term rentals. I just liquidated a $400,000 investment in a uh, self-directed IRA, but really unsure how to move forward. You're in the right place, Lisa, because you're going to have the ability to probably turn that into two or three properties if you wanted to, depending on how diverse you want to get. Uh, but I, I like the idea of getting paid every month. I don't know about you, but I don't like the idea of hoping something goes up in value and then maybe now I have to sell it. I like the idea of just having steady cash flow because cash is king. Cash flows right there with it. Uh, never having to worry about that check that comes in is great. And, uh, and, and we'll get, we'll get jumping on that. Uh, and, uh, there's a, I don't know what that means there's a high end value we'll look at we'll, we'll show you how to calculate all your cash flow so let's do this Aaron are you cool with taking a 10 minute break all right 10 minute break then when we come back in I promise you Aaron is going to be diving into all the calculations to do the property showing you before and after giving you the history 
so that uh, we're all on the same page when it comes to investing in real estate. And I hope you guys are seeing now just the different philosophy, how real estate can allow you to retire and not have to work. And when I say retire, some of you guys will still work. I still work. I still, I probably work harder now than, than when I actually had to do it. Um, and that means I'm a volunteer. It changes everything for all those people that were sticking their thumbs up that they didn't have to work. I'm sure that they're working their tails off on certain things that they care about. And it makes a huge difference when you have the freedom to be able to do that. Again, uh, if you guys have questions, throw them into the Q and A. If you have comments, put them into chat. And if you want a copy of the recording of that first section, plus everything else that's coming on, email us at pro at infinity and we'll make sure we get that. Hey, Aaron, I see you responding to somebody, but that was a good question. That would actually be, uh, worth responding, you know, uh, there's been some great questions. Uh, a lot of you have been asking about self-directed IRAs, which I've been uh, answering. Uh, one of the things I love about the Q&A and why we want you to put your questions in Q&A is because everybody can see the answers. Uh, and so um, somebody said, hey, uh, Aaron, if we, um, if we invest with Alpine, Infinity, how are we to handle roof leaks, plumbing issues, foundation issues, non-payment from tenants? Uh, one of the things, guys, is we don't just sell you a property. Uh, the same guy that sells the property is also the guy that does the management. And so uh, we've bought all these deals with, with my money, with my partner's money. We fix them up. We rent them out. Then we sell them to you. And then we manage them for you. And then, and then we'll continue to manage it until you're ready to sell it. And then we have a brokerage that'll sell it for you if that's what you want to do or we'll sell it to another investor. So you're working in this vertically integrated environment across multiple states. And so... Um, you know, we're going to talk about if you want to be more passive, how you can do that with syndications. If you want to be more active, uh, how you can do that with a single family home. Um, but we let you kind of pick uh, among this menu of products. And we've been doing this. We did the first uh, training out in Indianapolis at my offices back in in uh, 2009. So we've been we've been selling properties to investors for 16 years. It's it ain't our first rodeo. But yeah, if, if, you're, if you're browsing. Look at the answered questions because uh, while Toby was was teaching, I was answering questions and Toby will hop on and start answering questions as well uh, going forward. Or Toby, feel free to interrupt and, and hit me up with anything that that that's relevant that, that we should answer on the fly. Yeah, I'm, I, I just know that you always do a great job of laying it out so that uh, I saw one gal's comments. Uh, don't know if you're allowed to say gal anymore, but somebody's comments where she said, hey, my my property values are really high compared to the, some of the rents that I'm seeing here. Sometimes that's what it is. Like we see folks, especially in California, and you might be sitting on two or three properties that if you 1031 exchange them and you don't have to pay any tax on it, you move them into five or six Midwest properties yeah. or, you know, you pick your jurisdiction right now. There's, there's Idaho falls, there's Kansas city, Missouri, there's, uh, Winston Salem, there's Charlotte. What, what's right next to Charlotte? Where they? I know they. I, I forget the name of the. Oh yeah, they've been in. Um, um, oh, what's the name of that town? Hold on. I have it right here. It's called. Uh... That's not Raleigh. Somebody said Raleigh. No, no, it's um, Shelby. Shelby. Yep. The car. Yeah, so it's it's the part car. of. It's part of Charlotte Metro, but we've moved. We've moved. Charlotte's been so crazy. We've moved out into the metro surrounding counties. And yep. have done really well. Uh, Shelby's interesting. They have an Indian casino that's built, a lot of manufacturing. It's a great little community near the airport. Yep. And somebody says, ever have a situation where expenses exceed the profit? How secure is this? Only you know, when when they get a mortgage. Yep. These are cash flow property. You're buying them. It's the whole idea is to have continuous cash flow. The only time you're in in in, in trouble is if it's sitting vacant. But these are great communities that have strong need for properties. So, you know, there is the law of averages. You need to have a, a few properties before it starts leveling itself out because you could have one property and you lose a tenant or the tenant does something dumb and you're annoyed for, for three months. Right. right. And you're like, hey, where'd my money go? But uh, overall, because we just look at we've had clients invest in quite literally hundreds, if not thousands of these properties, uh, probably thousands yeah, well over a thousand. Now that I think about it, um, the law of averages works itself out. These are low. These are low vacancy rates. Um, these are properties that tend to stay full. They're not 
ridiculously expensive. Like if you're in California and do a property turn, you're looking at six, 7,000 bucks to fix up a property for the next 10. You're not looking at that when you're let's, dealing with- Let's just jump in and show you some deals. Uh, Cause Toby, Toby mentioned this earlier. Let me, before we get into, I want to break down, you know, kind of what's happening across the country in real estate. But look, this is a deal that we sold an Infinity client uh, six years ago for $66,300, 51 North Keeling in Indianapolis. At the time, it was rented for $725. Uh, here's the Zillow listing from today. Uh, value of that property is north of north of uh, $120,000. It's estimate, you know, that, that, that can be, you know, accurate, not accurate, but Gosh, if you own this and it was just worth 100000 which is the range, or up to 155000 based on condition, that's the range of value right now. Um, originally, it was rented for seven twenty five. dollars You can see the rentals estimate is thirteen fifty. dollars uh, We currently have it for about 1100 a month. This is the, this is the concept behind, behind K. Toby and I each have hundreds of deals that are like this, where we are, it's almost embarrassing how little we paid for them. But when you hold something 5, 10, 15 years like we've both done, you really see the benefits over time and it, it compounds uh, dramatically. And, uh, and, and can I just say one thing? Yeah. People always talk about, oh, it's the cap rate, it's the cap rate of this property. Understand that when you go in and buy a property, that's one rate. This property, you still bought it for 66000 Mm-hmm. It's now generating eleven hundred dollars a month in rent. Yeah, right. It so, so say what you will. That's a huge return. At some point, that's going to be making two thousand dollars a month in rent, and you still only paid sixty six thousand dollars for it. So sometimes we look at the here. We're looking at it just the 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 the, the here and now, and they forget. It's like, I'll use the stock market as an example. Warren Buffett bought Coca-Cola in the 80s, right? It's one of his great investments. That thing, Coca-Cola has been increasing its dividend payout to its shareholders for 56 straight years. Yeah. That means that's, that, that's the equivalent of rents being raised 56 years in a row. Yep. It's really tough to screw up when you buy these things right because the percentage keeps getting bigger and bigger of your initial investments. Like we have properties that we paid... Uh, I'll use 30,000 for because we that's about what we paid on one of these properties here in Vegas. And it, let's make it $1,300 a month. Mm -hmm. It's almost like weird. Like every two years, it's pretty much paying for itself now. And yeah, it's I, just going to continue to get bigger. I remember after the last crash, uh, we were buying homes in 2009 in Las Vegas that had sold uh, prior to the crash, prior to 2008, new construction for like, uh, 350. We were buying those for for 90,000, 80,000 over in Summerlin. What are those worth now, Toby? Oh shoot! If you were in Summerlin, yeah, you, yeah. Well, I mean, you, good luck. Yeah, a 2,000 yeah. square foot, 2,400 square foot in Summerlin is right around 800. Um, those, depending on where you, if you were like around Lone Mountain, you're probably uh, probably 450. The ones even we bought, uh, which weren't in Summerlin, but uh, were on the way have tripled, quadrupled in value. But uh, it's not just here, it's everywhere. Like it's everywhere. Uh, we bought in Houston too. You know, you bought a lot in, in Texas, Houston, Oklahoma City. Those properties are all double, triple. Um, it just It's just getting in and buying in good cities that aren't declining populations that uh, are contained, like they have great workforces. There's just earmarks and Aaron will go over everything of what they're looking for. But you're going very specifically because here's the attributes of this area. And it's, uh, and, and it's it, when you get there, best time to buy was five years ago. The next best time is right now. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, here's another deal uh, that we sold uh, 2018, 2017. Uh, this was rare because five bedroom, two bath home. Somebody asked about vacancy earlier. We tried to target um, a vacancy rate of eight, seven or 8%. If you go too low, it means the rents are probably too low. You know, uh, if I were to price this house for $100 a month right now, my vacancy would be zero, right? The tenant would stay forever. If I tried to get, you know, cur currently it's $1,200 a month. If I tried to get $2,500 a month, the the vacancy would be uh, 100%. And so some somewhere in there, you set the rent as a, as a property manager, as, a, as an investor for the property. And we try to target uh, a rent of 8% vacancy. 
five bedroom homes just never go vacant. That's one thing that I've that I've seen. They just uh, we see extraordinarily long tenancy periods. Uh, this we sold for seventy three thousand uh, dollars. Uh, his estimate ranges one hundred and ten up to one hundred and eighty. The other thing I want to point out is somebody said, what kind of neighborhoods are these properties in? Guys, we're selling properties in blue collar neighborhoods. What's funny is this was a very blue collar neighborhood in 2016. Now it's like gentrified and trendy. And so we're even seeing new construction homes in this in this uh, east side of Indianapolis that um, that they're selling for three, four, five hundred thousand. And so uh, one of the things that I always also advise investors is you want to buy your rentals in in blue collar or or upwardly trending low income neighborhoods and then ride those through a progression if there's a compelling reason for change you know if there's a a public private partnership if there's some initiative if there's manufacturing if there's tech you know all of those things will drive the value of a neighborhood and make it you know be really great over time uh, here's one in Charlotte. Uh, this is the one Toby and I were talking about earlier. We sold this in Charlotte proper for ninety nine thousand dollars. It was rented for eight fifty. What's funny is six or seven years ago, guys, you would have said to me, "Well, I want a sixty thousand dollars house." You know, you know that's not sexy. Uh, you know, eight. That's you know, people say to me that's not one percent rule. You know, I I, I only I want to get ninety nine nine ninety a month for a ninety nine thousand dollars investment, and we're not getting that. But then look at what writing that out has turned into north of two, a quarter million dollars. Uh, rent's gone from 850 to over 1500 a month. And so that's the thing is we've been in this game a very long time and you're benefiting from our years of experience and, and the knowledge that we have. Uh, we've been selling Kansas City properties for a very long time. Uh, here's one we sold, 68,000. Hopefully you're seeing the trend. Now it's worth over 130, a thousand a month rent. Um, and then, you know, what are we selling? What are we selling now? Uh, people always say to me, Aaron, is there equity in these deals? This is one that we just sold a year ago for one hundred and twenty four thousand. Um, we're selling them for about 90 cents on the dollar. OK, there's there's homes in that area that are worth one eighty. We're not selling you a flip, but we're not stripping all the equity out either. We're really selling a stream of income. You know, the person who bought this property from us last year paid 124,000 uh rented for 875 a month this would be 6% like Toby talked about but a very predictable number you know a very predictable number here's an here's a current example of a um of what we're selling in in Charlotte and Shelby uh you can see we really go through and completely redo these properties uh this is 146,000 rented for 1000 a month um definitely there's been a learning curve uh, on the construction side of things. Uh, here's a ca current Kansas City deal. This one is a 7% deal, 120, 900 a month, um, completely redone, okay? And so- um, hey, hey, can I just point out, this is new roof, new HVAC, new, pretty much new everything. Everything, yep. yeah. So this is uh, what ends up happening for those of you guys who are real estate investors and you're always looking at your CapEx, on uh, on on these types of properties, you're just you're just not having to deal with that for the first few years. And if you had a problem, you're dealing with Aaron. You, you have a great box, by the way, on your slide on the far left. It looks like there's some. Oh yeah, that's my annotation bar. Yeah, showing up as a great box. I just I know that's the one thing I haven't figured out how to make that go away. But I did check my slides; it doesn't cover anything. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I just like you know. <laughs> that's the yeah, one. Yeah, as one as one uh, techno guy to another, like I know I've I've done whole events, and they're like, uh, "You weren't sharing your screen, Toby." Uh, I've done that. Yeah, that's. <laughs> and, and now I have learned because I have some videos. I want you to hear from some of our clients. Uh, I did. I have learned to click on the share with uh, audio. <laughs> I'll get out of your hair. Okay, so so zooming back up to the national people are you know I, I want to really kind of break down for you guys some of the things that we've taught that I mentioned currently. What is happening across the country uh, in real estate? Toby mentioned this uh, six point five million homes. To understand that number, you have to go back to before the last crash. In fact, you can go all the way back to nineteen eighty. If you go back to nineteen eighty, we need to produce one point seven million new housing units in the United States every year. We need those new units because we have population growth and we have immigration. 
And, and, and then we also have homes that become functionally obsolete. And what, what I mean is we, we tear down five bedroom, one bath homes. We have homes that, that wear out and, so, and deplete. So there's the, going back to 1980, and, and this, is, this isn't my number, this is from Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies. Uh, happy to share with any of you the, the primary source for, for this data. Um, but all, this is pretty common knowledge. And so every year we got to build 1.7 million. But then if you look going back to 1980, You'll see like in, in the early 90s, uh, we, uh, we, we built way more property than we had demand for. And so we had a surplus. And then, at, you know, uh, the run up to the last crash in 2008, we had overbuilt the U.S. market by about 4 million homes, conservative estimates. That Those of you that were uh, young enough at the time, remember subprime mortgages, liar loans, those loans, were, easy money wasn't just available to homeowners, many of whom, how many of you... Give me a thumbs up emoji if you know if you knew somebody that had no business qualifying for a mortgage prior to 2008, prior to the last crash, right? We all knew somebody who you're like, how did you get a loan? Like, how, how did you buy a house? And 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 also uh, that, that that was a time period where people um, also got taken advantage of by predatory subprime loan products that were out there, where the, the interest rate went up every month. Um, and so builders also had a bunch of free money prior to 2008. And so we saw uh, builders across uh, across the country just building because as long as there was a buyer with a mortgage, they didn't care. And so when the, one of the you know, part of the, the reason the market crashed was because real estate crashed, real estate crashed because uh, Wall Street had had created a bunch of financial products that, that mortgage backed securities that were based on mortgages. And everyone had guessed wrong at the default rate. And there was this wave of foreclosures coming and it literally almost crashed our economy. Uh, and, and, and so what happened in 2009, 2010, 2011 is the, the, the housing activity that took place was to sell off that surplus inventory, okay? And so then we can see prior to about 2011, that was the true bottom of the market. Since 2011, we, we've been at equilibrium with, with housing. And so from 2011 to 2024, 13 years, we've never built enough homes. We've never built, we've built 700,000, we've built 800,000, we haven't built 1.7 million. In fact, as a nerd, I'm always checking statistics and uh, I've never seen US housing starts reach 1.7 million. It almost did two years ago. And guess what happened? Interest rates. And with interest rates, all of these big national builders pulled back. They said, uh, we're not, uh, they, 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 not going to build. Sorry. Um, you know, people don't have 3% interest. They have 6%. They can't afford our $600,000 starter homes. And so that got us to the $6 million. Now, why is that so significant? Well, if you understand that we're short $6 million homes, and most of those homes are in affordable housing, do you see why? there's never been a better time to be a landlord. Now look at our older boomers. Okay, look at our 65 year olds. This is a disturbing statistic that I'm gonna share with you. In 2014, one in five, 19% uh, of our 65 year olds, our boomers, our baby boomers, one in five had only social security to live off of. Okay, that's 2014, so 10 years ago. In 2020, right before the crap, right before COVID, that number had spiked to, to 30%, 19 to 30%. So now we were at one in three, not one in five. And I just checked that statistic again uh, two weeks ago. We're now at 37%. 37% of our 65-year-olds only have Social Security. They only have 11, 1200 bucks a month to live off of. If that is not a significant statistic, then I don't know what it is because that means 37% of our boomers are having to sell that family house to uh, to retire. They have to keep a mortgage or they're having to look at options like 55 and older mobile home parks and manufactured home retirement communities because they're on a fixed income and they just don't have that, that money. That's significant. Now, when you look at the average amount in retirement accounts, it's still disturbing. It's less than $200,000 for our 65 year olds. In fact, give me a thumbs up emoji if you personally know someone that's confronting that financial reality for their retirement. 
They got Social Security, Medicare, maybe a hundred thousand bucks in a retirement account, and they're going to be relying on their kids. And 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 what we have, guys, is we have a retirement system that's broken and it's not serving Americans. And so those of you that have a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, if you can afford to be a landlord, you need to be a landlord. It's it's not changing. Our older folks are not getting any wealthier. Now let's jump down to who should be buying homes right now. I'm a Gen Xer, so that was uh, 1965 to 1980. Okay, Gen Xers are doing okay. We we avoided some of the big crisis, and so we're 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 okay with our money. But the but the group that bought, follows us, those po those born between 19, uh, post 1980, those are our millennials. Our millennials should be in a household formation stage right now. They should be buying their homes and they're not. We've never seen millennials renting longer than they are right now. In fact, there's a, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal just a couple of weeks ago that talked about the rise of the permanent tenants where people say, you know what? I don't I don't want the debt. I don't want the I don't want to be locked down. I just uh, want someone to take care of things for me and I'm going to use my money for other things. And honestly, when you look at the United States compared to other first world nations, we have the lowest home ownership rate and it's falling. We peaked at, at about 67% uh, right before that last crash in 2008, and we've been in free fall. And so regardless of what your politics are, you have to understand that our millennials are, are the slowest group to buy homes. Our 65-year-olds our are broke. Both groups are staying as renters. And we're seeing that in the thousands of properties that we manage at Alpine, okay? So I want you to understand why it's never been a better time to be a landlord. And do you also see now why I'm so interested in manufactured homes and mobile homes? Because, uh, you know, I just built a, a brand new spec home. We call it stick built. I built a stick built home in, in Idaho. My cost for construction was $125 per foot. That was my cost as a general contractor. Now, that doesn't count the land. That doesn't count, uh, you know, permitting, et cetera. That was just my cost to build. But I can buy a manufacturing home for 60 bucks a foot. And uh, my time to build a stick built home, best case scenario, is nine months. The manufactured home in the factory is built on the assembly line in one week. Now, during COVID, at the height of COVID, I saw, you know, as a dealer, it was six months, nine months before I could get a home built. That's all contracted now. I can get a home built in 12 weeks now. And, and that's, that's worst case. Uh, I, I, if I do a big enough order, uh, then Fleetwood and Champion, who I have dealerships with, will build a home for me in six weeks. Now, I understand you're thinking manufactured home. It's a square box. It's not cute. Um, but it's brand new and it's built to housing and urban development standards. And it's a fantastic product. Okay. Now, uh, in addition to the housing market being in short supply, interest rates, you know, Toby had mentioned it. And we're in gridlock right now with housing. You have, uh, how many of you have a mortgage locked in at less than 4%? Give me a thumbs up emoji. Okay, there's a lot of you, right? And also give me a laugh emoji is there's no way you're gonna sell that house so that you can buy another house and get 6%. There you go. <laughs> okay, that's that's US housing right now. And so um, until that changes, until that changes, we're gonna stay in housing gridlock and we're also going to have no new builders coming online. Again, why we're doing so well with manufactured homes. Because it used to be that, that across the country, an affordable home was less than 200,000, less than 150,000. That's jumped to affordable. Starter is like under 300,000. And some of you live in areas where starter or affordable is under 500,000, okay? ADUs I'm gonna talk about, those are accessory dwelling units. Uh, we're seeing them in the West Coast. If you live in California, if you live in Washington or Denver, you need to understand what ADUs are because it literally is taking single family home neighborhoods and allowing you to put tiny homes in the backyard and either rent them out or Airbnb. Interestingly, we're also seeing them uh, in the Northeast, up in New England. A lot of those are, be are being used as mother-in-law. Those, those broke 65-year-olds who can't afford to live on their own 
uh, uh, their children are saying, all right, uh, let's, let's take care of grandma, but we don't want her sharing one of the bedrooms in the hallway, so we're going to put her out in the backyard in a tiny home. <laughs> close, but not too close. Uh, so ADUs are interesting because, you know, we, Toby and I have a mutual client from California named Frank, and he owned a house in, um, in, in uh, L.A. County, pretty near the beach. That was a family house. He could rent that house out for $2,500 a month. He was able to put three ADUs in the backyard and get $2,500 a month for each of those. So now we're talking about $10,000 a month from a property that he only has a $300,000 mortgage on. That's sexy, and those are really interesting numbers. Um, adjustable rate mortgages and remote work is is have been destroying many downtown uh, metro areas and commercial real estate values. And so a lot of commercial buildings had adjustable rate mortgages that they have to refinance out of. A lot of companies that were taking office space, especially in the tech, tech industry, uh, are now permanently pulling out. They're permanently at three days a week remote work. They don't need that much square footage. San Francisco real estate downtown has just been destroyed. You know, some of it is the policies that San Francisco had uh, politically. A lot of it is the fact that they were over, you know, over, over reliant on tech. And those same tech companies are not re-signing leases. I mean, an extreme example, I saw a building that was valued in 2018 for $400 million that sold for 60. And so one trend that, that I've been tracking that we've been thinking about really getting into is taking these office buildings in big downtown metro areas that you can steal and buy for really cheap and then converting them to, to residential. Now, there's obviously parking challenges. There's, there's uh, utility challenges with those. But I, I, I saw just recently in downtown Indianapolis, they did that with the old AT&T building, and they, they literally put the first four floors uh, as parking garages. Uh, we've also seen, how many of you have invested in a syndication? Uh, give me a thumbs up, Emoshi, if you've invested at some point in a 506B or a 506C, or you've invested in a limited partnership, okay? So quite a few of you, actually. Um, and then also give me a laugh emoji if your syndication had a mortgage. There's a few of you there. Uh, guys, I've seen some syndications fail right now because five years ago, they said, hey, we're going to buy all these apartment complexes in Alabama, for example, and we're going to get this bank loan, and it's really cheap money. It's 3%. It's adjustable rate. We'll just refi. Well, they can't refi now, and they aren't even distributing rents because they have to increase their cash reserves to just pay those mortgage off, and some of the worst syndications I've seen completely have defaulted. We don't include debt in our syndications that, that we offer, and that's one of the reasons why. We're, we always try to be in a very safe environment. So we're going to talk about those syndications. Um, floor closure protections are gone across the country. So are free rent money. And some of you say, you know, well, that's a good thing. We, we, we've given out too many handouts. Again, regardless of your politics, um, there's no free rent subsidies anymore for COVID. There's no uh, free mortgage payment money anymore. And, and so um, we've seen a spike in the foreclosures, not the rate of foreclosures, but in the, in the amount of inventory that's available at foreclosure auctions. So foreclosure auctions are good for us again right now. Uh, and rents have just gone up. You saw the numbers on those deals that I showed you earlier. Uh, it's crazy. I started Alpine Property Management in um, January 2005 in Indianapolis. Um, it's crazy because rents, average rents were, were 600 a month back then. And now it's, you know, it's, it's doubled. Here's an interesting recent article uh, that I just mentioned earlier called The Rise of the Forever Renters. And um, this is really interesting when you look at, oh, Toby's right. It was blocking my, let me move that over there. The gray bar, I'll try to put it at the top. Uh, Americans who would traditionally be homeowners have have become long-term renters. This was in the Wall Street Journal just a few weeks ago. Um, renters are changing savings patterns. Uh, Wall Street is owning single-family homes. In, but, you know, prior to 2012, Wall Street didn't own single-family homes. Wall Street invested in real estate through uh, commercial properties, commercial retail, commercial residential. It wasn't until 2012 that Wall Street started buying single-family homes, and now they own like 5% of the homes in America. And one of the things that I read recently is that there's a private equity fund that's building new construction neighborhoods rental only. 
zero plans to sell those 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 projects. Historically, homeownership rates have tended to increase with age. The median age of renters who are the heads of household is 41, up from 37 in 2000. Millennials have been taking longer. This is what I just mentioned to make this transition compared with previous generations. At age 34, 52.7% of millennial households owned a home compared with 57% of Gen Xers, that's my generation, and 59% of baby boomers at age 34. So it's taking longer and longer for household formation to take place. And we're also seeing a, a, a big group that are saying, uh, it's just not a priority for me anymore. Regardless of what you think about whether that's a good thing or not, uh, it's a thing. And as a landlord, I always turn that around and say, what's the opportunity financially? And, and, and that becomes the opportunity. Um, mobile home values. This was an article that just came out uh, December 12th. Mobile homes have become, and when they say, they say mobile manufacturer, it's the same difference. Mobile homes have become unexpected hot commodities in the U.S. real estate market, particularly in Wyoming, and that would include here in, in Idaho, we're just 75 miles from the border. Illinois, that would include Indiana and Missouri as well. Kentucky, Mississippi, where values have doubled. Guys, this is a crazy thing, but but um, in Idaho, for example, you, you, you talk about a trailer park, a brand new manufactured home, I can put a brand new manufactured home, a double wide, in a trailer park and sell for one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Okay, that uh, in in, in twenty seventeen, I was selling that home for ninety ninety five. Okay, we've seen the demand. I can put a brand new single wide in a park and sell for one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. And they have an FHA loan product. They don't own the lot. They pay lot rent every month. Uh, that's just the home on a non permanent foundation. That blows people's minds because they're like, "What what's happened? It's happened because." The price of single family homes have gone up so high that in Idaho, a starter home, uh, a new construction starter home is, is 400,000. So somebody's going, okay, I can't afford or I can't qualify for 400,000. I can buy a brand new 28 by 70, 80 foot manufacturing. I'm a four bedroom, two bath home. Uh, and at least I can own, right? Uh, and so we're seeing, you know, shifts. People who never would have rented a home in a trailer park are now being forced to consider it because it you know maybe you're a 55 and older you don't have a lot of money um, but it's crazy yeah evan said it's crazy it is crazy but you as an investor don't pass judgment on it just understand it and learn how to capitalize on it okay uh wyoming led the pack at 127 percent guys you know why wyoming has gone up so much because there's no labor there there's no workforce and so builders are like, forget it. I'm just going to put manufactured homes in because the, the manufactured, the manufacturer has done a good job at keeping their factory full, their assembly line full. I know one manufacturer, they, they did a, a housing community two blocks away and, and, and their whole labor force, uh, one of the perks of their job is rent. It's like a throwback to, we used to see that with like manufacturing in 1910 in the U.S. where they would, you know, build a, build a plant and then build a community to surround it. We're seeing that again. Okay, uh, Illinois follows with a 110% jump. Kentucky and Mississippi have surges as well. And, and what this highlights, the reason I sh wanted to show you guys these exact article is because um, there's so many things that, here's the, here's the deals that we showed earlier, so I'm gonna skip past these. There's so many things that are counterintuitive uh, about investing that I have learned in 24 years not to try to understand it as much as just try to take action. Okay, uh, give me a thumbs up emoji if that resonates with you personally. Don't try to understand it. Don't try to get your arms around all of it. Some people are like, that doesn't make sense. I wouldn't do that. People always say that. Well, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't live in a trailer park. Hey, if you were like 37% of our 65-year-olds our and all you have is Social Security, I guarantee you're thinking about a 55 and older community. That or live with your kids. Like, okay, that's that's the hard choices that people... Now, is it a travesty? Yes. Is it? Do we have some real problems in this country? Yes, and that's that's why we vote uh, because we get behind a politician who we think will actually affect change. But you have to th you have to understand there's your politics and your opinions that sit over here, and there's a place for those. And then you have to wear an investor hat, and that's what wealthy investors do. I personally don't have plans to live in a manufactured home. That's not a personal plan. 
but um, I wouldn't be opposed if my kid, you know, my son's a music major on a music scholarship. And we all know a broke musician. Nobody regrets majoring in music at the, at the family Christmas party when they're the star. They just regret it uh, when, when, when they have to live off of their talent. <laughs> and my son got a scholarship for music. He's at the University of Indianapolis. Love him to death. And he's talking about teaching. Now, hey, I taught respectable but but uh you know i could see a situation where my son is is forced to confront the reality that he can't afford a five hundred thousand dollar house in indianapolis and and maybe he goes full circle i it's not i don't i don't try to project my financial values onto my children but i say you know here's what i want for me here's what i want as an investor here's what my politics and thoughts are and sometimes you have to separate the two to really be a good investor and to to really be true to you know, what you're trying to accomplish with all of this. Now, I've put here what I think the three hottest active real estate strategies are. Uh, we've mentioned uh, mobile homes. Guys, there's huge opportunities, uh, I believe, in flipping mobile homes. Um, how many of you have a Facebook account that you don't use right now? Um, you need to check that out today. Go to Facebook Marketplace, bring up, do a search for manufactured and mobile homes. That Facebook has become the place to buy and sell manufactured and mobile homes. Now, I'm 50, so I remember the days when we had Penny Saver and Thrifty Nickel, and you put an ad in the paper or you listed it on MLS. Not anymore. Technology and Meta and Facebook have, have created... Uh, how many of you are in a group, a Facebook group in your hometown... It's like Facebook, Idaho Falls, Facebook, Indianapolis, where people buy and sell stuff. That plus Facebook marketplace is where we, we are seeing mobile homes. And I guarantee you that the only place this doesn't work is in Hawaii, but flipping mobile homes that you can find on Facebook in your local market, I guarantee you if you have 15,000 bucks, there's deals. We're buying them for one to 5,000, uh, fixing them up for five to 10,000, selling them for 25 to 30, 40,000. Who's paying cash for them? 55 and olders. Remember, you can't live in a 55 and older park if you're less than 55, but you can own a home in there that you buy, fix up, and flip. There's, there's not a deed restriction. It's a residency restriction. Okay, um, We love putting uh, manufactured homes on permanent foundations. Uh, lately, we've been converting. We've been buying RV parks and converting them from nightly and weekly rentals to monthly and 12-month leases. We've also been buying, in fact, I'm going to show this to you. We've also been buying um, tiny homes that we've been putting in the RV parks. Let me show you. I, I brought up some videos here while Toby was talking earlier. And let me go out of this presentation can you guys see my can you see my uh i can see your screen okay cool it says me... we are committed to providing low-cost real estate education there we go okay cool so i want to show you guys some um actual projects and deals here so let me just scroll up so this is the one bedroom tiny home so here are the first two units that we've been putting in uh, RV parks. Here's two uh, in our operation in Kansas City. Okay, it's 14, uh, no, 12 by 35 feet long. This is the outside view. And so imagine buying an RV park that people were dragging their RVs in, but putting this little baby in that fits in an RV spot that are smaller than trailer park spots. Here's the tour of the inside. You got a little kitchen, you have a living room up front, you have a bathroom, and then you have a bedroom in the back with a little closet. Now, I can buy these for $35,000. $35,000, one bedroom, one bath, tiny home, uh, and I can rent this out for six, seven hundred. Oh, th these, are, these actually have a second little bedroom and or office up in the front. So these little two bedroom ones are the 39,000 that I was referencing earlier. Okay. I don't think I've showed, I don't think I've showed you these, Toby. These are kind of cool, huh? Where do you get those? Um, these, 35 moved in, oops, set and strapped. These we sourced, uh, there's a, there's a company down in Texas. 
So we can get the one bedroom ones for 25. We get the two bedroom for 35. But here's a really cool one. This is the first uh, duplex one that I bought. I got to show you this. But you're a average car is going crazy. Um, but you normally get them from Clayton Homes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got this as part of our dealership. So this okay. is a single wide that's got a one bedroom apartment on each side. It's a single wide duplex. So it's only 14 foot wide. You have laundry in the middle there. And then you have a one bedroom kitchen on the left. You got a one bedroom kitchen on the right. And I'm getting a higher cap rate on these than if I had a three bedroom home. My aggregate rents exceed what I could rent the individual. I, I could rent a, a three bedroom single wide for about uh, 800 a month. I can get 500 a month for each of these one bedrooms. And I'm seeing axles underneath there. So that thing would be depreciable a huge amount of it would be depreciable in the first year. Yeah, talk about that for one sec, because a couple of people had asked about cost seg, Toby. Yeah, so when we write off real estate, a lot of times you, you've been told 27 and a half year for residential property, 39 years for non-residential. Uh, but you can take residential property and break it down into uh, personal property versus the structural real estate. Structural real estate's the ones that's the, got the the longer length of depreciation. Land, you never depreciate. So the land never gets depreciated. But the when you break it into short-term pieces, you're talking about like a pad in a real estate uh, or in a uh, manufactured home park. Better. Um, those pads there are depreciated at 15 years. And there's bonus depreciation, depending on the year that you actually put it into service, that could be as high as 100%. Right now, there's a uh, uh, there's always something going on with bonus, but I'm just going to assume it's going to be 100%. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's possible that we'd, we'd be at the declining amount of uh, 80% for 2023, 60% for 2024, 40% for 2025, except that the House Ways and Means said, you know, voted, I think it was 40 to three to, 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 to jump it. It's just a matter of time before it goes back to hundred percent means that anything that's 15 years, you could write off in one year, anything that's seven year property you can write off in one year, anything that's five year property you can write off in one year. What that does is it creates large tax incentives to be buying these properties. And when you're looking at a manufactured home, if it has its axles on it and stuff, it'll actually be considered personal property and you're writing the whole thing off pretty much. Uh, in that first year. The only thing you're not writing off is the land. Again, land improvement you write off. So if you put a pad on it, uh, any of the infrastructure you put in, you're writing off. The uh, unit itself, you're pretty much writing off. Uh, you get a, uh, uh, it, it, it's one of those little quirky tax things where there's just some strong incentives there. Whether you can use all of that loss depends on your situation. There, you know, we're going to go over this afternoon a little bit about real estate professional, and uh, and any, even if these are used for short term, we only have to meet that test. But you could actually unlock those and make them what's called non-passive loss to offset your other income sources, including your job. Like if you have a W two income. Um, by the way, doctors. I don't know how many of you guys are doctors or dentists or somebody who's making more than five hundred thousand dollars a year. A lot of those folks are buying a property in their first year, making it a short-term rental. It's not considered investment property. So if you do the cost seg, accelerate the depreciation, it's not passive. Uh, if you materially participate, it, you could actually unlock it and use it against your uh, other W-2 and even your 1099 income. Uh, so it could actually have a huge impact on your on your bottom line. But when we're looking at manufactured homes, there are some, you know, the only thing you really need to know is there some strong tax incentives for doing that? And then if I'm not mistaken, if you attach this property to a foundation, are you they're gonna appraise a stick built or is that? Uh, yeah. Is that yeah, in fact, let me show you, here's a little quick video of, um, I bought this property, let's see. This is in Idaho and um, these, uh, these are two, these are four bedroom, two bath, double wides now we put these on a permanent foundation and so think crawl space so think four foot crawl space board form or cinder block built and now we've created one parcel two addresses uh each of these we have a really cool scenario we have uh, tenants in them for 1900 a month 
and the and the and the tenants have an option to buy it from us for three hundred thousand, which is what I could sell it for in MLS right now. We actually ended up selling them to um, we had our, our Infinity clients buy them from us for two seventy five, and so their their cap rates six percent, but after uh, one year they can elect to allow that renter to stay in and become a home buyer. So that nineteen hundred a month we reverse engineer it. And now the landlord doesn't pay the property tax, the tenant does. The landlord doesn't pay the insurance, the tenant does. The landlord doesn't pay for the uh, maintenance, the tenant does. And so now the landlord's getting almost pure profit, 1900 a month, uh, and they're financing it. And, and that, that's something we've done a lot with these manufactured homes. And so one of the things that we, that we offer and sell our clients is the opportunity to to invest in this. And then, you know, how good do you feel? Number one, you have a brand new house, so your maintenance is going to be nothing. But number two, you're providing a path to home ownership. That's that's where it's really unique. Now, here is a drone shot that Kenny, who's on today, Kenny's like, hey, this is all my footage, dude. So um, this was a, 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 a partnership. How many of you would be interested in partnering with me uh, or, or, or with others and putting 25, 50, 75,000 into a project like this and being on the same LLC. Yeah, that's very common. So this was really interesting. It was, let me just kind of show you what we had here. Let me let Kenny zoom out so I can show you what we did. See how far out did he go here? Oh yeah, he got the whole thing. This is great. Okay. And then I can, oh, let me set this. See, Toby, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna flex this tech on you, dude. So, there was a, a there was like a vacant lot over here, okay. There was a commercial building, um, another commercial building. The Humane Society rents that from me, and then a little duplex. And then here was like thirteen little trashy trailers. So I went to the city and I said, "Hey, what would you guys? How would you guys feel about me doing a a tiny home community? I want to do three bedroom, two bath, single wides, high density. Okay, we'll do parking around the outside." Uh, I'll get rid of all those trashy homes, and then I'll buy the adjacent lot, and 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 we'll get a total of 38 homes in here, 38 brand new homes, and we will rent them out, um, 1,300 a month, which is how much Section 8 pays, uh, in in Idaho. So we'll we'll set it at that affordable house price point, and we'll and we'll rent them out as rentals. They said we love it, and so they gave us permission for high density development. They let us uh, combine the adjacent parcel into one parcel. Uh, we're actually getting ready, Toby, I just, uh, we're putting storage units uh, where the duplex is right here. We're gonna tear that down. Uh, those are getting delivered from China in a few weeks. Uh, we have we just signed a new lease with the Humane Society and kept them in place. Um, and then we took this commercial building that had been partially finished, we finished it. We did a laundromat and then three little apartments that we rent out as well. And then there's an apartment in the back of the Humane Society. Now, what we allowed, this we structured this as a syndication and all a syndication is, is an LLC with, um, you know, Toby, how does it work from a security standpoint? If three or four people wanna be members in an LLC and partner on something, SEC doesn't have a problem with it, but if 50 people wanna all be members in an LLC, it becomes a security. Yeah, it, it's friends and family and whether you're soliciting. So, you know, w w there are some exemptions for small partnerships. And if you know each other, then you're you're, you're, you're probably going to be okay. But if somebody's soliciting you to say, hey, come join this, then you're going to be what's called a reg D, uh, where you're, re you're not registering it as a security, but you're underneath an exclusion. So there's certain rules you follow. But it's a fancy way of saying a partnership of a bunch of people buying property together. So Kenny was out in October. Uh, that video, that drone footage was in October. This is just a few weeks ago. You can see all the homes are in. Uh, all the skirting is on the bottom where the where the cinder blocks were. Uh, we're leasing these up right now. Uh, and, and, and so this is a syndication that we started a couple of years ago. And now it's allowed uh, our, our um, partners in it to, they're gonna have a tough decision because the syndication, the amount that we raised, it was $6 million. We think we can get nine or 10 million on the market for this park if we were to sell it once it's leased up, or if they wanna just collect rents, they're gonna make 9%. So if you put 100,000 into this, you're gonna get 9,000 net a year is your percentage on this deal. So each investor is gonna to have to decide, do I, want, do, I want, do I want my money back? Do I want my 100,000 plus 40, 50, 60 grand? 
or do I want to stay in and, and own this as a rental? Now, uh, I own a percentage of this and my plan, I'd love to just keep it long term, but we'll see kind of kind of how, how, it, how it goes with the clients. We're going to actually list it on the market uh, to sell in just a few weeks when it fills up. Um, but again, this is one of the things that Infinity, you know, I never would have done offered a syndication like this if it wasn't for having Toby as a friend and having Anderson as a partner. You know, Toby referred me to the sophomore pl soft software platform that we use. So if you go to the your Infinity Investing dashboard, you can click on syndication. Okay, those of you that are that are 360 members, you have access to this right now. Today we're going to show you how to get access. You can click here uh, on the syndication portal. Uh, once you've set up an account and logged in, you can see our current syndication offering. You can see previous ones. Here's the one that we did that I just showed you the, the video of. Uh, we put everything in there from YouTube videos to all the spreadsheets that you need. Toby's the one who said, hey, you got to check out this syndication pro software. We love this thing. And so then all we had to do was hire our own syndication attorney and our bookkeeper uh, and the accounting piece. But now it's been a really great thing that we've been able to offer these syndications to our Infinity investors uh, through, the, through the Infinity portal. Uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight for you, those of you that are 360s, um, when you log in, there's Toby. Toby, you're looking dapper in that, in that blue and yellow suit there. I was actually wearing a, uh, a, a not a black shirt. Oh, there's black shirt again. So. <laughs> the other thing that, 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 you know, a lot of you have said, hey, how can I look at deals? For If you're a 360, and you're part of infinity right now in the infinity's inner circle the only place we list our homes for sale is right here in the infinity portal we do not list them on our alpine capital solutions facebook page we don't list them there we only list them in the inf we don't list them on the market they're all sitting right here and so if you would like to look at uh deals that we have available um and and you know, kind of just check out the inventory. It's all sitting right there for you. Uh, once a month, Toby and I hop on and we do a catch up on what we have available uh, for inventory. Deals are there and then our team can can get you information about anything that you're interested for. And so a couple of, couple of things that I wanted to show you on the Infinity page, both access to the syndications as well as access to our individual properties. It sits right there once you get uh, signed up. And those of you who are already members, that's there as well. Um, one other thing I want to show you, Tub, which is kind of cool. So this is a park that 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 we partnered on with Bowman here mm -hmm. in Idaho. And we just redid all the sewer and water lines. That's why it's all torn up. But we've put two brand new homes in there. And then we went and we gutted to the studs all of these other ugh, all of these little homes. Let me just go back here. So new windows, new roofs, new siding. So this is interesting, guys. Um, it was a little slummy trailer park when we bought it. And uh, people were living in subhuman conditions. Uh, we bought the homes from them. Uh, they moved out. And then we went and we gutted everything to the studs, rewired new windows. So, so these homes are 1970s, 1980s trailers. And people say to me, well, um, I, thought, I thought mobile homes don't appreciate. And I'm like, uh, wrong. Because now that I put new roofs, wiring, windows, doors, siding, kitchens, bathrooms in, I could yep. sell these cash for seventy-five thousand and then charge them five hundred a month lot rent, or I can rent them for fourteen hundred dollars a month each. And that's why we put brand new homes in as well. And so this is a really good park that Jed Bowman and I own, and we even went and, and we did all new all, all new uh, uh, plumbing, all new sewer lines. And, you know, some of this stuff is counterintuitive, isn't it, Tobe? Uh, some of it's counterintuitive, yeah. I'm just, but, but I, I was just going to say, I was, I was reading one of the uh, comments here, too, is they're, they're, they're stuck on that 9%. Um, it's 9%, <laughs> like, as an investor, is it a fund that produces 9% and then the, if the project sold, we get a percentage of the profit? No, it, he's just saying that it's 9% is what it's kicking out right now. It's going to yeah. keep going up. Yeah, yeah, that's where it starts at. So if you stay yeah. in it long term and you don't take a buyout, then the cap rate on it is nine. Uh, you'll yeah. you'll make nine. Your hundred thousand will pay you nine percent after tax, management, insurance, maintenance, vacancy, all expenses. In fact, let's hop back over to the the presentation. Mm -hmm. 
because what I want to do is break that down. Because I know some of you are like, someone said, hey, what's cap rate? You, you've mentioned it now. Uh, oh, what are you talking about? Okay. So let me let me break that down for you. Um, so yeah, these are the, these are the, uh, let me get this back here. So mobile manufactured home uh, is, is interesting. Short-term rentals, we all know what an Air, Airbnb is. Uh, we mentioned the pad splits. Um, I, I'll show you an example of those here. Executive rentals and traveling nurses we've done really well with uh, as well. Uh, and accessory dwelling units I mentioned uh, previously. Foreclosure auctions are good. Again, tax sales are good. Um, we do a lot of direct marketing. How many of you received a letter or a postcard uh, recently talking about, uh, will you sell me your property? Okay, the, those are good sources for, for opportunities. And we're seeing a lot of opportunities with commercial. Okay, so that's kind of the overview of what we think is hot right now. Let me erase that. Um, and then from a passive standpoint, um, we've already showed you the deals that we sell, individual properties, single family homes. We have uh, multifamily opportunities through our syndications. Uh, every once in a while, we'll offer an Airbnb or a pad split to someone. Um, and then we just talked about where the syndications sit and where they are. Usually those are a $50,000 minimum investment. Uh, the cap rate on those is seven to 10. Uh, those are unleveraged. And usually uh, within 24 to 48 months, um, you're, at, at that point, you have a liquidity opportunity. So those people that were invested in that project here in Idaho, that they, most of those investors invested a couple of years ago. So they, they, they haven't been able to access their money. Now they're going to have that opportunity uh, coming up. Um, we talked about at the beginning of the hour that I started as a high school teacher and coach. And uh, this was in 2000. How crazy that these these girls here uh, that in 2000 were 14 year olds are now um, 24, 38. <laughs> okay, uh, I started on this educational journey. I was a bartender at Outback Steakhouse. How many of you've read the book Rich Dad Poor Dad? Give me a heart emoji if that book made you really think about passive income in a way that you never had before. Yeah, and then give me a laugh emoji if you re if you re if you remember the no money down Carlton Sheets program that I first started with. Who remembers those infomercials? Okay. And in 2000, this was my first investment property. It was a duplex. My wife and I moved into the front house. We rented out the back house for 750 bucks a month. The back house paid our mortgage payment. Uh, I sold that house in my first year of teaching and I made 50,000 bucks. And for a high school teacher, Aaron Adams, $50,000 just changed my whole world. Uh, I grew up uh, in Las Vegas. My dad was a casino executive, uh, kindergarten through seventh grade in Vegas. Um, uh, what is now the east side of town, not as, as nice as it was back then. Uh, I was the oldest of seven. Uh, my wife and I have six. Uh, I have two and then she has a four. We have two Frenchies uh, and uh, a Morky and a Chihuahua. We took all the kids uh, on a cruise this summer in the in the Mediterranean, and that's us at the Vatican. Uh, and so I'm a big family guy. Uh, family's important to me. And my dad always said, uh, "Have as that's me at 17. I'm the oldest of seven. My dad said you should have as many kids as you can afford because family's a beautiful thing. Uh, here's the current state of our Alpine property managements. Uh, what we have, we're buying and selling over 50 properties a month. Uh, that's uh, 100 million a year in, in aggregate gross revenue. Uh, I have a personal unleveraged portfolio uh, worth over $50 million. Seven management companies, seven construction companies, seven brokerages. I'm not a seminar speaker, I'm a teacher. So apologies if I, if I, if I talk too loud or I talk too fast because uh, you know I'm a teacher and a coach. That's always been my superpower. Um, this is a very common thing that we see. You know, every month we we for years we've held uh, a live event at our operation, and uh, we meet usually three types of investors uh, at the event. And I wanted to just kind of break down what we see and and kind of what our advice is. So we get people. How many of you are in a situation where you only have less than fifty grand to invest with? You got twenty five, fifteen, and you're just trying to figure out how to grow that. Give me a thumbs up emoji if that's your situation. Okay. And so uh, I want to map out, you know, how we think for you. 
because you need to focus on active strategies like I just laid out for you. You need to go flip a mobile home. You need to buy a short-term rental. Uh, you need to go to the tax sale. You need active strategies. How many of you with retirement accounts and savings, you got a couple hundred grand, okay? Maybe you have two, 300,000 in a retirement account. Maybe you got 50 to 100 to 200,000 in cash, okay? We meet that investor every month and, and, and they say, you know, what should we do? And then every month I'll meet a handful of investors. They got a million bucks. Maybe you have a business that you're selling. Somebody mentioned here earlier, hey, I got a business that I'm selling. Um, how can I do a 1031 exchange from the building? Uh, we, I, we met a client who had a San Francisco house that they sold for a million bucks and they uh, could rent it for only 5,000 a month. We were able to turn that into over 10,000 a month in rental income. Okay, so we get clients who are in all three of those situations. And they always say, Aaron, how much of my time should be active? How much should be passive? Uh, what are my goals? And one of the things, one of the reasons we do a three-day training, and we're going to give all of you the chance to attend that training. We do it every month. We don't do it at some hotel ballroom. This year, we have um, eight Indianapolis trainings at my offices in Indianapolis. We have four here in Idaho at my offices. And the reason we do that is because we have uh, the, the, the team from Anderson is there. So you can sit down and get your tax and legal mapped out. The team from IRA Club is there. A lot of you have been asking about self-directed. Uh, you, you can get that set up. And then my, my property team. So you can sit down with my team one-on-one, -on -one, plus all of my partners. So all the partners from all the Alpines show up. Uh, and and it gives we, we do a cocktail party on Friday night. We do a cocktail party on Saturday night. And we give you a chance to um, map out personally what you're trying to do. And then I spend the whole day, the, the whole day teaching Friday, uh, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, and, and so th these are the common kind of mindsets that we get coming in. Now, before I show you exactly how we kind of break down for them, I do want to break down 1% rule and, and cap rate. So cap rate is just saying, um, if, I, if I invest 100000 and I don't get a loan, after 12 months, how much should I have net? So, so when we said that the cap rate for that syndication is nine, then what we're saying is if you put 100,000 in that syndication, then after 12 months and after paying management, taxes, insurance, maintenance, vacancy, you should still have $9,000 net sitting in, in your investor account or sitting in your retirement account if you invested in that syndication using IRA or 401k money, okay? And, and so all you're doing with a cap rate is saying, if you say it's a nine cap syndication on that trailer park, what you're saying is for, for $100,000 or for $200,000 or for half a million, I'll net 9% after paying for management, maintenance, taxes, and insurance. Okay, that's what cap rate works. And so when we say that our, our rental properties uh, in Indianapolis are six cap, Somebody said earlier, well, what happens if your expenses exceed your income? That could happen if you have an eviction. You know, Indianapolis, we have over 2,000 properties under management. We usually only average uh, less than five evictions per month. But if, if you have an eviction, your cash flow, it can annihilate it for the whole year, right? You, um, you have uh, cleanup costs. Maybe, the, maybe you have to do a lockout. Maybe you have to go pay legal fees. So easily two, three, four, or five thousand dollars that could be your whole cash flow could get eaten up by one eviction. Um, and, and so um, if you have a mortgage, though, that's where we see it become catastrophic, right? If you have a mortgage plus you have an eviction, it's usually why Toby and I mentioned earlier, we usually encourage people to make enough money so that you don't have to get a mortgage on these properties. If you do get a mortgage, get it on a flip because then it'll make you money. And that was one thing that, that was interesting to me 20, 24 years ago when I got started. I read Rich Dad Poor Dad and I thought, I need rentals, I need passive, I need passive, I need passive. And I didn't, didn't even think about the fact that I needed to learn to make more active income. Uh, I bought an apartment complex year two as a high school teacher for 700000 and flipped it in year three for $1.3 million. So I made $600,000 for one deal. That's when I was like, okay, I loved coaching. I love high school, but uh, I, need, I, need to, I need to think about something different because this real estate thing is legit. And 40 grand a year at the high school was not getting it done for me personally. 
But think how many free and clear rentals I could buy with six hundred thousand dollars. I I went out and I said to my wife, okay, we're gonna take four hundred and we're gonna buy uh, six free because you could buy a, a house in Hemet, California, then for eighty grand. We're gonna buy six free and clear rentals that each will kick out eight hundred bucks a month, and then we'll take the other three hundred thousand and we'll use it to find and, and do more flips. So then we started taking the extra and buying rentals. And I know that's what Toby's done. He's taken his profits from, from his businesses and put them into buying more passive investments. That's, that's, the, that's the translation of what we're talking about here, okay? Now, we also talk about the 1% rule. And usually if, if you buy a property for 150,000 and it brings in 1,500 a month, then that would translate into a cap rate of about eight. Uh, some people say I only buy 1% rule. 1% rule can be difficult when you have double digit appreciation. So uh, USA Today just had, came out with an article last week. I put it on the Alpine Capital Solutions Facebook page. Uh, and it talked about how Charlotte and Indianapolis will be two of the highest appreciating cities, two of the top 10 appreciating, appreciating cities in America. And, and uh, it's very difficult to get a cap rate over seven if you also have double digit appreciation. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. Now, that's no big deal because if you make 6% from the rents and 10 plus percent appreciation from the growth in the asset, now you're making 16%. And so uh, Kansas City is is not appreciating. It's, it's averaging five to 8% appreciation. That's why you'll see 7% uh, and, and sometimes 8% deals out of that market. So here's kind of how we break down for our clients, uh, our two cents, our advice to them, what we think that they should consider, what, what, what we think they should do. Uh, if you are starting with $25,000, then we encourage you to really focus on active strategies. Pick an active strategy, focus on an active strategy. One of the best things about Infinity is the coaching element, okay? And so you're getting one-on-one -on -one and small group feedback for your specific scenario. And I know that, you know, a lot of you here have, have been fantastic about asking questions. And I know that if we were sitting down, you'd have a bunch of follow-up questions. That's why today, part of the offer Toby's going to break down here for you, is includes small group coaching and then live event coaching. How many of you, give me a heart emoji if you learn best when you can talk to someone in person or learn from them directly? Who, who needs that to learn the best? Exactly. And so we have built that for you. We offer that for you. The one thing we won't do today here is try to sell you property. That's not the goal. One thing we won't do is try to have you sign up for a syndication. Today is just a starting point for you to come to your due diligence, come to my actual offices, meet my partners, get on a Zoom. I, I'm doing a Zoom once a month with Infinity Investors, co a coaching Zoom. In fact, in just a couple of weeks, uh, and every few weeks we offer those, those uh, Zoom trainings. And I cover things like how to manage contractors, uh, how to balance your times as an entrepreneur, valuable things that I wish someone would have uh, you know, coached me on and taught me on uh, 24 years ago when I was sitting at my home office having just left the high school. Uh, if you have uh, 250,000, we give you a mix. So we'll have you maybe do a couple of deals with us um, and then we'll, 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 help, we'll, you know, we'll advise you on maybe doing a short-term rental. Uh, if you have a million, we'll, we'll have, we'll talk about properties and syndications. Uh, we also will talk about syndications for this investor, depending a syndication is the most passive. Okay. Uh, if you own, if you buy a, a single family home from me, you're going to have to approve the tax bill to get paid. You're going to have to take care of the insurance, a syndication that all happens for you. If there's an eviction, the management group handles that. They pay, they take care of the taxes. They take care of the insurance. And so a syndication, you have direct ownership. It's not a loan. You're, you're, you're a percentage owner in that LLC. Um, so it's, it's the structure isn't, isn't funky. Uh, it's just uh, with a syndication, it's very hands-off. Those partners handle that for you. Now, I want to um, dig in a little bit to the strategy, but I want you to meet one of my investors named Eric, and we talked about flipping mobile homes. And so I wanted to um, introduce you to Eric directly and let him in three minutes talk about his experience. Now, Eric uh, 
is uh, comes from a white collar background, worked at Chevron. He came to our live training several years ago, and I said, Eric, you should really consider flipping mobile homes. And he and his mom, he and his mom have now done over 25 flips in Utah. So I interviewed him recently. I wanted to share that with you. I worked for Exxon and Shell for 20 years. We lived abroad for 10 years. We lived in Southeast Asia and Europe. Um, at the end of that 20 year career, I, I decided to take a different route. And so I, we, um, we did some traveling and then we came home. And so I was, you know, comfortable with where I was, but I wanted, I, I wanted a way to earn some extra dollars so that we could continue to travel. That was what was very interesting about investing in mobile homes was because it was something I could do part time. It was something that didn't have to be a full time thing. And it was something I could get in and out of. I mean, that's one of the nicest things is you get into a deal, you're there for two months and then you're out and you've made the money and you're not committed to doing the next one unless you're looking for the next one, right? So that's what was appealing to us. Anyway, so we started looking at mobile homes. We finally found one and we paid 12,500 bucks for it. We probably put in 10,000 and then, so we were in it for 22 and then we sold it for over 40. So that was our first, that was our first deal. Um, and, and we thought, oh, well, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That works. that works. What would your advice be? So one one piece of advice, well, and that this is kind of for anyone wanting to start something new. I mean, we we came home and we didn't just we didn't just look around and think about it. We actually did it. I mean, we we got in the car yep. and we started driving mobile home parks. Yep. And it was crazy because we realized there were mobile home parks in the city that we had driven by for 10 years, never even knew that it was there. We would drive the home and look for for sale signs because a lot of people don't even put it on KSL. They're just selling it by owner and they put a yeah. sign up. And those are the ones that can be your best deal because they don't necessarily know how much it might be worth. So, I mean, first piece of advice is you just gotta, you just gotta get out and get in the car and go do it or sit yeah. down at the computer and look at the classifieds and start yeah. your spreadsheet and take down the numbers, right? Um, and then and then make yeah don't be afraid to go talk to someone and try to and try to negotiate yep love that you, you just got to do it it's never you're never going to negotiate a deal unless you actually negotiate a deal yep so. eric i, I don't want to take too much of your time but i really appreciate uh you spending okay so um interesting right there's there's three ways that you can make money actively uh in mobile homes uh you can flip traditional mobile homes. Uh, you can buy a park like I showed in the video uh, where we bought the park, kept the homes, and now we're renting out the homes and the lots. Okay. We've even put two brand new homes in that park. And then I also showed you a video where we did, we've done a, a complete development and, and we did all, they call them uh, horizontals. So all of your water lines and power lines and internet lines, and then your verticals, which are the homes that we, the development that we've done. And each one of these strategies uh, has a corresponding amount of capital that you need, okay? Um, let me... Run. So I mentioned storage units, and uh, this is a company, it's called Boxwell. Uh, the, I'll, let me write the URL on the screen here. It's Boxwell. .co. Okay, boxwell.co is the website. Now, each one of these is a 10 by 20 foot, 5,000 pound metal box. Boxwell.co. 10 by 20. Now, these are manufactured in China. They ship them over. I can get the whole box for 7K. That's including shipping and for the box. Now, I can decide to do one unit or I can do two units like you see there, um, or I can divide it up into three units. So, so you choose the configuration that you want, or you can even do four units. So we just, uh, we just bought a bunch of them with the, with the uh, we're gonna do student housing, we bought the four units. They're all 10 by 20 feet 
Um, and then you just got to decide if you want one, two, three, or four units. But we're, we have uh, our, our dealership in Pocatello, Idaho, is right by Idaho State University. It's surrounded by student housing. And so we just applied to put in 200 of them in a development. And we're just doing the little four units. And we're going to try to rent those out for uh, between 25 to 50 bucks a month, depending on if they want summer only or if they want. Now, here's what's interesting. I'm getting a hundred bucks a month for these two units. Um, so each, so $200 a month for a $7,000 investment. Let's just do the cap rate on that. Okay. So if I bring in 200 a month times 12 months, that's $2,400. Now I don't have any insurance. I don't have any tax. I don't have any, I didn't have to do permitting because they're not on permanent foundations. I have no maintenance. I have no utilities. So I have no bills. Now these I actually put on an apartment building that I own. And so the apartments pay the, the property tax. Um, so from my standpoint, my cap rate, I have no expenses for these. I'm literally looking at, um, you know, a three to four year payback of all my original money. So you could flip it around and say, I'm making 30 cap. I'm making 30 cap. Uh, give me a laugh emoji. If that sounds like a fake number to you, <laughs> okay. like a hundred percent of your investment back. Right. And I now own several hundred of these. So a uh, hundred of these at 7,000 a piece is 700,000. But then if you're getting uh, a hundred, uh, uh, 200 at a hundred a month, now you're making, you know, 20,000 a month on your 700,000. Oops. My camera was freezing up a little bit there. So sometimes I find if I stop camera and then start it again. So I'm really intrigued by these. I've been doing a lot of different things. We've been t buying these storage units. I went to a trailer park owner and I said, hey, I noticed you don't have any storage for your trailer park. He said, true. I said, do you have a 10 by 20 uh, strip of land that I could put 10 of them in? He said, sure. And I said, great. How about I rent this 10 by 20 foot strip of land from you for 500 bucks a month? You're not making anything on it right now. And then it will create an amenity for your tenants in this trailer park and it'll create income for me. And he said, where are you buying these from? And I said, I can't remember. Right? <laughs> yes. He's like, this is a great idea. I'll go buy them. Uh, but uh, it was great because I said, I'll come in and develop storage units in that spot for you. And so now I'm, I'm renting, I'm doing a land lease. And then I was able to piggyback that. So if you have as little as 7,000 bucks, this is an active strategy that you as an investor can do. Uh, give me a heart emoji if you're super intrigued by this. Okay. Uh, next up, we have short-term rentals, ADU and pad split. Now, I know, Toby, how are we doing on time here? Because I, I know we have, uh, I want to be able to go over some of this in detail and answer questions after the break. I know we have lunch coming up. Uh, and I know we're getting a lot of questions, a lot of interest. Everybody's sticking on the recording um, how are we doing on time? And, and I know I'm going a little bit long, but I don't want to, um, I'm here. I don't want to, uh, to take the, the educational opportunity away. No, no, no. Give them the educational opportunity. Don't worry. Um, I, I would say we probably want to uh, give them a special in, uh, probably 20 minutes. Um, and are you guys okay if we skip a break? Do you guys want to just go through, give me a thumbs up if you just want to keep going through, or if you guys need a break, you can put it in chat and say, oh boy, I need a break. We'll see how many people say they need a break. Most people are just skip it. All right, we'll just keep going through. Um, somebody says need to leave at 4 p.m. Don't worry, we're, we're, we're gonna hit time. Uh, we're, we're gonna be fine. We used to do these and stop at two and we'd always go way over. Yeah. So we put them at four so that we have the plenty of time to go through them everything and the tax stuff is always it really depends on how many questions you get i'm going to go over depreciation uh short-term rental the uh or he said uh, 4 p.m pacific or uh, eastern standard time larry we'll, we'll end up getting you some of the recording too but you'll be fine um we will definitely make our break at 4 p.m eastern time so like we will definitely take a nice long break probably a 30 minute break at that point uh, so, uh, go for it, buddy. About 20 okay. minutes. And, and yeah, I got I'll... about 15 minutes here and then, and then we'll get through it all. So, 
So um, AirDNA, if you have not seen AirDNA.co, I want you to check this out because a lot of people say, hey, I'm interested in doing a short-term rental. AirDNA lets you research that market directly. So it will tell you what the average daily rate is. It will let you bring up comparable inventory. Uh, you can see what the occupancy rate is. You can see what the revenue. It'll show you Airbnb or VRBO. Okay, It'll show you the types of rentals that there are. And so um, those of you that have thought, you know, I'm not really interested in doing trailers, maybe flipping, you know, doing developments. This is another great active strategy that I love. And not only is, uh, is an Airbnb or a VRBO really good, but uh, also just short-term rentals in general. So Toby called me about PadSplit. And if you go to PadSplit.com, uh, we'll, we'll throw that in chat. Uh, PadSplit is, like Toby mentioned, is renting out by the room. He had a property in Indianapolis that was just a two-bedroom house that we were renting for about 800 bucks a month, okay? Not close to anything, not close to the university, not close to just kind of just a regular, just city uh, uh, neighborhood, a blue collar neighborhood. Um, so we said, let's convert that to a pad split. So we, we eliminated the living room. We added two more bedrooms. It's a four bedroom, one bath house, guys. Four bedroom, one bath house. We're renting it for $175 per room per week. So Toby went from bringing in 800 a month gross to 3000 a month gross. Now he has higher management fees. He was paying 10% of the rents before. He's now paying 25% management fees. He wasn't paying the utilities before. He's paying the utilities now. But his net has gone from before he was netting about 600 a month, okay, to now he's netting about 2200 a month. And so his cap rate has almost quadrupled. Before it was like a seven cap. Now it's like a 30 cap. And so pad split is an interesting strategy, renting, uh, renting by the room. Short-term rentals is fantastic. I have another client that is renting short-term rentals uh, to long-term patients uh, getting cancer treatments at a hospital near their house. So they literally, uh, he was uh, worked at the hospital and he realized there was someone in the hospital that every time someone had 90-day cancer treatments, they uh, would say, hey, here's a list of hotels near the hospital you're going to have to kind of live here while you're getting treatments here for cancer. And so he went and bought a house near the hospital and fully furnished it as an Airbnb. And now he's, instead of them staying at the extended Marriott or the Hilton, they're staying at his house that has custom things that he's done for cancer patients and their families. And insurance is paying him. Insurance makes the payment. So instead of it just going to, you know, Marriott or, or Hilton, he's getting those payments. So um, I, there's a lot of interesting opportunities in short-term rentals, and I wanted to highlight some of those briefly for you. Again, at our, at our three-day events, we spent a lot of time going through these in more detail, uh, but I, I wanna put them on your radar today because I know some of you never thought about a mobile home. In fact, give me a laugh emoji if I've hit you with at least one idea or one strategy in the last hour that you're like, Mind blown. He's right. I got to learn more. Okay, good. That makes my teacher heart happy. <laughs> Coach Adams is very excited for you. Uh, I, 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 I can see the virtual light bulbs going off in your head. How many of you, how many of you have looked on Facebook Marketplace for a trailer while we've been on this webinar? <laughs> Busted. Okay, I know you've already checked it out. Uh, we talked about ADUs. I want to go through some of the briefly some of the st statistics with these. Um, there are almost two million ADUs in the U.S. That's a huge increase uh, in, in, uh, compared to 2019. Uh, if you're in California, Connecticut, Maine, New Hampshire, Oregon, Utah, Vermont, Texas, Colorado, Washington, you need to do more homework. Um, they brought they're broadly allowed and uh, go to your local city or your local county to get specific information. There's massive opportunities for ADUs. Here's an example of a, you know, a tiny home that, that they put in their backyard for, for, for their mom. Uh, California makes it the easiest to build, go figure. California, which is pretty business unfriendly, has a very low restrictions on them. Portland's also really easy, so is uh, Austin and so is Denver. Uh, in fact, ADUs are so hot in Seattle, they are literally outpacing single family home construction. Uh, there's still some financing issues. So for example, if, you, if it's your primary residence 
and you don't have $100,000 to develop an ADU in your backyard, they should have a mortgage product that you can add because you're going to start bringing in, you know, a thousand, two thousand a month. And so lenders are in the process of trying to figure out how do we do that? How do we give someone a loan on an ADU in their backyard? So that, that, that process is something that I've been tracking because as it gets streamlined, so will the opportunities. Um, the final thing I wanted to mention uh, before uh, we bring Toby back from an active standpoint, because we've talked about uh, passive investing with Alpine. We, I showed you where we list our deals. I showed you examples of deals. I showed you videos and examples of our syndication. So we kind of have already gone through the passive piece. But the final active strategy I want to break down are wholesaling, auctions, and tax sales. And some people say, well, what's wholesaling? Wholesaling allows you to get a deal under contract and then flip it to someone who wants to keep the deal. And so I buy a lot of property from wholesalers in Indianapolis, in Kansas City, in Charlotte. Wholesalers go out, they go to auctions, they send out letters, they find properties that are not yet listed, they get them under contract, and then they flip them to someone like me. And so you, as the wholesaler, can kind of insert yourself between the seller without having to buy the property. Because if you can get it under contract for 100K from the seller, and the buyer will pay 110K, then that difference becomes your profit. And so uh, I like wholesaling as a strategy. And it's, um, it's a good way if you are one of the people that have less than $25,000 and you're new to the game and you need to grow, make money, wholesaling is a strategy you definitely want to learn. Um, I also have been attending foreclosure and tax sales uh, for a long time. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, inventory is rising. And so if this is something that you, uh, you know, if you have less than 50,000 bucks or if you have less than 200,000 and you want an active strategy, learning to buy foreclosure auctions, learning to buy tax sales is a fantastic uh, way to get in the game. And um, one thing that I always say is, is once people learn how to buy a foreclosure property uh, or a tax lien, they never stop going to those auctions. It's just such an easy thing to do. You obviously have to learn how to protect yourself. You don't want to buy a second mortgage. You don't want to buy something with an IRS lien. You know, there's definitely some things you need to learn to navigate. When you get that tax deed, you know, are you trying to buy the, the tax penalty so that you get that return or do you want the property? So there's, there's a, whole, a whole group. And what's really cool is, again, in the Infinity Portal, uh, there's a whole section where we've done two to three hour trainings on these topics. And so if you are already uh, a 360 member and you're part of Infinity and you're watching this today, uh, you're going to want to go uh, to the Infinity portal. And, and, and let me just show you where that's located. And we'll bring Toby back on here. Uh, in, the, in the Infinity portal, right? Let me see here. So if you go to Infinity Courses, and you go to Real Estate Investing Course Catalog, I've recorded a, a series of two to three hour trainings on all of these active strategies. So you can see uh, we have um, marketing, which is part of wholesaling. Uh, tax liens, that's a three-hour training. Wholesaling 101, we cover property management, we cover mobile homes, we cover using your retirement account. So those of you that are part of Infinity already uh, and you haven't watched these classes, this is your starting point because this will help you decide what you want more information on. And that's why we put this together for you. Uh, each one's two to three hours. Each one is an overview of the topic. And the goal is if anything that you've heard about is interesting here for you today, then I would encourage you to go to this section of the uh, of the Infinity Portal and start watching some of these trainings. And, and, and Toby's going to break down how you can get access to these trainings, how you can get access to the properties that we have available, uh, how you can get access to the syndication investments that we have available. Um, Toby's going to break that down for you as well. So, Toby, that's all I have for, for the real estate piece. Um, and uh, we'll just uh, turn it back over to you, man. Uh, we wanted to do a little bit of Q&A, dive into a couple of things, uh, some questions that were asked. And uh, first off, I just want to really say thank you 
uh, for everybody that's sticking uh, sticking with us through the afternoon. And also thank you to David Maida, Ma uh, excuse me, David Maidux, uh, Rob, uh, Jen, Jane, Caitlin, Nika, Catherine, Kate, Matthew, everybody that's behind the scenes that's answering questions, um, doing a great job and uh, answered, uh, gosh, it looks like over 200 questions in writing, plus all the chat. So there's been a, there's been a lot going on. And I know you helped kicked into that too, Aaron. Yeah. I was having some fun with there too. Do um, you want to go through a couple of the questions? Yeah, really good question. Um, Eric said uh, 73 here too. So same age. Uh, what are the chances being a small fish? Uh, less than 100K to invest, say 50 to 60K in IRAs currently of picking up a property. Does the two IRA thing, uh, could it also be a solo 401K instead of an IRA or strictly an IRA? One, one thing to think about, um, if you have kids, uh, then IRA club is, uh, you know, my boys have had Roths since they were little. And, you you know, uh, we've paid them uh, and invested that money. I've partnered with their IRAs on deals. Uh, and then, or grandkids, I've seen them used as well. Um, also, you know, if you don't currently have a Roth and, and your spouse, we meet people that have 401ks or an IRAs, but they don't have a Roth yet. And this could be a perfect uh, chance to set up uh, those Roths. So usually I find that people don't have too many troubles deciding how to use those two free uh, IRAs. As far as the money that you have to invest, um, I would say love to have you at the summit. And uh, let's just talk about it there. I mean, I, I find that after three days of going back and forth between active and passive every day and kind of, and kind of talking about it, you may decide that you want to you want to invest that money into um, uh, a short term rental. You know, Toby, I've seen in some nicer trailer parks people doing manufactured homes as Airbnbs. Yeah. Um, and and the, in fact, there's a park here in Idaho that. It's full of Airbnbs of, of employees at the National Laboratory. And uh, the park owner themselves, they eliminated the, the manager's home and they use it as an Airbnb as well. And so, you know, when you start combining strategies, it becomes really interesting. My, my son had a tiny home that was on Airbnb. It wasn't doing that great. When he switched it over to a pad split, he's crushing it now. So uh, I, think, I think that at this point, Eric, you, you come to the event. We'll help you map out a game plan. We're not going to try to force you into a deal. Uh, if active makes more sense, but the value of the active, the value of the networking, you know, one thing I've seen a lot at those summits is people with money show up and people who need money show up and they, they meet each other at the cocktail parties and do deals and they leave. And, you know, maybe the person with money puts up money and partners as a, as a limited partner. And uh, there's some, some, that the other benefit is that Anderson can then help you structure those. And, and that's, that's where it all just comes together so well at those at those summits. Yeah, and then uh, just one thing to add, just because it's, you know, when you're looking at a couple of different IRAs, so let's say you have one and a spouse has one, and the question is, do you roll them into a 401k and just have one name on a title? Yeah, you can do that. Um, but I'm sure that either IRA Club or Anderson could help you, uh, either one of us, because uh, we have a sponsored plan where there's no custodians, uh, I think ARA club has one with a custodian. So you just have to decide which one fits better. Yep. Um, the other thing you do is if you do the 401k is you can always borrow half of it out. So if you're looking and saying, geez, I'd really like to do a deal, but I really want to use my, uh, retirement monies. You can, uh, on a 401k, you can borrow an IRA. You can't. So if you rolled it into a 401k, let's say you set up a solo 401k, you could borrow up to half the plan assets out. So if, if you each had 50 grand in your IRA, instead of having a hundred thousand dollar, Hey, this is my investment. You could have 50,000 and then you could go, you could either borrow or you could come up with the additional capital through all, you know, other means you're not stuck at that. Hey, I have to buy it. The other th last thing is you could actually partner with your own IRA if you really wanted to, <laughs> depending on how much money you have outside of it. There's no restriction on entering into a transaction. It's the continuing of doing business together. So you could do a one-time LLC, both fund it, and you could do it that way. There's there's usually two or three different ways to get it done. But like Aaron says, I'm just going to mirror what he says is get to the uh, summit, sit down with the attorney and uh, and our staff that are there, and uh, and they can get to know the situation, what you're trying to accomplish. 
and see if they can't get you the the best way from A to B. Yeah, uh, Gita said, are these income focused or growth focused syndications? Uh, we focus. I, I like both. Um, so, for example, the current syndication that we have is two apartment buildings and a mobile home park in the LLC. Um, the apartment buildings are completely fixed up already and stabilized. The mobile home park only has 10 of the 40 spaces occupied. And so the $5 million syndication, most of that money is to put 30 homes in the mobile home park as rentals. And so you're getting rents from the two apartment buildings from day one. And then the, the value of that LLC is increasing as the park fills and the rent grows. And so at the 24 month mark, Again, you'll have a very tough decision. Do I want 10 cap from the rents or do I want a $5 million syndication? You know, maybe we sell off the apartment buildings in the trailer park and the total amount is eight or 9 million bucks. So yeah, my goal is to make it a good deal always has a lot of good decisions to make. Do I keep it in, in bank rent? Do I sell it? And one thing a lot of our clients are doing is they're using that self-directed IRA to invest in the syndication because if you decide to take the profits after 24 months or if you take rents, you're not paying taxes on that. Mm -hmm. And so there's no capital gain and it's easy to roll into another syndication at that point. And, you know, Toby and I will always have something for you to, to, uh, to put money towards because we're always looking for new stuff. It's constant. I know we have a lot in the pipeline right now, but it's been a, it's been a fight the last year. There's just not a ton of stuff out there. Like sometimes it's just raining properties and opportunities and everybody's yeah. nuts. And and then sometimes it's like this where it's a little bit slow. Uh, doesn't mean there's not deals. It just means you got to work for them and it gets rid of the amateurs too. For sure. Uh, you said that you saved another one. Do you 1031 with triple net property uh, on you Alpines? I'm guessing does Alpine. I think they're yes. asking you to have triple net leases. Yeah, uh, we have we have a handful. I mean, we can kind of work backwards. One thing to keep in mind is I'm always buying property. And so uh, I personally own probably 15 or 20 triple net uh, assets. And so if that's something you're looking for. Uh, we can certainly have that conversation uh, and help you with that. The other thing is that help desk, I'm telling you, every Monday, Nicole and I review three, five, seven, ten deals. And there's we see some great stuff. And so that's another thing that you're going to want to be part of uh, to carve that time out or watch the recording every week, uh, because that's been like a weekly flow of projects. When an investor, an infinity investor finds those, they bring that to us. They e you, you'll you email it to me. You can send me a video of the construction work that's needed. I'll help you do a, a walking budget. It's like you're getting weekly mentorship with us. And and it's super informal. Um, and we like to tease Nicole about her... her uh, the variations on her makeup from week to week. <laughs> she's had a baby. You leave her alone. Sometimes she wears makeup, but sometimes she doesn't because she's been managing all Toby's property. So now, yeah, those of you in the, the, hopefully, it, it, we're not. I said she had a baby. I'm the baby. Yeah, yeah. Toby's the baby. No, we love Nicole. She's so fun to teach. She has a great sense of humor. She's a full blooded Italian Chicago girl and living in Winston Salem, which has got its own funny stories. But the idea being. It's like a weekly investor club with no rules. And when you have a question, we actually activate your voice. We let you ask it. It's like a call-in mm -hmm. radio show. And then yeah. we'll go through your project for you. Yep. We can't do it on these just because we get solicitors when they're when we have the free events that are behind a paywall. Yeah. Uh, and you get everybody from the insurance companies telling you, here's what you should buy. And a few Nigerian princes. <laughs> always throw in a Nigerian prince just for kicks. Yeah, hey, I really need money. And they start asking everybody, you know, like, you got to be kidding me. Really? Really? Yeah. You can't kick them out. They come back in. So, um, so Tob, I have a four minute video from the summit that we recorded a couple months ago. Uh, Corey uh, recorded it for us and it, it, to kind of show people our exact offices and people are like, well, I know you probably have a mental image for it, but if you're cool, then I'll share that real quick. Yeah, absolutely. You guys want to see a video of this summit and actually see it? Let's see. Let's see. You got you got like three. No, there we go. We got a bunch of people. How's All right, that? let's do that. We have a lot of tax to get through later, but don't worry. We got All time. Right. So this is this is from the actual uh, Indianapolis uh, summit. Hey, Aaron Adams, Alpine Capital Solutions. I'm here in Indianapolis today. I'm standing in front of two commercial buildings.
Oops, sorry. That I own. The building on the right, the 10 building, is the first commercial building I ever purchased for $100,000. Very nervous when I bought it because it was 15 years ago, and we had only been here in Indianapolis for a couple of years. I was worried about making the mortgage payment on it. I was worried about all the work that it would need, and it was an old building to begin with. There was a vacant lot next door. Clearly, I bought that as well. Bought that for $25,000, and we outgrew the tan building, and in 2018, we built the building on the left. When we built this office for our Alpine property management here in Indianapolis in 2018, we added a second floor classroom, and in that classroom every month is where we hold our monthly training. We've been inviting investors to join us at our monthly trainings going back to 2009. And I'm excited that you will now have the opportunity to join me at this monthly event. So you as an investor, just like uh, Willy Wonka did with the Chocolate Factory, you can come to Indianapolis, you can meet my partners from the other markets. It's not at some hotel ballroom, it's in our offices, it's in this location that we've been in for over 15 years. It's a very great way to vet us out and to see the whole operation. So when you come out to Indianapolis, we have a block of rooms reserved at the local Marriott. We shuttle you back and forth between the event. They, we bring the caterer in and you'll spend three days here. We're going to spend three days covering all of the education. You're going to learn how we invest actively in real estate. You're going to learn how we invest passively. My partners from Charlotte, Winston-Salem, Dallas, Idaho, Kansas City, all come into town and they bring deals. And so you'll be able to sit down with my team and look at properties. My attorney partners, my tax CPA partners, my retirement planning partners, they're all here. And we're gonna teach you how the entities that you need to create are structured. We're gonna show you how to own property just like this. Imagine owning a piece of commercial property in your IRA, in your 401k. My partners from Chicago from the IRA club will be here as well. And so what this gives you and why it's been so valuable for our company for so long is a three-day window to get everything that you've been trying to get squared away done. You'll get the education, you get the chance to get the properties, you'll be able to meet with our team one-on-one. -on -one. We literally set up an open bar in that second floor. We have cocktail parties Friday and Saturday night so you can meet with the attorneys, meet with the self-directed IRA folks, meet with my property people and, and move forward and make decisions. And so I wanted you to have a vision of this location so that when you come and when you make the decision to come out, it's already fresh in your mind. I look forward to meeting you here and also make sure that you get the information on our Southeast Idaho events because I'd love to have you join us for one of those as well. But we're having them every month. Get the dates, click on the link and join us. What do you think, Tub? Well done, and it lays it out. Yeah, it really is. How many of you guys have been through the uh, the summit that are on right now? So I think we've probably had quite a few. I, I saw some 360s uh, that were already in, a bunch of folks. And if you would, um, if you could, just in two or three lines, put in chat, and we'll just read them out, uh, what your experience was at the summit. This way, it's unfiltered. And uh, I'll give everybody a chance just to say a couple things. And don't worry, I won't read your name. I'll just uh, I'll just read whatever you write. When they start popping up, I'll just start reading them. And that way you guys get an idea of what they actually are. Uh, because it really is about building a team of people around you that you can trust and that are uh, trying to bring you the type of investment that fits the infinity uh, philosophy and helps you create a uh, perpetual cash flow. So if you guys could do that, that'd be great. In the meantime, um, Aaron does purchasing property happening happen during the three day or can it be on or, be, uh, or after? No, um, so Morali, if um, in a couple of weeks, uh, we have the next event, uh, obviously you have live stream access to that. But what's great is you're gonna do a one-on-one -on -one with uh, Becca. She appeared a couple of times in the video. Uh, from our team and she meets with every new infinity investor and her her whole goal is to kind of if you're ready to get going and you want to look at deals we'll let you look at deals if you if you logged into the infinity portal and said hey i got a questions about a couple but here's my situation we'll match you up that way so uh, we don't put a con conditions on you know we have clients that buy from us from hong kong and from singapore and japan and obviously they're not coming to the three days so we don't we don't force you to come we'd love for you to come because we feel like from a due diligence standpoint, from a we get to know you standpoint, you know, it's that, it's like that Midwestern hospitality mindset that we have. Uh, and, and we really do enjoy getting to know you guys and, and come live. But if you want to get going on some deals and then come to the event or come out to Idaho, that's great. That's great, too. 
um, we're totally cool with that. All right, here's a, uh, I'll just read this. Aaron is the real deal, a brilliant human out to help us all who have been trying to do this in the dark for decades. I'm proud to work with Aaron, Megan, and Becca, and their integrity is palpable. Bravo, guys. So that's really nice. That's really nice. I paid Thank to you. say that, but uh, it wasn't nearly enough. I'm just teasing you. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, somebody says, can you do this for a custodial IRA, which means they set up an IRA for somebody who was under 18. We've set up an IRA for our teenager who has a job starting her on this path early. I mean, technically, yes. And there I see Dennis. Uh, you might want to let Dennis talk. He's a uh, the head of IRA club and a, a, actually a very accomplished uh, securities uh, teacher. Like he actually wrote a bunch of the books that people take. Um, he's, he's, he's a very interesting <laughs> dude too. Like if you ever get a chance to have dinner with him, uh, uh, don't pass it up. Yeah, Dennis is funny, just to give you a little background. So he, it's reasons called out, people are like, why is it called IRA Club if they offer self-directed IRAs? It's because uh, Dennis was in publishing and like Toby mentioned, he wrote books for people getting a securities license. He wrote the textbook and he taught the class for the series seven and all the, all the different classes. And uh, he started a publishing company and was publishing his own books. In 1990, 97 or 98, he sold that publishing company to the Washington Post group for like $36 million and was sitting at home in, in Chicago. He lives in the Gold, uh, Gold Coast area, of downtown Chicago, and started a club for investors who were self-directing their IRAs. And after a while, he realized he's like, well, uh, obviously I could get I could get a trust account and structure myself like a bank and hire compliance. And and so they now have uh, over 8,000 accounts. Um, they're, they're, they, they've, I, don't know, I don't know if I told you, Toby, they passed the billion dollars in asset center management threshold this year. Nice. Um, and they they set up, they, they, they've always been on iraclub.org. They changed over to iraclub.com. They partnered with a group that will allow you to take the cash sitting in your self-directed IRA and, and put it in the market. That was something you never used to be able to do with them. And so they have an online portal now. So let's say you you have rents coming in, but you don't have enough to buy another deal and you want to put that money in an index fund, you can do that. If you want to put it in an individual stock, you can do that. If you want to just put it in Vanguard uh, or, you know, what, whatever, whatever, which I love that because people would say, you know, I got this, you guys are sending me the rents, but I don't have enough to buy another deal. And so, you know, it was kind of complicated. We had to transfer them out. So like an E-Trade account, it can all be done in-house right now. And so Dennis is one of my mentors. Uh, we've worked with him almost as long as we've known the folks at Anderson. And, um, they're, they're just, Dennis is just a fantastic guy. He's, he bought a lake house, Toby, and he's been uh, trying to stay away from the office. But man, when I'm, when I'm in my seventies, I want to be working as much as Dennis does. Cause he loves what he does. He loves his company, he loves his employees. He's a, he's a hero for sure. Uh, he's in Chicago, right? So is his lake yep. house like frozen? <laughs> he bought one, uh, actually bought one over in, um, in Michigan. But yeah, it's been frozen. It's even worse. That's even Gail, worse. All right. Gail I'm ditched kidding. him. She's like, I'm going, I'm going over to the lake house, and he's still split in time. But let me just have an intro from him. Have you ever considered investing in real estate with your IRA dollars? Or agricultural land with your IRA dollars, or mobile homes, or many, many other alternatives that are available to you. These accounts allow you to postpone income taxes on your earnings or even eliminate income tax on your earnings. But there's one catch. And the catch is, first, your IRA account has to be profitable. If you'd like more information on how you can do this with your IRA, join us for our upcoming online webinar. Now the webinar is free and the information for you could be priceless. Yeah, so IRA Club, uh, on their their website, they have a ton of really great free, because a lot of people just don't understand this, right? Uh, there's only three things you cannot do with your retirement dollars. You cannot, uh, you can't use it to pay for your insurance premiums, no infinite banking with your retirement dollars, no collectibles, so no 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 uh, Babe Ruth baseball cards, no fine wine, and no, uh, I, I think it's somewhat, it's like an S-Corp investment, isn't it, Toby? You can't do, there's something yeah. related yeah, Dennis was telling me, I can't remember that. It was some with an S Corp. Well, you can't, you can't be an owner of an S Corp. But, uh, but uh, there's, you know, there's UDFI and there's, there's lending that it can't do. But 
uh, it's really easy because it has a cousin called a 401k that you roll it into and then you get access to those things. So yeah, it's actually, it's actually, uh, they're there. I know that they're at the summit as well and that they're sharing a lot of that information. Uh, I think I half answered, can you do it with a custodial IRA? Absolutely. You can, it just has to be self-directed. So you'd use, uh, uh, a self-directed IRA, roll it over, into uh, roll the existing IRA into that so you can actually be the custodian of it. One one final person I want to introduce you to is the person, that, uh, Becca, who does, uh, Becca does the one-on-ones. So those of you that have signed up today, uh, I want you to meet the person who's going to be, um, who you're going to set up an appointment with and talk to. And uh, Becca has been with me for 15 years. I met her when her daughter was... Um, uh, in diapers, and her daughter is uh, at Mi at the University of Michigan now, uh, majoring in Arabic. Toby, oh jeez, yeah, she wants to do uh, uh, be a be a diplomat. So she's she's studying Arabic, right. but she she's she's a cool kid. So here's Becca. Here's who you're gonna have your one on ones with. Becca, thank you Hi. for taking a couple minutes. Of course, um, the folks that are going to be new to our organization will have a chance to connect with you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, how long have you been working with investors who are uh, new to real estate, new to investing? What's that What's that, that process been for you? Yes, I started with Alpine about 15 years ago. So you've met, uh, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, a typical week like you, uh, a typical week for you, how many one-on-one -on -one calls are you doing with investors? Uh, it varies, but um, probably about 30 a week. Okay. And in those consults, they're anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour? Correct. Yeah. It really depends on, on the client and what they need. You get people that are active, that are passive, that have money, that have a lot of money, that don't have money. What's what's your goal? Like, what, what do you try to help them figure out and accomplish as you talk to them? Really what their next best step is, is it to come out to one of our events? Is it to wait and build up their seed corn? Um, I have people who want to talk about the deals they have. I help them you know, look at that from an outsider looking in who also invests. So it just, it kind of varies, but yeah, really to find out their next best step. So 15 years you've been working with investors, uh, m tens of millions of dollars in capital, actually now over uh, several hundred million dollars you've yeah. assisted in terms of placements. Uh, walk. Uh, those listening through the different types of assets that you have knowledge about that you've seen come through the doors at Alpine? Yeah, so single family homes are our main business model. Um, throughout the country, we do mobile homes, we do manufactured homes, we have RV parks and mobile home parks that we syndicate. Once you get in the Alpine family, as we say, there's joint venture opportunities with Aaron if you have larger uh, appetite and larger pockets to do kind of bigger projects. Yeah, so uh, Becca also has uh, a unique perspective because her husband is Colonel Fred, who's also part of the package. He's going to be teaching our mobile home flipping class. So you've been a fly on the wall for that because that, that started organically a few years ago as well, didn't it? Yes, I know way more about mobile homes than I ever wanted or thought I would know. But I really do like them, actually. So so those of you that are um, uh, that are watching this, you're going to get a chance to, someone, uh, to talk to someone with 15 years experience uh, advising uh, investors on how to build their passive portfolio, how to build their active portfolio, how to use retirement money to buy property with. Um, you also are the the keeper of the Dropbox folder, correct? Correct. The Dropbox folder with all the properties that everyone wants to see. <laughs> so those of you that want to see what kind of deals we have, uh, whether it's a syndication, whether it's multifamily, whether it's single family, whether it's manufactured, uh, Becca has access to that as well. So, so she's a fantastic starting point on your journey. You'll get an email from us. It'll have a link to her Calend, Calendly, Calendly, what is it? Calendly, yeah. It'll have a link to her Calendly. Uh, grab a time spot, uh, hop on a call with her, hop on. You mostly do phone calls. Or you do a mix of phone and Zoom or what's the... I do many phone calls, but if somebody wants a Zoom, obviously that is A-OK -okay with me. Additionally, I like to tell people I know there's different time zones and work schedules. So if something doesn't work that's on my calendar that works for you, let me know directly and I'll, I'll make it work. 
Yeah, one thing we found is we want to get you in front of a live person like Becca within uh, a week or two of getting involved with our company. And so we want you to, 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 to get with her as soon as possible, pick her brain, tell her what you're thinking, tell her what your goals are, tell her what your objectives are. Let her weigh in on that from somebody who's very savvy, who's worked with a lot of investors. She spends all of her time just communicating with clients and she's worked with investors from all over the world. Give them a, a vibe, a, a feel for the different places around the world that you've been to meet with clients and also where they come from. Yeah, so we had a large portion of Singaporean investors. Um, I think it started about seven years ago. Japanese investors as well. I've been to Singapore, Malaysia, um, the UK. So yeah, I know unfortunately a lot about the tax and legal when it comes to investing. If you're if you're not a U.S. citizen, I know. Yeah, so so she's well versed in all asset classes, active strategies, passive strategies, uh, domestic clients and international as well. So uh, we're excited that you will have a chance to connect with her. Uh, as you can see, she's super laid back, very easy to talk to. She's not going to patronize you. She not, she's not going to make you feel dumb like I will if you talk to me. And <laughs> but, okay. Um, yeah, so that hopefully that gives you a feel for the, 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 the caliber of the person that we're putting you in touch with. I mean, it's not just some call center, guys. This is uh, you're meeting people with a lot of expertise, a lot of experience. Um, and you're getting coached from from people in that same. That's one thing that we, that Toby that we always get feedback from. Um, real people, real experience, uh, not a script. You know, that's that's what people really want, and a lot of companies don't offer that because they're seminar companies. You know. Well, they have to decide whether they're just going to be about teaching or whether they're going to be about doing. It's hard to do both. Not easy, but it is doable, and we've shown that we can do it. Uh, and that's what makes it unique is that there's a lot of folks out there that can say things, but then it's like rich dad, poor dad, love the book. Didn't yeah. know what the heck to do after I read it. And you <laughs> kind of spin out there and you're like, I, I, I know I'm not supposed to be doing what I'm doing, but how do I get involved in this stuff? And, uh, you know, there's a lot of groups out there that'll teach you, but you never know whether they're actually doing what they're teaching or who they are. And, uh, and I can just tell you from experience, I, I, I had a number of clients that were teaching a topic and I would look at their tax return and they were losing money at the very topic they were teaching. And it was a little bit disconcerting, you know, it's like, you know, you're teaching people to do some pretty aggressive strategies, especially the option folks, you know, where they were doing day trading and things. And, and I was like, uh, I see the success rate. It's not very high. And the success rate of the, of the speaker wasn't really high. So I tend to look, I like to look at people's numbers and get a good gist of what they're doing. I know you guys have been very successful over the years. We've had a lot of success over the years. And uh, I usually just steal ideas from people that are successful and say like, what works consistently? What is a pattern of multiple people? And uh, and what, and, uh, and and how can I articulate that so other people can do the same? And uh, it comes down to some simple things. Brad had a really interesting question. Uh, he said, hi, Aaron. We have a four bedroom, five bath three-story, newly remodeled single-family home in San Francisco, 10 minutes from UC Med Center. It's on the market for $2.25 million. Can you figure out a better option to generate cash flow rather than selling it outright? Given the tight rental bureaucracy in San Francisco, once we put an ADU on the ground level, it will no longer be exempt from rent control as enjoyed by single-family homes. Uh, what are your thoughts? That's, that's interesting, huh, Tub? That is interesting. Uh, whenever I see San Francisco, I immediately think 1031 exchange out of there and get into yeah. it, get into some place where you get some cash flow for your uh, for your property. But that but that's me. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mentioned earlier about the friend of mine that has has converted. They're doing uh, traveling nurses, uh, mm -hmm. or which which our traveling nurses we found uh, re they're recurring over and over again. But you might consider going into UC Med Center and find out. Um, who in the UC Med Center meets with clients who have to be there for long-term medical care and uh, see if we can get matched up as a, uh, as a provider for them and get paid by, by, by uh, insurance. Uh, I've had several clients, it, it starts with a visit to the hospital. So you need to go ask for who's the person that meets with clients when they have to find that out and just ask how you get on their list of recommended uh, close to the medical center uh, uh, short-term rental opportunities. And w when that person realizes that you potentially be willing to, to dedicate it to UC Med Center patients, 
That's the, I found that's the clincher. We did that with one of my Airbnbs with the National Laboratory. I found the person in, person in charge of executive rentals placing new people who had to, who got hired by the National Laboratory had to move to Idaho, and and that person works with those people to say here's you know here's the different communities here's the different schools, and so I said I want to dedicate my house for monthly rent furnished uh, with with executive rentals, and now that person is the single best. A referral that keeps my house full with executive rentals, and so getting that individual person is a lot, a lot of time. And it's and I'm not paying the commission like I am to Airbnb, and so um, you know thinking about it more broadly as a resource, I, I think is the way to approach something like that. I'm just looking at it, going, you got a 2.25 million dollar property, right? You need to be getting close to what about 120 thousand dollars a year net NOI on it, so you're probably yeah. about 150 thousand. So I'm like. I don't know how you do that necessarily. Um, 1030 wanted into, uh, if, if you, mm -hmm. you know, we could set up a syndication for that, that, that would be eight or nine cap, you know, and yeah. set it up as a, what's it called? The, the syndication so, where you can 1031 it in. Well, you 1031 or you do a 721. Yeah. In, the, in, in, unless this qualifies as a, a uh, tick, primary it's, residence. It's, if I structure it as a tenant in common, then they can 1031 in and 1031 out. And we've done. Yeah, of course. Things. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You can absolutely do that. Yeah. On a syndication. I'm sorry. I was, I was thinking you were thinking of doing like an upread. Um, but it depends on the type of property that was. Did you live in it two of the last five years? Uh, what's the actual gain? Is there gain? You know, uh, in San Francisco, usually there's some pretty extreme numbers, but at 2.25, you should be getting some decent rents. If you're not able to get it there, I mean, even looking at uh, pad split and things like that, uh, in those areas, if you're near a line, you might be shocked at how much people will pay per, because they pay per week for a room. You could probably get five bedrooms in that if you have five, uh, if you have five baths. Uh, it's just closing off one room that doesn't, it doesn't count as a bedroom because it doesn't have a closet, but you still, you still rent it out and it might be that you're getting a thousand bucks a week per room. I don't know what that market is, but my guess is that it's very, very high. And uh, you might be able to get enough rents to make it work. I bet you could uh, get 500 per room per week. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a house here in Las Vegas, uh, just under a million dollars that I didn't want to get rid of. Had furniture and stuff like that. So I just made it into a, a long-term rental uh but furnished you know it, here we yeah. have eight ways so you can't go but be, be not below 90 days and you, you it gets five fifty two hundred a month uh pretty regularly yeah here at a pop it's not my favorite thing in the world to do but uh sometimes you can go that route too um but it's all about testing that market out and seeing what 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 what, what you might be able to do with those um if you're near a medical center the other thing is you might want to look at uh medical housing and I don't mean like uh, traditional, like, hey, here's people to stay. I'm talking about uh, insurance covered transitional housing or housing for uh, even, uh, we do a lot of transitional housing for inmates, but there's also medical housing uh, where you might be able to get paid from insurance and it's usually a higher amount per room, um, especially if you're near medical centers so why people are getting treatment or things like that. So, um, Again, there's there's some options there for you, but again, my first instinct when I see Seattle or San Francisco or New York is oh. three one exchange into a state where you get some cash flow, my friend. Um, probably not what they want to hear. Yeah, when I evaluate markets, I use four four criteria. Okay, um, I there, you have to have affordability, and there's no affordable when you look at median home price, median income that doesn't mm -hmm. exist in New York, that doesn't exist in San Francisco. There's a lot of markets you don't get affordability. Uh, the second thing is you got to have population growth. And I, I track right now, I track uh, millennials and Gen Xers. Uh, where are they moving? I don't care as much where the boomers are moving. They're all moving to the Sun Belt. The third thing that, that, that you have to see is um, low unemployment compared to the other, their surrounding states. And then the fourth thing that I, I'd like to see is a landlord friendly, business friendly, local state government, uh, local government and state government. And so, you know, California is not landlord friendly. New York is not landlord friendly. Anywhere that, that has the word rent controls is not landlord friendly. Oregon. And, and so it's, it's one thing to do active investing in those areas. I love active investing, wholesaling, yep. auctions, 
but you, but 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 you, what savvy investors do is they take those profits and and buy long term rentals in areas that meet those four criteria. And I'll I'll throw those in in Q and A or chat while uh, while Toby's Toby's covering some tax stuff. Well, we're going to play a little tax because I like putting money back into people's pockets. And uh, I don't know. I always just get a kick out of it. Um, used to do a, a a thing every time on a, on tax and asset protections. I call it 10x on taxes because uh, it's one of those areas where, you know, Aaron was talking about making $1,500 an hour uh, on, on certain activities. This is one of those that could pay you something close to that if you understand how taxes work. And I wanted to step back for a quick second and give you kind of two worlds and then i'll get into the different types of taxation uh and then how you can uh, how you can structure uh around some of the downfalls of some of those different types but i want you to uh, pretend that you're flying into orlando airport if you've never flown into orlando airport there's this place where you drop off your money and it looks there's a guy there that looks kind of like this right it's uh it's a mouse and he takes all your money and uh but but boy people love to go visit him you're going down there for disney world i don't know if that's actually a mouse but he looks kind of like a mouse Whee! there we go um but when you go into the orlando airport and you let's say you pick up a rental car you could follow the signs that'll take you to disney world and they'll take you there but you're gonna get this little thing it used to be you had to you had to drive by these terminals that, that looks like a urinal on the side of the road where you throw a quarter now they just take a shot of your uh license plate and they they uh they just bill your rental car company if you if you got a car what a lot of people don't realize is that the first exit out of that airport is actually a roadway called sand lake road it, it has a number on it now but it used to just be called sand lake road it's still called sand lake road but again the, that first exit it's it has some highway number you can actually google it you could say avoid tolls and you'll realize that it's a straight shot right down to disney world and you avoid all the tolls i use that because that's the tax code there's a tollway and then there's the local road that everybody the people that navigate that area that live there know about and real estate's no different there's two roads in real estate the first road is I write things off over 27 and a half years or 39 years. I'm doing this thing called Macker's straight line depreciation, and I'm writing things off over a long period of time. The second road is I break it down into pieces and I write things off over five, seven, and 15 years and 27 and a half or 39 years, depending on whether it's residential or not. But I'm actually breaking it down into its pieces. And I want you to visualize something for, with me for a second. Imagine you're going up to one of Aaron's homes. So you've seen these, these cute little houses uh, where they have a nice yard. Sometimes you put a nice fence in, you put some shrubs in and uh, new trees. There's new carpeting. There's new appliances. Everything's all nice. I was thinking of the Shelby homes when I'm thinking of this. They put in all new flooring and all that. When a typical accountant walks in, they might say, hey, you know what? This is all 27 and a half year property. I'm going to write it off. And the easiest way to think about it is you don't write off land, but whatever that improvement, whatever the cost of that box was on that property, you're just going to divide it up by 27 and a half and write it off. It's not quite that simple. You write off half of it the first year and then and then but so if you have a $275,000 improvement so let's say you bought a house for, for 350 75,000 of it was land you'd write off and start to depreciate 275,000 which means you get about a $10,000 deduction just for showing up every year without anything else it didn't come out of pocket or anything it's because the useful life of that property is being depreciated over its lifetime um Somebody like me walks in there and they say, oh, that driveway is 15-year property. That fence there is 15-year property. The new landing where this where that brings you up to the front door is uh, in, in those steps, that's land improvement. And the, the little walkway, that's all 15-year property. I look at the carpet and I go, that's five-year property. I look in the kitchen and I see the, the cabinets and the, the new appliances and I go, that's five-year property. And then I, you know, and I use my x-ray vision and I say, there's probably plumbing that attached that, that, uh, uh, that dishwasher and the refrigerator. 
and there's probably electricity going there and there was even a platform that it's sitting on all of that is the same useful life as that item which is five years i walk out into the backyard and i see a deck and i go that's 15 year property i see the new trees i see the new shrubs i see the new pitch and i go that's 15 year property and i immediately start saying we should be writing this thing off much faster and the easiest way to think about this is if I said, hey, you could have a dollar today or a dollar in five years, which one's more value, valuable to you? Well, obviously having the dollar right now, I could actually use it. And then in five years, if I got a dollar, it's not as valuable as me having that dollar for the five years, right? Even at a really horrible interest rate, let's just put, say I put it in a savings account, I'm going to make 5% on it right now. So I would have uh, over that over that five year stretch, let's say I'd probably be closer to seventy five bucks, or you know, uh, uh, if you give me five dollars, it'd be seven dollars and fifty cents, whatever, right? That's what we're doing when we write things off inappropriately, and that's what most of the people I see are doing, and they don't realize that there's alternatives. That's just something as simple called a cost segregation, and believe it or not, it's actually what you're supposed to be doing. So this is one of my kind of my favorite things is enlightening people as to there's alternatives. When I go into and I see one of Aaron's syndications, for example, that storage unit, I don't know if you cost seg that thing yet. Did you do a cost seg on it? You're muted. Yeah, not yet, but that's the plan. I, well, one thing I, I learned from Toby is I, I like to save my cost seg. So like that office in Indy, I haven't used it yet because I, I Toby unlocked the miracle of nonprofits for me. And so I put 2 million yeah. bucks in my nonprofit. So every year savvy investors are like, how many cost eggs do I need to use? What do I put into the nonprofit? How do I flow it through? That's one thing I've learned that I didn't understand before. Yeah. So uh, if the ability to do a cost segregation and write things off is something you can pull the trigger on at any time you own a property. So even if you've owned a property, uh, let's say five years and you choose to do a cost segregation, the year that dictates whether or not you can accelerate that depreciation into one year, like you could always do the five, seven or 15, but you could write off that five, seven and 15 year property in one year if it was built in 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, or put in service in any of those years, 2022, uh, soon to be 2023 and 2024. Uh, but you're going to be able to write those off much faster. And then when you do that, you could choose to write them off in one year or just spread them out over that five, seven, which means you are sitting on a large amount of deduction that you could choose to use or not to use. It's actually your choice. And so what Aaron just hit on is a lot of times, uh, and I and I've done this uh, a number of times, I'll sit on properties and I won't cost say them. I'm not a real estate professional because I don't qualify because I spend more than half my time on non-real estate trades or businesses because I'm a lawyer. So I don't get to write off the losses that I create against my W-2 income. Aaron could, but there's only so much he wants to write off. He doesn't want to be at zero. He probably wants to show some taxable income so he can qualify for some loans or you know, or it sometimes looks a little suspicious if every year you have a zero on your tax return, although we do have clients that do that in real estate. You don't get audited. Yeah. I, can show you, I can show you the audit rates. It's ridiculously low yeah. for successful people. And I, you know, I prepay part of the, you know, for having an S corp as a management company. One of the things that Anderson taught me was that I need to have a reasonable salary. So I prepay 16,000 a month in in federal taxes that eventually essentially i have a payroll company and then it just goes to irs so i've already prepaid almost 200 grand every year and so i don't mind i always say to my guy i don't mind paying 200 grand it's like toby said it's nice it makes it real easy to qualify for an auto lease or a credit card or you know a line of credit for for think personal lines of credit um i don't like i've been at zero and had no credit i don't like that i like having that flexibility of having credit I've been there too. We, uh, uh, Clint and I thought we were geniuses when we started Anderson in 1999. Those first few years, we did this deferred revenue and we were having some fun with the tax code, showing how smart we were by not having any taxable income. Yeah. And we we're like, yeah. yeah. And then uh, he goes to get a mortgage. I remember Clint and he's like, I can't qualify for a dang mortgage. They said <laughs> I have no income. 
<laughs> my credit score dropped to like uh 620 uh with because i'm like i had no no nothing in my name you got you, you gotta you gotta do a little like it's 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 yeah. like your credit you gotta have a credit card and I don't like using credit. I, I'm one of the first people to tell you. I just, but I keep about a 10% balance. I pay it off every yep. month. But you want to show that you're using something, otherwise they'll penalize you. And you, unless you never want to use credit, I use credit on our apartment buildings and on our commercial buildings. I think we have two loans, maybe only one now. But every now and again, it's nice if you're buying something that's expensive. You want to be able to lever it up a little bit. You don't want to come out all uh, cash necessarily. Small stuff, we buy cash. Big stuff, you try to lever a little bit. So if it's over, you know, four or five million, you might want to get some debt on it. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you learn that lesson the hard way. And we don't want, you know, what our job is, is to walk you through it. I'm going to show you how taxes work. Before I do that, there's a couple of questions that came in. Uh, one, a nice comment. Uh, all I've been doing for the last decade is pay income taxes, a lot of it. I learned more in two weeks of uh, with free Toby videos than I did in the last two years. It didn't take much convincing to to join the program. Thanks, you, Jita. And uh, hopefully we bring you a lot more value um, uh, because it does, like a little bit of this stuff, you'll see it today. You guys are all going to walk away with probably a few extra dollars in your pocket simply because there's some strategies here that you probably weren't aware of. If a person currently switched uh, to now writing the five, set, uh, five, 10, 15 year items, it's actually five, seven and 15, but you know, you're close. Um, does this complicate or nullify the benefit of doing a cost seg on the property? That is a cost seg on the property. So cost segregation is when you break the components down and get them valued. You're supposed to use an engineering study. It's supposed to be walked. The company we use is a company called Cost Seg Authority, Eric Oliver. We have a great relationship with them. Um, they've done over 23,000 cost seg studies. They've had 20 audits to date, and that's over more than a decade. Um, we love working with them because they do it right. And everything's exactly the way the IRS audit manual tells you that you should do. They're uh, not horribly expensive. They're not the cheapest, but they are certainly the best and they are a great value. And uh, you just work through us and they won't even charge you to do the uh, the to do the initial analysis to see whether you actually want to do it. Uh, but cost seg, no, no bones about it. A cost seg is when you break the property down into five, seven and 15 year. Technically, uh, for the CPAs out there, we're breaking the 1250 property away from the 1245 property. You're allowed to do that. And if you haven't depreciated it uh, to date, you get to do what's called a catch-up. It's a 481 position, which uh, which means we get to take all those deductions that we hadn't already taken, and we get to take them in the year that we choose to make that. Um, yeah, we get to, we we get to take that uh, all that stuff we didn't take. We get to take them this year. So uh, you could you could sit on these. I've done it. Aaron just said he does it. Uh, but getting back to your question is, if you do a syndication. The answer is they're probably going to cost seg on a syndication, almost all the syndicators I know, because it's going to pass down huge tax losses. You never lose them. You carry them forward until you liquidate the position, until you sell the the, uh, the building, and then it's released and gets used against the gain. If there's extra loss that you never got to use, you use it against your W-2 income. You get to use it against your other income sources. So there's never really a good reason not to do it under those circumstances, unless everybody is sitting in a position where they don't need the loss. But for the most part, a lot of investors, we call it a lazy man's 1031, they're selling stuff. So they exit a syndication. The best thing they could do is in the year that they sell is to buy a new syndication. And for that new syndication to do a cost seg so they can use the loss that comes down from the new syndication to offset the gain from the old syndication. And no, I didn't misstate that. You can use passive losses against passive capital gains. Uh, a lot of accountants don't even are, are unaware of that. So, uh, so th those are the things that you can do when you, when you spend time in these waters. And I'll just reiterate, we know the secret way to Disneyland or Disney yeah. world, right? That's what it is. You have to, to do this, if you're a tax person and you're not investing in real estate, you don't know the secret ways. 
You don't even know there's a secret way because we don't know what we don't know. And unfortunately, a lot of the accountants out there will take your return. They'll put it in a software program and you're paying up the nose because they don't know the nuances of real estate. Here's another one, Susan. We purchased two properties, purchase price $90,000 each, I suppose. Should I cost sag on that? I met with the cost sag company and they said minimum purchase price should usually be, usually be around $150,000. We did finance the house, older home with many updates. So it's this thing called is the juice worth the squeeze, Susan. You get someone to look at it and say, here's what it would create as far as loss. Now, I'm in the top tax bracket. A dollar to me of a deduction is worth 37 cents. I don't have any state income taxes. So for the most part, it's like a dollar is worth something to me. If I could create a $10,000 deduction, it's worth $3,700 to me. If it costs me $1,500 to get that, I may still do it. For somebody else, that $10,000 deduction might be worth $1,500. In which case, is it worth it to do $1,500? No. I'd have to see what your situation is, what the tax rate is on those dollars, and whether that makes sense. I would imagine that they're going to charge you something around $1,500 to do that for those, for those properties, but who knows? Sometimes they have minimums. It may or may not be worth it. My experience is that underneath 150,000, uh, it's a little hit or miss. If you are in, uh, let's say that you are in a state where there's a high income tax, state income tax, plus you're in the highest Fed, it might be worth it. But but something tells me on 90,000, you're probably talking about a cost seg might be worth $14,000 deduction might be worth closer to an $18,000 deduction, but it's it's certainly not going to be earth shattering. Um, sorry, I wish I could give you uh, an, an easier answer, but it's about, you know, we used to call it like this. In, anything in tax, there's three rules. The three rules are actually quite simple. Calculate, calculate, calculate. If it's worth it, do it. If it's not, don't. Can you do your own cost seg by evaluating all your own items? Wanda, technically, no. You would lose that audit. Um, you have to have an engineering study. Uh, could you do it right away and uh, do it on the cheap? Yeah, you actually can. There's probably some pro there's probably some uh, software programs and stuff. And again, if it's not if it's not earth shattering numbers, it might be worth rolling the dice a little bit. But uh, you're supposed to have a cost uh, seg report. If I'm working with you and I'm signing a return or one of my accountants, my CPAs, we're going to want to see the cost seg study, you know, but if you're doing your own stuff, you could do it. I'm not going to tell you not to. I found a uh, company once, Toby, that they would do a $500 cost seg. And then they said, if you get, and it was all that, it was all from a video. And mm -hmm. then they said, if, if you get audited, we'll come do the, do a real one. That was that was their that they, was their game plan. Technically, they could do that. That's the yeah. thing. It's kind of weird. I just choose to do it right from the get go. Yeah, but you know, that's me. It's up to you. Everybody's yeah, I mean, different. I love Cost Seg Authority. We we re we refer all of our clients to them. I just like a company where you have access to the to the head honcho. Uh, mm -hmm. via email and they're fantastic with that because we've had questions and we've gone around on a couple that we thought should be more and they were like okay yeah that makes sense we can do that and i love that because then you know you're doing it safe and aggressive which is what i love well they tend to estimate low and and do the reports high um and then and then you go somebody says is it a one-time payment for is there a renewal fee it's a, if you're going to stay in, if it's, if you're doing the 297, it's as long as you want to stay in the 2997 is a year. And then it uh, depends on what you want to keep. If you want to keep doing group coaching, then you would pay whatever the group coaching cost is. If you're just going to drop down to 360, it's going to be, it's right. It's under a thousand. If you're doing, going down to the starter package, it's 30 bucks a month. Like it's, it's just, it's up to you as to what services you need. If you love going out to the uh, cash flow summits, then you're going to want to stay at 360. That's all. But um, if you do what, again, if you guys go out and buy a property, hope you're realizing you're going to get rewarded. Uh, 
<laughs> There's somebody who said they did a two million and fifteen. Oh, they just did a. Uh, what are they charging forty five? Who was it, Catherine? Uh, somebody just responded. So I, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I can certainly look at it. I've never had any issues with Cossack Authority, so I'm hoping it's not. You didn't have an issue with those guys. All right, let's get back into it. I want to go over uh, who was who were you working with there? Actually, uh, if somebody could follow up on that. Make sure that we get it over to Eric because that's that sounds weird. They're usually doing a study off of your. Uh, well, they shouldn't even charge you for it. It should have been an estimate for nothing if it came through us. Um, and we'll we'll make sure that we take care of that. Um, types of income. Let's talk about this for a quick second. I know I talked about it a little bit this morning, but I am going to go over exactly how this worked. Remember, earned income. You are paying ordinary tax on it which is the zero to 37% plus social security or FICA or self-employment tax. If you are uh, a, a schedule C filer, if you're running your own company, not through a corporation. So if you have earned income, even if you're working at McDonald's, I used to work at McDonald's. I made $4 and 15 cents an hour. I still had withholding done. I still had to pay all these different types of tax. I didn't got I didn't get four dollars an hour. I got like three dollars and twenty cents an hour, right? By the time they hammered me enough. So earned income sits up here, and it's the only type of income of all of these where you're getting hit with earned income. Everything else down here, when we go to portfolio income and passive income, uh, which is legitimately the two other types of income, it's active or earned income, it's portfolio income, and it's passive income. That's all we do. Like a lot of people just use two. They say it's active or it's passive. <clears throat> That's not true. We have portfolio. Royalties, interest, those are ordinary. There's no social security taxes below this line. Dividends are going to be taxed at 0, 15, or 20%. They're taxed as long-term capital gains, as long as they're qualified dividends. So that's companies that are paying out dividends in the U.S. So C corporations paying out money. So it's all of your investments in the uh, in the S and P 500 or the the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It's Wall Street, New York Stock Exchange. All those companies, they're paying qualified dividends, and they're again depending on your tax bracket. Here, I'll just show you what it is. If you are, here, I'll just do this, this is 2023. In 2023, if you're below 89,250, you do not pay any tax on your capital gains underneath that point. So if you're making, and this is after your standard deduction. So standard deduction was a little over 26, almost 27,000 last year. It's a little over 27,000 actually. So about 117,000, there's a good chance all of your gains were at zero. So there's a strong incentive to do dividends. That's why we like them. They're a cornerstone to the strategy when we are building up cash flow in the stock market because they're tax advantaged. So that's long-term capital gains as well. That means that a asset that you've held for over one year, Asset that you held for less than one year is ordinary. It's short-term capital gains, which still isn't horrible. It's still just ordinary, but you're not being hit with this Social Security. This is the nasty one. And Social Security is 15.3%. It's 12.4% old age, disability and survivor's benefit. It's 2.9% Medicare. So it adds up quick. It does have a phase out at about 170,000 for the old age disability and survivors. And then it has a surcharge when you get above 250,000 to go to 3.8%. But for most people, the average American, you're getting hit at that 15.3%. It's a little bit painful. And the average American is in the 0% long-term capital gain bracket, which means shoot, I should be taking advantage of that. Every year, I should be looking at my taxes. I should be looking at my brokerage account. And I should say, 
do I have unrealized long-term capital gains? If I do, and I see that I have, uh, let's say that I'm I'm at seventy thousand dollars. I'm married. I know I have another twenty thousand bucks. I can make it zero. I am going to sell my stock. Follow me here. I'm going to sell my stock at zero percent. I paid no tax on that. I'm going to buy it back immediately, and I'm going to reset my basis. It resets my holding period too, but I don't care because my basis is now higher. So if I, let's say I bought a company at a hundred bucks and now it's worth 120 and I sell it at 120 and buy it back at 120, my new basis is 120. So if the next year it goes up to 125,000 or $125, I only have $5 a gain. I've locked in a good chunk of gain at 0% tax, which is actually not too shabby, right? I'm, I'm okay doing that. And if anybody says, what about the wash sale rule? Uh, yeah, somebody just wrote that in. The wash sale rule only applies to losses, not to gains. So it's the wash sale loss rule, not the wash sale gain rule. So you get to, uh, there's always a few that, that know that it's floating around and then I go, that's wash sale. And by the way, we can get around the wash sale rule too. I know you were talking real estate today, but I can't help it. Uh, when you do a wash sale uh, and you're in, in securities, if you sell a company at a loss and then you buy it back within 31 days, uh, the loss of the, of the first sale is added to the basis of the new purchase. You don't get to take the loss. It, gets, it, it adjusts the basis. So if you have a company that is uh, 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 10, you know, let's say they're a hundred bucks and they go down to 80 and I, and I sell them at 80 and then I buy it back. Uh, let's say it, you know, it's it, it, a week later at 82, that loss, that $20 loss gets attached to my basis. My new basis is now $102, right? I have my loss stuck in that new purchase. So here's the workaround. Follow me just real quick. If any of you guys are uh, stock people, this will save you a, a ton of money at some point in your life. Uh, what you do is you sell it and then you buy an in the money call. I buy an in the money option. And that counts as a purchase of the security for purchase of the loss sale wash rule. So you're $20 loss, let's say it was, and then you bought a new, you, you bought an in the money, let's say I bought a $60 option on that same transaction. Uh, so it's in the money. The reason is because I want it to, I don't want it to be fluctuating too much. And, uh, and now I have that $20 loss attached to that new option. And then I buy back my shares. Let's say I buy them back at 80 bucks. All right. The wash sale loss attached to the option. So now I sell the option and I take that loss. So I now I'm just left owning the shares and I still get my loss. We just did the work around for the wash sale loss rule. Yay. See, there's always something that works, guys. But this is what you guys are really here for is this one. Passive income. There are two types. There's rents and then there's businesses without material participation. What does that mean? Silent owner in a business. So rental activities are the same thing as being a silent owner in a business, believe it or not. So if you ever have, you ever run across somebody and they're like, oh man, I got a bunch of passive losses and they're interested in hearing about somebody who's in, who's opening up a new restaurant or somebody who's own, opening up a new minute lube or whatever, whatever they call them now, an oil change place or something. They're looking saying, oh man, maybe I can get a cash flow business and I have some losses for my real estate or vice versa, either one. Hey, I want to invest in a new pizza shop because it's, it's all going to be capital intensive in that first year. I'm going to buy ovens and things like that, make this big loss and it's going to offset all my income from my rental activities. Yes, you can do that. 
and it helps to know what your losses are. And here's why it's important. Passive losses only offset passive income. Passive losses only offset passive income, which means, oh shoot, if I have a bunch of passive losses from real estate, I can't use them. Two exceptions. Number one, I'm an active participant in real estate. It's called, it's, it's section 469. If you want to look it up, 26 USC 469. Uh, but if I'm an active participant in real estate, I can write off up to $25,000 a year. And an active participant in real estate is somebody who manages the manager. So you could be an active participant with Alpine, right? So if you have losses, let's say that you have properties that you buy, you buy a couple properties and they generate a little bit of a tax loss because we're depreciating that property, you probably could use it against your other income. It could lower your W-2 income. It's not too bad. It's called an active participant, but it phases out between $100,000 and $150,000. So if you're making more than $150,000, you can't use it at all. If you're making uh, over, you know, around 100,000, you could probably use the whole thing. Below 100,000, you're fine. That's exclusion number one. Exclusion number two, real estate professional status. If you are a real estate professional, then I'm going to verbally say this, and then I'll show you a slide later that actually writes it out, but I want you to hear my words. Uh, if you're a real estate professional, it means you spend more than half of your time. One spouse has to qualify if you're if you're married filing jointly. You spend more than half your time in real estate trades or businesses. Real estate agent, construction, you're managing your own properties, you're a builder. You're, you, you have to be in a real estate trade or business developer. There's a whole list that that qualifies. And you have to spend more than 750 hours on that activity. And it has to be more than anything else you do. It has to be more than any other personal service you provide. So we need 750 hours, more than 50% of your time. That will give you real estate professional status, prong number one. Prong number two, you're now a real estate professional, but you have to materially participate on your rental properties. So again, I'm gonna verbally say this, we'll write it out later. You grab your rental properties and you need to spend at least a hundred hours a year on those rental properties, both spouses added up together on this one. So real estate professional prong, one spouse has to meet it. Uh, if I am, going to count my material participation, I'm going to add up both spouses and they need to be over a hundred hours more than anybody else. So nobody else could spend more time on that property than you, not a company, an individual. So if, if you have a company like, again, an Alpine, you just have to beat anybody that's working on those properties. So if they, if they track time and they say, nobody spent more than 10 hours a year on your property and you're at 110 hours, you're good. And that's, again, adding up both spouses. Uh, you aggregate all your properties together so they're treated as one activity and it's only your investment properties. It's not flips, it's not short-term uh, rentals, it's only those. And that will get you unlocked passive losses so you can use them against your other activities. So when you heard Aaron say, I'm a real estate professional, it means he spends more than 750 hours in real estate trades or businesses and real estate trades or businesses is his primary work. It's more than half of his personal time. And that will get you unlocked passive losses that become non-passive losses and can offset your W-2 income, can offset your 1099 income, can offset your uh, income from Things like an S Corp can offset even your capital gains. So those things are really important. Capital gains is another one where capital losses only offset capital gains with one exception. You can write off up to $3,000 a year against your ordinary income. So if you lose money in the stock market, that's the one that beats you up a little bit where people are like, oh man, I had a horrible year. My guy got me to 
to sell and I have a hundred thousand dollar loss. Well, it could take you 30 years to take that full loss, right? You could be just it's crazy, crazy. It could be really painful. So, um, so we look at those things when we're doing tax planning. I look at it from a tax standpoint because I'm always looking at it going, how could I use this to my advantage? So for example, I'll use 2024 because they're more fun. I still look at that, that capital gains rate. And remember, dividends fall into this, but also long-term capital gains. And I always want to make sure that I don't leave a bunch of money on the table. I want to make sure that I'm capturing those long-term capital gains if I'm below that $94,000 mark. And again, that's with your standard deduction. It really does make a huge impact, guys. So what a good tax planner is going to do is they're going to look and they're going to want you to be right about here. Your audit rate is about as low as it can go when you are right in that mid category, right around that $200,000 and below mark, 100 to 200. It gets like, oh, Hmm, my audit rate is in the toilet on that one. Um, and I want to make sure that I'm using my zero and 15% brackets, right? Anything above 94,000 up to 583,000, that's 15%. It's still not devastating. If I make too much money, married filing jointly over 250, I get this little net investment income tax. So they're going to tack that on. So I could be at, what, 18.8%. Ouch, right? It's not horrific. It's certainly not 37%, right, where I'm just getting a crud kicked out of me. It's not 24% where I feel like I'm getting bloodied up pretty good too. This is definitely better tax treatment. Somebody says, if I have a real estate license in California, can I qualify for real estate professional status? if my investment property is in another state. Elena, this is a great example. So Elena, here we go. We have 469C7, that's the code provision. Prong number one is 750 hours, 50% or more of your time in a real estate trader business. So Elena, if you can play along with me in chat. Do you spend 750 hours a year as a realtor? If you're willing, if you're out there, we'll see if she is, if she's not. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Is it more than 50% of your time? Like your professional service time? Do you do any other jobs that it is more than 50? So you meet prong number one. So there's prong number one. Number two, do you materially participate on your rental properties. So are all of your properties located out of state? All of your renter, rental properties? Do you have any properties, you know, so you don't have any properties in state. How many properties do you have that are investment properties? Just one. And is it managed by a third party? Yes. So the, honestly, you're not going to meet this test because you have somebody else who's managing it and you would have to meet at least 100 hours. Have you, Did you fly out there and spend more than 100 hours fixing up that property or working on that property? No, you're not going to be a real estate professional for this purposes, for, for unlocking the losses. The losses still stay with you, Elena. They're still going to show up and they're still going to offset other passive activities. So this is where as you build up your real estate and as it grows and you get more and more rents, those losses come along and just keep, keep you from paying tax at any of that rent. You're still getting paid rent, but you're not paying any taxes on it. I hope that makes sense. Let me show you guys in another way. And I hope you're okay if we bust through without a break. You guys need a break? Tell me if you need a break. Give me a thumbs up if you need a break. If you don't need a break, we'll just keep busting on through. So I don't see any thumbs. 
All right, perfect. We'll just keep going through. I'm going to show you uh, how real estate, um, I'll go back to the, the quadrant here in a second. I'm going to show you how it works. So the basics are, we take our gross rental income. So let's say that you're making $1,000 a month times 12 equals $12,000. And then you take off all your expenses. So your expenses are going to be everything from, let's just say, your all your, your auto expense, your insurance, your real estate taxes, any repairs you did on that property. And by the way, any repair that is $2,500 or below is a repair. Even if you think it's an improvement, if you know the distinction, it's a repair. There's a safe harbor. Anything below $2,500. If you have financials done, it's $5,000. So if you have financials done for like a loan, then any repair, anything you do on that property for $5,000 or below is a repair. You write it all off. Uh, utilities, insurance, home office, paying your kids. There's an easy one. Pay those kids. If they're under 18, there's no, uh, no employment taxes. You can uh, certify them to have no withholding. And if you pay them less than $14,000 a year, there's no tax. So you can actually transfer some money to your kids. You're eight, you know, so if you have a 16 year old, 17 year old, 15 year old, 14 year old, 13 year old, 12 year old, 11 year old, actually down to about nine, there's court cases showing that nine year olds can actually get paid. You can actually pay your kids and not have to pay tax on it. You run it through, technically it's run through W2. So you use a <laughs> payroll service. But when you do the W4, you have no withholding and then you don't have employment taxes because they're uh, your child. And it's a, uh, and if it's your real estate business and you're doing, uh, and you're structuring your real estate to hold real uh, rental real estate, it'll most likely be set up as a, uh, as a partnership. I'll show you in a second how it, how it actually gets structured. But let's just say that those expenses equal, let's just say $4,000. So we have net income of $8,000. Then we subtract off our depreciation. And that's gonna be depending on the type of, bit, of building it is, right? How expensive the, uh, uh, the, the, the actual structure, the little house was on that property. And that's what actually goes on your tax return after that depreciation is the question. So how do we do our depreciation? Well, let me show you. Let's say that we have a property that we bought for 500,000. The first thing we have to do is figure out what part is land and what part is improvement. So we have $500,000. We look at the assessment or we look at the appraisal, whichever one's better for us. Let's say I look at the assessment on this property and they assessed it at 300,000 and the land was 60,000, so that's 20%. That means land equals 20%, which equals $100,000. So what's the improvement value? 400,000. So we paid 500,000. Let's say this is single family residence. So it's under Mackers, that would be 27 and a half years. Our land is $100,000, so our depreciable basis is $400,000, which means our annual depreciation is right around $14,500. Whew, that's a nice little deduction, right? That's not too bad. So let's say that we, we know our basis, we know our deduction amount, but let's say we're renting for $4,000 a month. So that's $48,000 a year. And then let's say that we had $18,000 of operating expenses. So we have to take off our insurance, repairs, everything else. And that gets us down to $30,000 right here. That's our net operating income minus our depreciation, which was that 14,500. Again, my math it's not quite that. It's going to be a little bit lower in the first year. And after that, it's going to be higher. But I'm just using it for 
math, just to give an illustration. So you're going to put taxable income of about 15,500. And you're like, oh my gosh, I have to pay tax on that. That stink olas. That's why we do the cost seg. Under this one, under no cost seg, and I just do the 27 and a half years, I get beat up a little bit. What if I'm in a 20, the high tax bracket? What if I'm in 50%? I'm paying five or six grand a year. Ouch. What if I go to get a cost seg done on it? That cost seg on average is right around uh, on the full value of, the, of, of that property is right around 20 to 25%. So I'm just going to use a reduced amount of right around, uh, uh, let's say, 100,000 bucks. The yearly depreciation lowers because I just wrote a whole bunch of it off faster. It doesn't go away. I get both. So same thing. I have rents of $4,000 a month. I still have net operating income of $30,000. But now I have depreciation of, get this, $111,000. So my net income is a loss of $81,000. I just took a situation where I was going to have to pay $5,000 a year, whatever it is. It might be higher. In my case, it's higher. Your case, it might might be about the same, might be lower, might be higher, whatever it is. We actually do the calculation. I just eliminated about $5,000 a year for a set period of years. Like I know that I'm not going to have income here for it looks like probably another five or six years, which means I just put some money in my pocket. I saved myself $30,000, $35,000 that otherwise I'd be... It, I'm not going to get to write up. I'm going to have to pay that money in $35,000 that I don't have. And yeah, I get it back over 27 and a half years, but that's a long waiting period. That's why we do cost segregations. And you could do this to create that loss. And you could use that loss to offset other gain that you have on selling other properties. Syndications, you could use it to offset that. Or you could qualify as a real estate professional or you could qualify as an active participant in real estate and use up to $25,000 of that. So they actually are pretty potent when we get down to it. This is what it looks like. This is your 27 and a half year or 39 year. 39 year property is non-residential. So a lot of people just say commercial, but it's technically it's non-residential. That's also short-term rentals. They're considered hotels. Um, so these items here, the steel structure, the roof, the walls, the windows, HVAC, plumbing is all going to be either 27 and a half or 39 year. This middle section is 15 year property. And then five and seven is everything else. If it's not listed here, it's seven year, but, uh, parking lots, curb, gutters, sidewalks, storm drains, tree shrubs, landscaping, retaining walls, irrigation system. All those are 15. And then anything that could be removed from that unit without messing and destroying the unit uh, would be considered five or seven, uh, five or seven property, five or seven year. A cost seg study looks like this. I sit here and without, so this is regular. This is the way you're guys doing it now. And they're just Let's say this is a this is a one point two million dollar depreciable asset. So let's just say it's a, uh, eight, a, a, a an eight plex. This would be what your depreciation looks like normally. Remember, I said the first year is usually about half. I'm just I was just using for uh, purposes. I wanted to just make it simple. That first year, it's always half year convention of when they put it into service. So it kind of stink all this. But when we do the study, you're actually figuring it out. And here we go. We're at 27 and a half, or excuse me, 27% cost seg. So I used, a, you know, a little bit more of a modest number. This is an actual study where we actually uh, ended up with a tax benefit in this particular case, it was right around 50,000. So the only question for you when you look at this is, 
Um, can I get that benefit? Can I use that loss? Is it creating that tax benefit? And if it is, is it worth it to do a cost seg study? That's all you're doing. That's the only analysis. And then to really mess you up, I want you to think about something. When you sell your property, you have something called recapture. Give me a thumbs up if you've ever heard of recapture and you know what it is. Just see if you guys are sleeping out there. All right. So you know what recapture is. Do you know that you have to recapture that carpeting, that crappy carpeting you've been writing off all those years? You've been writing it off over 27 and a half years and then you have to pay tax when you sell it at up to 25%. It's your ordinary bracket up to 25%. Why are you paying tax on something that's worthless? When we do a cost seg study, personal property, you only pay tax on recapture on its value that you guys agreed that it's worth and that you're paying. So here's a situation. The cost basis of a property was 2.5 million. It was an apartment and they sold for 3.3 million. It was a five year hold. Nice little syndication. Their tax on the recapture and everything else, they didn't do a cost seg, was $285,000. That was their gain. That was their recapture. That was everything. We did a cost seg study on it. After they sold it, after they had vacated the building, because luckily... An accountant, I think it was one of our accountants, looked at it and said, realistically, you're paying way too much on that recapture. It's worth it to look at a study to see whether or not we could see what they're actually buying. Are they buying the structure or are they buying the pieces that are inside it? They were buying the structure. The new tax bill after the study was 211 841,000. So the tax savings on this one plus tax savings in your pocket $73,159. It's not a hypothetical. That's an actual study where it actually put $73,000 in somebody's pocket. We've seen them bigger. We see a lot of ones that are just like here's 45,000, here's 30,000. But if it costs me three or four grand to get 30 grand, I'm taking that action. And just to really kind of confirm this, when you do this study, you're filing something called a 3115. If you're not, this isn't the first year you've owned the property. You're literally going from an impermissible method to a permissible method. You're not supposed to write things off over 27 and a half years. You're not supposed to write your carpeting off over 27 and a half years. You're not supposed to write your appliances off over 27 and a half years. You're not supposed to write your driveways off over 27 and a half years. You're supposed to be breaking it down and doing this exact thing. That's what you're supposed to do. That's the permissible method. But unfortunately, everybody gets taught the impermissible method and the IRS doesn't care. Why don't they care? Because they make a whole bunch more money. So when you're looking at these things, you're always looking at it going, should I do the cost seg? I do the analysis. This, if you're doing it through Anderson, is free. It's free. We'll extend that to infinity too. I will get you taken care of. Hey, I'm an infinity person. Great. Let me grease the skids. They should do that to you for free. They will then say if it's worth it, if yes, do the study. Here, this is really going to trip you guys out. We can do the study all the way up until we file the return plus extensions the following year. We could do cost seg studies for 2022. We can do them, or 2023, excuse me all the way up until October 15th of 2024. 
Yep. Somebody says, I am confused. I did a cost sake study on a duplex two years ago. I'm selling this month. Will I be paying taxes? Depends on what they're buying. You'll pay taxes because even if the uh, asset's not a recapture, it's just your gain. So your gain could be 0%, depending on what your tax bracket is, or 15%. If it's a lot of money, it could be up to 20%. My guess is you're probably in the 15 and it could be a great thing. And if you did a bunch of improvements after you did the first study, you may want to add those in. If I'm not in a high tax bracket, I have 10 unit apartment that we did $150,000 in improvement. Is it okay to do a cost seg? Yes, you do that study. Somebody says, I'm doing a 1031 exchange, then you're not too worried about it. If you did a uh, cost seg, you just have to keep the same accounting methodology. You'd cost seg the new property. Is it too late to buy a property and do a cost seg for the 2023 tax year? Uh, it's whatever year the building is put into service or the property is put into service. So if you don't own the property yet, it's too late to do a 2023 cost seg. If you owned the property and put it into service in 2023, you could still do a cost seg on that 2023 up until October 15th of 2024. Are cost segs especially good when you buy a house in terrible condition and end up spending three times the cost to fix it up? Is that scenario a time you definitely want it to do a cost seg? Yes, Amy, because it's really easy to do because you have all the invoices. That's a great time to do it. You're going to get a massive deduction. What is the deadline for making a decision on the offer and enrolling in a 360 membership? It's during the event. I'm not going to sit here and dink with you guys. But if you guys reach out to pro at Infinity Investing and talk to somebody, I'm sure they will extend that as long as you're communicating with somebody. Somebody says, are you saying that if we jump into the program, I can receive a cost seg on a property sold in 2022 it was if you've already filed your 2022 taxes it's too late so it's you have to do the cost seg up to the uh, filing deadline plus extension so 2022 you would have had to have done that by october 15th of 2023 do you have to have passive loss in 23 but you get your real estate license in 2024 and use it to write off against your active w2 income it's year by year. So if you have passive losses in 2022, it stays passive. It doesn't get switched over. Can you offset $800,000 of capital gains by buying income rental property? Capital gains can be offset by capital losses unless that capital gains is the product. So Dina, was the $800,000 of capital gains from the sale of a passive activity? If it was, then it's considered passive capital gain by buying additional property and taking those deductions. Yes, it's actually that crazy. Yeah, you can. But that's why you talk to us. If you're part of Infinity, you have the ability to do a blueprint and work with Anderson. Our guys, we all operate under one roof. Anderson is the organization. Infinity is the program that teaches uh, making money. Everything else that Anderson does is about tax and asset protection. Speaking of asset protection, I want you to show, I want to show you how this works. So whenever you're involved in real estate, I want you to know where it's going to sit. So the first thing is we have to think of ourselves and our family. So here's Aaron and Megan how many kids you got, Aaron? I don't even know how to draw how Six. many kids you got. One, <laughs> two, three, four, five, <laughs> six. Hold on. And four dogs. How many ginger? Uh, um, th three gingers in the house. Well, two of the, two of the girls are gingers. So two of the four out of the six kids. Two of the six? 
plus Meg. Oh. So I have three soulless gingers in my house. A lot of gingers. All right. So the family is up in the personal category. Your house is up there. Your car, your uh, sports car, the BMW. Uh, how do you do that little symbol? Don't remind me of that, dude. <laughs> I'm going to give it a, uh, hold on. Sorry, brother, but I'm going to give it a flat tire because you drive it too fast and you skid it out okay all of your personal stuff is up in this quadrant and what we do there is we put a living trust around it and the way to think of a living trust it is luggage it is a carry-on it is a rolling carry-on where you put all of your other stuff it does not have to be probated it does not need a judge to say who owns what. You control it during your lifetime. It has things like your power of attorney is for financial, your power of attorney is for health, all that good stuff. You want to have that for you and your family. Your next category is your businesses. These are businesses that you are working in your businesses. So this is your management business. This is your real estate business, not buying, buy and holds, but like flipping, wholesaling. Put this someplace else. This thing hates me. Wholesaling, subject to construction. All that goes in the business category. And you're going to put boxes around these too. You may, depending on the type of business you have, you may have two boxes, you may have four, you may have five, right? You may have different boxes for these, but they are going to be taxed as corporations. So they could be an LLC taxed as an S corp, LLC taxed as a C corp. That's a decision that you make depending on what's in your best interest. And again, remember the three rules Calculate, calculate, calculate. These on this side, I'm just going to use red here real quick so you see it. These are active. On this side, we're really passive. I'm saying passive and I'm pissing off all the CPAs out there because I know it's portfolio income. But these are, there's stuff on this side that you're doing. This is sweat of your brow on this side. This is, on this side, is stuff that you're not working for. So this is your stocks. This is your savings. These are your bonds. This could even be your crypto. No risk comes from having these assets. And Aaron, if you had a bunch of cash in your house, where would you put it? Uh, in my house? Yeah. Let's say you had a bunch of cash. Would, would, would you put it in a safe or would you just leave it lying on a table? Yeah, safe with my gold is where it's kept right now. Well, we'll put gold over here. Nobody gets slips on gold. <laughs> These are all assets that go into a safe. And I'm not talking about a physical safe. I'm talking about a Wyoming LLC. Now, guys, we teach this every week at a tax and asset protection event. I think it's just about every week. If you want to learn this in detail, we teach a one-day event on tax and asset protection where we go into great painful detail on this. I'm giving you the th thumbnail sketch, but this is what it looks like. These are safe assets where we're only worried about what you could do to it. We want it to go like this. Pa ching We want any liability that happens like when you're doing wholesaling. Pa ching We want it to stay inside that box. We don't want it to come into here. Right? We don't want that. We want to make sure that nobody can get your stuff. So we put it in a safe. We buried it in the middle of a desert. 
and in, in Wyoming. The reason we do that is no one can see it or take it. You could have a $30 million judgment against you and they can't touch the assets that you hold in a Wyoming LLC. The most they can get is a lien against it, like a, it's called a charging order. That's why we use it because nobody can see it. And even if they can see it, they can't touch it. It's MC Hammer time, can't touch it. So risk assets, this is where your real estate is. This is where those real estate properties are. Hey, I'm buying these nice properties. I don't wanna get sued if my tenant hates me. Hey, I heard Aaron's rich. I'm going to sue the hell out of them. They start looking around for a predatory lawyer. They look at all the billboards around town and they start calling them. Hey, uh, this is the guy, the hammer. I'm going to call the hammer. Hey, hammer, I'm a tenant. I, yeah, I kind of screwed up his house. Yeah, I kind of burned part of it down. But he's a jerk and he's rich. Great. We He discriminated against you <coughs> or he violated your rights or... You fell down the stairs, right? Like, I need you to get a one of those neck collar things, right? They're going to come up with whatever they're going to do, and they're going to sue you. So you need to make sure that these guys are in their own little box, so nobody can no nobody can nobody can get outside the box. They're stuck in the box. We even take a second box, which is another Wyoming holding entity. And we do that because we could file one 1065. That's a partnership return. There's a reason we do that for a business reason, because we want to have a tax return on your real estate for financing, or if you want to sell it, it makes a huge difference. This type of structure keeps you out of trouble. This type of structure, if something happens on this property, you have mold, you have a house burned down. I've had three houses burned down in my like since I started investing. I had a, a house where a tree fell on it. The city's tree. Aaron, did I ever tell you that story of Winston Salem? No. We had a we had a, the torrential downpour that came down. I think it was about five or six years ago. They had just massive storms. And one of the city's trees fell onto my house. Stop. It was a little old lady. She was uh, 90 or excuse me, 80 years old, lived by herself, and that tree fell right on her bedroom. Whoa. But it was Winston-Salem, so it was a cinder block house. So, like, all oh. it did is squ it squished the roof. She can't live there. No. So the city calls me up and says, we're looking for the owner of such and such. Uh, when we'd set up the electricity... <laughs> It was in my name when we set it up, so they had my name. Your house is out of compliance. You need to call us immediately. And I'm like, out of compliance? So I called him right back, and I was like, what do you mean out of compliance? Oh, we talked to your property manager. And I was like, I don't care. Like, what do you mean out of compliance? Well, your house, uh, a tree fell on. What? Yeah, and, you know, and your electricity, as a result, you were out of compliance and we had to shut off your electricity. It was their tree. Never did they say, hey, we're sorry, one of our trees fell on your house. And then they hide, then they hide behind immunity. And they said, well, unless we knew or should have known, right? So again, anything could happen to a property. It didn't hurt the lady. What I remember most about that situation is that, um, we had folks out there buying her clothes. We had another house that we had just finished and we moved her into that one. It was a little bit nicer. She was really upset because she was like, she'd lived in that house for 30 years, guys. That was her house. And of course we move her into the new one and she didn't want to move into it. But then she never wanted to leave the new one because it was actually a lot nicer. <laughs> it was like, all right, just let her stay. Uh, we ate a little bit of rent, big whoop. She's 80 years old, she deserves it. But it was one of those things where it's like, that could have been bad. I always get that with sewer connections, whether if, if the drain line collapses, 
what's theirs and where's where's mine there that's always a fight yep isn't that crazy yeah you get you get the joy of the state of the cities we have properties you don't deal in all of ours we have houston that's a joy oklahoma city we have baltimore the bane of my existence baltimore is a whole bunch of fun but it is interesting. You got to make sure that you're isolating. Yeah, Baltimore. If you've ever had to deal with the city of Baltimore, ay, ay, ay. They need a, friendly. No, no, they need a tip. Yeah. Everything needs a tip. Did you, I, it's, I, I got the shakedown in Mexico. Uh, I got pulled over for using my phone while driving. And then he just stood there and told him, like, I have, I have $100. And he's like, okay, thanks. Bye. <laughs> it's uh. In a, in a lot of countries, because we drive through South America. You know my wife's in Colombia. Yeah. I always like the place where the cops don't even pull you over. They just stand in the street, and if they see you coming with a rental, they just wave at you. Yeah. And then they say, uh, Porto, and you just hand them some money, and they go, okay. Um, yeah, but you don't expect it to happen in Baltimore. Well, actually, yeah. I do expect it to happen in Baltimore. That's just the joy of Baltimore. Which is why you got to have a team. You got to have people there that are going to look out for you because, gosh, you don't want to be dealing with that. But this is what the structure looks like. All of these things, every every type of structure we use has kind of a different purpose. I'm not going to go into all of this today. I don't know if I'll have a – well, I mean, yeah, maybe I'll have a little bit of time here. I can do this. I love land trusts if you have mortgages on properties. If you're in Florida, we use them because we can avoid dock stamps. I like them in Florida because Florida now taxes if you, uh, they could reset your property taxes if you put it directly in an LLC. So you don't want to have properties going straight into an LLC in Florida. There was a pellet decision that came down at the end of last year that just is going to hose a whole bunch of, of uh, taxpayers. My guess is uh, there's some people that are going to get caught flat footed. But a land trust, from a tax standpoint, is ignored. It's called a grantor trust. Uh, so if you do nothing, it's just ignored. It's yours. If you transfer the beneficial interest to an LLC, it's going to be the beneficiary. So it could be the beneficiary LLC. That's what we use them for. We want your name off of different properties. I don't want your LLC necessarily on a property, depending on where it's set up because I don't want someone to be able to track it back to you. It's called security security through obscurity. We can make your name disappear out of a public record. You know that I can make your name disappear off your house, like your personal residence. You don't want anybody to know where you live? Fantastic. If you're a doctor or you're a, th a therapist or you're like you're you're worried at all about some of your uh, some of your clients following you home, we can get your name off of a property. It's actually very, very simple. Partnerships, LPs, tax treatment is flow through. It flows through to the partners. LLC, I'm just going to say Swiss Army Knife. It can be whatever you want it to be. It could be a corporation, it could be an S Corp, it could be a partnership, it could be ignored, whatever you want it to be. The LLC is the most versatile entity, which is why everybody uses them in real estate. S Corp, tax treatment. This one is also flow through. It's filing an 1120S, a corporate tax return, and the shareholders report the income or loss. C Corp tax treatment, 21% flat. Who reports the income? The corporation. I actually really like C corporations, especially if you have income issues, like you have too much income, or if you have somebody who has medical, dental, or vision problems, including parents that live with you, kids who live with you, because you can write off 100% of medical, dental, and vision out of a C-Corp. It's called a health reimbursement plan. 
Uh, you can't discriminate if you've got a bunch of employees in another business. So we got to be a little careful. But for most people, they have the C-Corp. It's covering themselves, their family. And uh, you can reimburse your uh, uh, deductible, your co-pays, things that aren't covered. It's, it's, it, it could be a quite a bit. And if you have somebody who has special needs or a parent that you're caring for that has high medical bills, you could reimburse yourself on all those tax-free. And then IRAs, 401ks, 501c3s. We didn't get into 501c3s today. If you're doing social housing, transitional housing for inmates, uh, aging out of, um, of foster care, if you're doing housing for battered women, if you're doing social housing for autistic uh, adults, if you're doing any type of activity, uh, clean and sober housing, veterans housing, then you could be tax exempt. If you just want to invest inside of an IRA or a 401k, like we already showed you, you could do it. And who reports the income? Nobody. <coughs> it's tax free. So there's a huge benefit if we can somehow get a uh, an exempt entity in uh, in the mix. Taxation of certain real estate activities. Wholesaler, the tax treatment, this is active. So this is going to be earned income. And if you don't want to pay up the nose on those taxes, the strategy is to use an S-Corp. And here's why. A sole proprietor, if you're doing things in your name or in a disregarded LLC and you're doing active income, 100% of that money is subject to ordinary income and 100% of that money is subject to Social Security taxes. If we set up an S-Corp, then the about a third of that money is going to be subject to ordinary income and employment taxes, you have to take a small salary, reasonable salary for what you're doing. It's usually about a third. The rest of it is only ordinary income. You avoid the employment taxes. So on a hundred thousand bucks here, let me see, I'll show you real quick. Um, let me see. I have the, I have a side by side on this. I could just show you real quick. Here you go. So here's a side by side on $50,000 being made it saves you about $5,000 a year with the S-Corp. Side-by-side side on making 100000 saves you about $8,000, close to 8000 bucks. And this is without using all the other, like we get something called an accountable plan that allows us to reimburse everything from our cell phones to our computers, everything that you, if you're not writing those things off, um, through another business, not through a sole proprietorship, not through a partnership. You can't write them 100% off. You can only write off the business use of those items. You need a corporation, an S-Corp, C-Corp, LLC taxes, an S-Corp, LLC taxes, a C-Corp, or an exempt organization like a 501c3. Those things can, can, re uh, can reimburse you 100%. This is where it gets really fun. Everybody always says, but S-Corps, they're so much more difficult. Here's an S-Corp tax return. Here's a Schedule C that goes on your 1040. Same business. You tell me which one looks more difficult. That S does not look more difficult. That S looks a lot less difficult just by the line numbers. And then... Because you're using an S-Corp, you get an accountable plan. This is where you can reimburse. It's 26 CFR 1.62-2. And what it says is amounts treated as paid under an accountable plan are excluded from the employee's gross income, are not reported as wages or other compensation on the employee's form W-2, and get this, and are exempt from the withholding and payment of employment taxes. In other words, that S-Corp can reimburse me 100% of my cell phone, 
plus its data, plus any of my, my phone time, plus my computers, not just my business use, 100% of everything that I use, 100%. I don't have to figure out what part was business. So if I, as long as I'm using this and I have a mix, I have something, a management company in the mix maybe, I might be able to get an extra, in some cases it's, it's about $20,000 a year and here's why. Because not only are we writing off those things, we have education, startup and organizational expenses, travel expenses, we already said cell phone and computers, your internet, your subscriptions, your business meals, the employee home office. Oh my gosh, it's called an administrative office for the home. If you're using a C-Corp, you even get medical vision and dental. Oh, but don't underestimate this guy. Let me show you how it looks. When you are writing off an administrative office in the home, we're taking every expense associated with that house. And this is what the IRS tells us to do. We are looking at all of the expenses for the office that you're using, plus all the expenses for the home. Electric, gas, water, internet. If people come to your house to meet with you, like if you're a realtor or if you're a therapist or anything else, or you have people coming in there that, that are a part of your crew, you can even do lawn care. How about uh, repairs and maintenance, including housekeeping? All of those get added up. You're not getting to write off 100%. Uh, property taxes, your mortgage interest, all of that is part of the calculation plus depreciation. And you're not having to recapture this depreciation. This is reimbursing you because your house is being used up and the company is benefiting. This is the IRS chart for calculating this number. This is their calculation. Once we get it all said and done, there's two categories. We're looking for the indirect expenses, which is all of the expenses with the house. And then we're just a portion of the house. And you're also writing off the direct expenses. And the direct expenses is all of this stuff right here. So let's say there's 600 bucks of direct expense. Okay, I'll take that. I get $600 plus I get the indirect. So I am just trying to figure out, hey, wait a second. How much can I write up? I get my depreciation too. That's a pretty big number. And then I can choose between different methodologies of how I calculate it. A lot of people think they have to go off of the gross square footage and how much that office compares to that. No, you can actually use net square footage or room methodology when you're reimbursing under an accountable plan. So in our case, we said, hey, this is a 10 by 15 office. Let's just say it's 10 by 15. So it's 150 square feet. The usable square feet, we, we get rid of hallways and, 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 and certain areas that are not usable like the garage and things like that. And we get down to 2490. We also say, hey, it's a three bedroom, two bathroom house. One of those rooms is being used for the business, for my real estate business. Two of those rooms, let's say it's a living room and a dining room, we add those into. So you're gonna have 20%, one room out of five. And our best, use, our best methodology to use isn't going to be the square footage. It's going to be that room. 20% of this amount gives us $6,943,000 for that year that it can reimburse me. Here's a test. If I don't have to report it anywhere, where does it show up on your tax return? Trick question. You don't have to report it. You don't have to report it. It's not going to go on your 1040. The business writes it off. Step three, you're looking at it and you're comparing. Old way is 150. This is the safe harbor. If you're a sole proprietor, you would get 750 bucks a year. By doing that S Corp, you're getting almost 7,000 bucks. And 
it's not going anywhere. When you do a this little guy as a safe harbor, so they shouldn't audit you, but I'm just telling you the audit rates for sole proprietors are 800% higher at a minimum of S corps and they lose 94 to 95% of the time, according to IRS stats, S corporations are audited. It's a asterisk because it's so low. It's 0 0.005. It's a fraction of a half of a percent. Sole proprietors are audited 1.6% last year. Ouch. Don't want it to be a sole proprietor. Plus, now that I've set up a corporation, it needs a place to hold its meetings. You may as well use two ADA. It's called the Augusta Rule. Some people have heard of it. Airbnb uses it, but we've been using it for 27 years. Here's how it works. You just rent your house to your corporation to have corporate meetings once a month. Have your corporate meeting in your house once a month. Call your family together, investors, watch a video, do one of these events and say, hey, we're going to do that. And then we're going to talk about our investments. The beautiful part about the money that you are doing, as long as it's less than 15 days and it's a residence that you're renting, get this. That's the actual rule. The income derived from such use shall not be included in the gross income of such taxpayer under Section 61, which is adjusted gross income. Free money, no tax. And it doesn't matter whether it's an S or a C or a 501c3 or an LLC taxed as an S corp or an LLC taxed as a C corp. All of those could use your home to have a meeting, just probably like what you're doing today. You're probably sitting at home watching this video. This could have been a nice deduction. The average that we see is right around $750 per day to a thousand there was a case that came out for Planet Hollywood guys that were having meetings in each other's houses all the time. They said they were doing it every week and they would rotate. So there was four of them. So they they ended up uh, not having any record or any paper trails. So the IRS gave them $500 a day is what the IRS just conceded. All right, you can have $500 a day. Quit being, you know, quit, quit being greedy pigs and actually document your stuff. Unbelievable. You do it right, probably closer here, depending on where you're at. We've had two audits in 25 years where this issue came up in South Dakota 15 years ago. They gave us $500 because the guy lived way out in the middle of nowhere. And the only hotel that was nearby, it was 500 bucks. So that's what they gave us. And the other one, we had documented everything. We always tell people to call different places, like three different providers. And it was 1100 bucks. Tax-free money every month for the existence of that corp. So isn't that kind of fun? I don't know. Do you guys like taxes now? Give me a thumbs up if you're starting to say like, hey, wait a second. This isn't so bad. This isn't so nasty. Yeah. This is a lot of fun. Here's the beautiful part. Taxes are about 10% what you have to pay 90% how to avoid it. Here's a prime example. They say, oh, you have to pay tax. Here's the sole proprietors. Sole proprietor, I can grab their audit rate. So I can grab, here we go. It's 1.6%, right? I could see at a hundred thousand bucks, you're making a little bit of money. Oops, make this go away. So let's just say I'm making Around in this range. This is your win rate when you're audited. Six, five, and five, and six. So remember when I told you that the IRS loves sole proprietors? It's because everybody gets told the same thing. Oh, you don't have to keep records. It's not as it's not as harsh when you're a sole proprietor. There's no difference between a sole proprietorship and an S-Corp when it comes to compliance. They're identical. Books and records. So if you're a sole proprietor, you're gonna be 500 to 1,000% more likely to be audited, and you're gonna lose 94 to 95% of the time. 
Option two, you're going to audit it once every 500 years, and you'll lose those audits about 62 to 71 percent of the time. I don't know about you. I think I would rather be audited once every 500 years and not just get a slam dunk. So that's what we do. We just go where the tax code is telling us to go. 